This is Audible. Brought to you by Penguin. This book is dedicated to Rob Wilkins, who typed most of it and had the good sense to laugh occasionally, and to Colin Smythe for his encouragement. The chant of the goddess Pedestriana is a parody of the wonderful poem Brahma by Ralph Waldo Emerson. But, of course, you knew that anyway. Unseen Academicals by Terry Pratchett Read by Colin Morgan with Bill Nye and Peter Serafinowicz It was midnight in Ankmore Pork's Royal Art Museum. Technically, the city of Ankmore Pork is a tyranny, which is not always the same thing as a monarchy, and in fact, even the post of tyrant has been somewhat redefined by the incumbent, Lord Vetinari, as the only form of democracy that works. Everyone is entitled to vote unless disqualified by reason of age or not being Lord Vetinari. And yet it does work. This has annoyed a number of people who feel, somehow, that it should not, and who want a monarch instead, thus replacing a man who has achieved his position by cunning, a deep understanding of the realities of the human psyche, breathtaking diplomacy, a certain prowess with the stiletto dagger, and, all agree, a mind like a finely balanced circular saw, with a man who has got there by being born. A third proposition, that the city be governed by a choice of respectable members of the community who would promise not to give themselves airs or betray the public trust at every turn, was instantly the subject of music hall jokes all over the city. However, the Crown has hung on anyway, as Crowns do, on the post office and the Royal Bank and the Mint, and not least, in the sprawling, brawling, squalling consciousness of the city itself. Lots of things live in that darkness. There are all kinds of darkness, and all kinds of things can be found in them, imprisoned, banished, lost or hidden. Sometimes they escape. Sometimes they simply fall out. Sometimes they just can't take it anymore. It occurred to new employee Rudolf Scattering about once every minute that on the whole... It might have been a good idea to tell the curator about his nyctophobia, his fear of strange noises, and, he now knew, his fear of absolutely everything he could see, and come to that not see, hear, smell, and feel crawling up his back during the endless hours on guard during the night. It was no use telling himself that everything in here was dead. That didn't help at all. It meant that he stood out. And then he heard the sob. A scream might have been better. At least you are certain when you've heard a scream, a faint sob is something you have to wait to hear again because you can't be sure. He raised his lantern in a shaking hand. There shouldn't be anyone in here. The place was securely locked. No one could get in. Or, now he came to think about it, out. He wished he hadn't thought about it. He was in the basement, which was not among the most scary places on his round. It was mostly just old shelves and drawers, full of the things that were almost but very definitely not entirely thrown away. 
Museums don't like things to be thrown away, in case they turn out to be very important later on. Another sob, and a sound like the scraping of... pottery? A rat, then, somewhere on the rear shelves? Rats didn't sob, did they? Look, I don't want to have to come in there and get you, said Scattering with heartfelt accuracy. And the shelves exploded. It seemed to him to happen in slow motion, bits of pottery and statues spreading out as they drifted towards him. He went over backwards and the expanding cloud passing overhead crashed into the shelves on the other side of the room, which were demolished. Scattering lay on the floor in the dark, unable to move, expecting at any moment to be torn apart by the phantoms bubbling up from his imagination. The day staff found him there in the morning, deeply asleep and covered in dust. They listened to his garbled explanation, treated him kindly, and agreed that a different career might suit his temperament. They wondered for a while about what he had been up to, night watchmen being rather puzzling people at the best of times, but put it out of their heads, because of the find. Mr. Scattering then got a job in a pet shop in Pellicool Steps, but left after three days because the way the kittens stared at him gave him nightmares. The world can be very cruel to some people, but he never told anyone about the gloriously glittering lady holding a large ball over her head who smiled at him before she vanished. He did not want people to think he was strange. But perhaps it is time to talk about beds. Lectrology, the study of the bed and its associated surroundings, can be extremely useful and tell you a great deal about the owner, even if it's only that they are a very knowing and savvy installations artist. The bed of Arch-Chancellor Ridcully of Unseen University, for example, is at the very least a bed and a half, being an eight-poster. It encompasses a small library and a bar, and artfully includes a shut-away privy of mahogany and brass throughout, to save those long, cold, nocturnal excursions with their concomitant risk of tripping over slippers, empty bottles, shoes, and all the other barriers presented to a man in the dark who is praying that the next thing that stubs his toe will be porcelain, or at least easy to clean. The bed of Trevor Likely is anywhere, a friend's floor, in the hayloft of any stable that has been left unlocked, which is usually a much more fragrant option, or in a room of an empty house, though there are precious few of those these days. Or he sleeps at work, but he is always careful about that, because old man Smeems never seems to sleep at all, and might catch him at any time. Trev can sleep anywhere, and does. Glenda sleeps in an ancient iron bed. That is to say, Glenda officially sleeps in the old iron bedstead. In reality, most of her sleeping is done in a huge and ancient armchair in the night kitchen, where she has very nearly mastered the art of doing without proper sleep altogether. So many crumbs, spoons, bits of pie dough, books and spilt drinks have gone down the sides of the cushions of that chair that it might well now harbour a small, thriving civilization. Whose springs and mattress have gently and kindly shaped themselves around her over the years, leaving a generous depression. The bottom of this catenary couch is held off the floor by a mulch of very cheap, yellowing romantic novels of the kind to which the word bodice comes naturally. She would die if anyone found out, or possibly they will die if she finds out that they have found out. Usually there is, on the pillow, a very elderly teddy bear called Mr. Wobble. Traditionally, in the lexicon of pathos, such a bear should have only one eye, but as the result of a childhood error in Glenda's sewing, he has three, and is more enlightened than the average bear. Juliet Stollop's bed was marketed to her mother as fit for a princess, 
and is more or less like the Arch-Chancellor's bed, although almost all less, since it consists of some gauze curtains surrounding a very narrow, very cheap bed. Her mother is now dead. This can be inferred from the fact that when the bed collapsed under the weight of a growing girl, someone raised it up on beer crates. A mother would have made sure that at least they were, like everything else in the room, painted pink with little crowns on. Mr. Nutt was seven years old before he found out that sleeping, for some people, involved a special piece of furniture. Now it was two o'clock in the morning. A cloying silence reigned along the ancient corridors and cloisters of Unseen University. There was silence in the library. There was silence in the halls. There was so much silence you could hear it. Everywhere it went, it stuffed the ears with invisible fluff. Gloing! The tiny sound flew past a moment of liquid gold in the Stygian silence. Silence ruled again above stairs until it was interrupted by the shuffling of the official thick-soled carpet slippers of Smeems, the candle knave, as he made his rounds throughout the long night from one candlestick to another, refilling them from his official basket. He was assisted tonight, although to judge from his occasional grumbling not assisted enough, by a dribbler. He was called the Candle Knave because that was how the post had been described in the university records when it was created, almost two thousand years before. Keeping the candlesticks, sconces, and not least the candelabra of the university filled was a never-ending job. It was, in fact, the most important job in the place, in the mind of the Candle Knave. Oh, Smeems would admit under pressure that there were men in pointy hats around, but they came and went and mostly just got in the way. Unseen University was not rich in windows, and without the candle knave, it would be in darkness within a day. That the wizards would simply step outside and, from the teeming crowds, hire another man capable of climbing ladders with pockets full of candles had never featured in his thoughts. He was irreplaceable, just like every other candle knave before him. And now, behind him, there was a clatter as the official folding stepladder unfolded. He spun around. Hold that damn thing right, he hissed. Sorry, master, said the temporary apprentice, trying to control the sliding, finger-crushing monster that every stepladder becomes at the first opportunity, and often without any opportunity at all. And keep the noise down, Smeems bellowed. Do you want to be a dribbler for the rest of your life? Actually... I quite like being a dribbler, sir. Ha! Want of ambition is the curse of the labouring class. Here, give me that thing. The candle knave snatched at the ladder just as his luckless assistant closed it. Sorry about that, sir. There's always room for one more on the wick dipping tank, you know, said Smeems, blowing on his knuckles. Fair enough, sir. The candle knave stared at the grey, round, guileless face. There was an unshakably amiable look about it that was very disconcerting, especially when you knew what it was you were looking at. And he knew what it was, oh yes, but not what it was called. What's your name again? I can't remember everybody's name. Nut, Mr. Smeems, with two T's. Do you think the second one helps matters, Nut? Not really, sir. Where is Trev? He should be on tonight. Been very ill, sir. Asked me to do it. The candle knave grunted. You have to look smart to work above stairs, Nuts. Nut, sir. Sorry, sir. Was born not looking smart, sir. Well... At least there's no one to see you now, Smeems conceded. All right, follow me and try to look less... Well, just try not to look. Yes, Master, but I think... You are not paid to think, young... Man. We'll try not to do so, Master. 
Two minutes later, Smeems was standing in front of the Emperor, watched by a suitably amazed nut. A mountain of silvery grey tallow almost filled the isolated junction of stone corridors. The flame of this candle, which could just be made out to be a mega candle aggregated from the stubs of many, many thousands of candles that had gone before, all dribbled and runnelled into one great hole, was a glow near the ceiling, too high to illuminate anything very much. Smeems's chest swelled. He was in the presence of history. Behold, nuts. Yes, sir, beholding, sir. It's nut, sir. Two thousand years look down on us from the top of this candle, nuts. Of course, they look further down on you than on me. Absolutely, sir. Well done, sir. Smeems glared at the round, amiable face and saw nothing there but a slicked-down keenness that was very nearly frightening. He grunted, then unfolded his ladder without much more than a pinched thumb and climbed it carefully until it would take him no further. From this base camp, generations of candle knaves had carved and maintained steps up the hubbard face of the giant. Feast your eyes on this slide, he called down his ground state bad temper somewhat moderated by this contact with greatness. One day you might be the man to climb this hallowed tallow. For a moment, Nut looked like someone trying hard to disguise the expression of a person who seriously hopes that his future holds more than a big candle. Nut was young, and as such did not have that reverence for age that is had by mostly the aged. But the cheerful, not-quite-smile came back. It never went away for long. Yes, sir, he said, on the basis that this generally worked. Some people claimed that the Emperor had been lit on the very night that Yu Yu was founded, and had never gone out since. Certainly the Emperor was huge, and was what you got when, every night for maybe two thousand years, you lit a new fat candle from the guttering remains of the last one, and pressed it firmly into the warm wax. There was no visible candlestick now, of course. That was somewhere in the vast accumulation of waxy dribbles on the next floor down. Around a thousand years ago, the university had had a large hole made in the ceiling of the corridor below, and already the emperor was seventeen feet high up here. There was thirty-eight feet in total of pure, natural, dribbled candle. It made Smeems proud. He was keeper of the candle that never went out. It was an example to everyone, a light that never failed, a flame in the dark, a beacon of tradition. And Unseen University took tradition very seriously, at least when it remembered to. As now, in fact. From somewhere in the distance came a sound like a large duck being trodden on, followed by a cry of, Ho oh, the Megapode! And then all hell eventuated. A creature plunged out of the gloom. There is a phrase, neither flesh nor fowl nor good red herring. This thing was all of them, plus some other bits of beasts unknown to science, or nightmare, or even kebab. There was certainly some red, and a lot of flapping, and Nut was sure he caught a glimpse of an enormous sandal, but there were the mad, rolling, bouncing eyes, the huge yellow and red beak, and then the thing disappeared down another gloomy corridor, incessantly making that flat honking noise of the sort duck hunters make just before they are shot by other duck hunters. Aho! The Megapode! It wasn't clear where the cry came from, it seemed to be coming from everywhere. There she bumps! Ho oh, the megapode! The cry was taken up on every side, and from the dark shadows of every corridor, bar the one down which the beast had fled, galloped curious ships, which turned out to be, by the flickering light of the Emperor, the senior faculty of the university. Each wizard was being carried piggyback by a stout bowler-hatted university porter, whom he was urging onward by means of a bottle of beer on a string held, as tradition demanded, ahead of the porter's grasp on a long stick. 
The doleful quack rang out again, some distance away, and a wizard waved his staff in the air and yelled, Bird is flown! Hold a megapode! The colliding wizardry, who'd already crushed Smeem's rickety ladder under the hobnailed boots of their steeds, set off at once, butting and barging for position. For a little while, Aho, the megapode! echoed in the distance. When he was certain they had gone, Nut crept out from his refuge behind the emperor, picked up what remained of the ladder, and looked around. Master, he ventured. There was a grunt from above. He looked up. Are you all right, master? I have been better nuts. Can you see my feet? Nut raised his lantern. Yes, master. I am sorry to say the ladder is broken. Well, do something about it. I'm having to concentrate on my handholds here. I thought I wasn't paid to think, master. Don't you try to be smart. Can I try to be smart enough to get you down safely, master? No answer was the stern reply. Nut sighed and opened up the big canvas tool bag. Smeems clung to the vertiginous candle as he heard down below mysterious scrapings and clinking noises. Then, with a silence and suddenness that made him gasp, a spiky shape rose up beside him, swaying slightly. I screwed together three of the big snuffer poles, master, said Nut from below. And you'll see there's a chandelier hook stuck in the top, yes? And there's a rope. Can you see it? I think that if you can make a loop around the emperor, it won't slip much, and you ought to be able to let yourself down slowly. Oh, and there's a box of matches, too. What for? said Smeems, reaching out for the hook. Can't help noticing that the emperor has gone out, sir, said the voice from below cheerfully. No, it hasn't. I think you'll find it has, sir, because I can't see the... There is no room in this university's most important department for people with bad eyesight nuts. I beg your pardon, master. I don't know what came over me. Suddenly, I can see the flame. From above came the sound of a match being struck, and a circle of yellow light expanded on the ceiling as the candle that never went out was lit. Shortly afterwards, Smeems very gingerly lowered himself to the floor. Well done, sir, said Nut. The candle nave flicked a length of congealed candle dribble off his equally greasy shirt. Very well, he said, but you'll have to come back in the morning to recover there but Nut was already going up the rope like a spider. There was a clanging on the other side of the great candle as the lengths of snuffer pole were dropped, and then the boy upsailed back down to his master with the hook under his arm. And now he stood there all eagerness and scrubbed, if somewhat badly dressed, efficiency. There was something almost offensive about it, and the candle knave wasn't used to this. He felt obliged to take the lad down a peg for his own good. All candles in this university must be lit by long taper from a candle that still burns, boy, he said sternly. Where did you get those matches? I wouldn't like to say, sir. I dare say you wouldn't indeed. Now tell me, boy. I don't want to get anyone in trouble, master. Your reluctance does you credit, but I insist, said the candle nave. Uh, they fell out of your jacket when you were climbing up, master. Off in the distance was one last cry. The megapode is catched. But around the emperor, silence listened with its mouth open. You are mistaken, nuts said Smeems slowly. I think you will find that one of the gentlemen must have dropped them. Ah, yes, that's certainly what must have happened, sir. I must learn not to jump to conclusions. Once again, the candle nave had that off-balance feeling. Well, then, we will say no more about it, was all he managed. What was it that happened just then, sir? said Nut. Oh, that. 
That was all part of one of the gentleman's magically essential magical activities, lad. It was vital to the proper running of the world, I'll be bound, oh yes. Could be they were setting the stars in their courses, even. It's one of them things we have to do, you know. He added, carefully insinuating himself into the company of wizards. Only it looked like a skinny man with a big wooden duck strapped to his head. Ah, well, it may have looked like that, come to think of it. But that was because that's how it looks to people like us what are not gifted with the ocular sight. You mean it was some sort of metaphor? Smeems handled this quite well in the circumstances, which included being so deeply at sea with that sentence that barnacles would be attracted to his underwear. That's right, he said. It could be a meta for something that didn't look so stupid. Exactly, master. Smeems looked down at the boy. It's not his fault, he thought. He can't help what he is. An uncharacteristic moment of warmth overtook him. You're a bright lad, he said. There's no reason why you shouldn't be head dribbler one day. Thank you, sir, said Nut. But if you don't mind, I was rather hoping for something a bit more in the fresh air, so to speak. Ah, said Smeems. That could be a bit tricky, as you might say. Yes, sir, I know. It's just that there's a lot of, well... Look, it's not me, it's, it's, well, you know, it's people. You know what people are like. Yes, I know what people are like. Looks like a scarecrow, talks posh like one of the gentlemen, Smeems thought. Bright as a button, grubby as a turd. He felt moved to pat the little fellow on his curiously spherical head, but desisted. Best if you stay down in the vats, he said. It's nice and warm. You've got your own bedroll, and it's all snug and safe, eh? To his relief, the boy was silent as they walked down the passages, but then Nut said in a thoughtful tone of voice, I was just wondering, sir, how often has the candle that never goes out not gone out? Smeems bit back the stinging retort. For some reason, he knew it could only build up trouble in the long run. The candle that never goes out has failed to go out three times since I've been candle knave, lad, he said. It's a record. An enviable achievement, sir. Damn right. And that's even with all the strangeness that's been happening lately. Really, sir, said Nut. Have stranger than usual things been happening? Young man, stranger than usual things happen all the time. One of the scullery boys told me that all the toilets on the tesseractical floor turned into sheep yesterday, said Nut. I should like to see that. I shouldn't go further than the sculleries if I was you, said Smeems quickly. And don't worry about what the gentlemen do. They are the finest minds in the world, let me tell you. If you wish to ask him, he paused, trying to think of something really difficult like, What is 864 times 316? 273,024, said Nut, not quite under his breath. What? said Smeems, derailed. Just thinking aloud, Master, said Nut. Ah, right. Oh, uh, well, that's it, see? They have an answer for you in a brace of shakes. Finest minds in the world, said Smeems, who believed in truth via repetition. Finest minds, engaged in the business of the universe. Ah, finest minds. Well, that was fun, said Mustram Ridcully, Arch-Chancellor of the University throwing himself into a huge armchair in the faculty's uncommon room, with such force that it nearly threw him out again. We must do it again sometime. Yes, sir, we will. In one hundred years, said the new master of the traditions smugly, turning over the pages in his huge book. He reached the crackling, leaf-headed, 
Hunting the Megapode, wrote down the date and the amount of time it had taken to find the aforesaid Megapode, and signed his name with a flourish. Ponder Stibbins. What is a Megapode, anyway? said the Chair of Indefinite Studies, helping himself to the port. Type of bird, I believe, said the Arch-Chancellor, waving a hand towards the drinks trolley. After me. The original Megapode was found in the Underbutler's pantry, said the Master of the Traditions. It escaped in the middle of dinner and caused what my predecessor eleven hundred years ago called, he referred to the book, a veritable hey-ho, rumble-o, as all the fellows pursued it through the college buildings with much mirth and good spirits. Why, said the head of the Department of Postmortem Communications, deftly snatching the decanter full of good spirits as it went past. Oh, you can't have a megapode running around loose, Dr. Hicks, said Ridcully. Anyone will tell you that. No, I meant why do we do it again every hundred years, said the head of the Department of Postmortem Communications. Strictly speaking, Dr. Hicks, spelled with an X, was the son of Mr. and Mrs. Hicks, but a man who wears a black robe with nasty symbols on it and has a skull ring would be mad, or let us say even madder, to pass up the chance to have an X in his name. The senior wrangler turned his face away and murmured, Oh, good gods, it's a tradition, the chair of indefinite studies explained, rolling a cigarette. We have to have traditions. They're traditional, said Red Cully. He beckoned to one of the servants. And I don't mind saying this one has made me somewhat peckish. Can you fetch the cheese boards one to five, please? And, um, some of that cold roast beef, some ham, a few biscuits, and, of course, the pickle carts. He looked up. Anyone want to add anything? I could toy fitfully with a little fruit, said the professor of recondite phenomena. How about you, librarian? Ork, growled the figure, hogging the fire. Yes, of course, said the Arch-Chancellor. He waved a hand at the hovering waiter. The fruit trolley as well. See to it, please. Down, body. And perhaps that new girl could bring it up. She ought to get used to the uncommon room. It was as if he had just spoken a magic spell. The room... Its ceiling, hazy with blue smoke, was suddenly awash with a sort of heavy, curiously preoccupied silence mostly due to dreamy speculation, but in a few rare cases owing to distant memory. The new girl. At the mere thought, elderly hearts beat dangerously. Very seldom did beauty intrude into the daily life of Yu Yu which was as masculine as the smell of old socks and pipe smoke, and, given the faculty's general laxness when it came to knocking out their pipes, the smell of smoking socks as well. Mrs. Whitlow, the housekeeper, she of the clanking chatelaine and huge creaking corset that caused the chair of indefinite studies to swoon when he heard it, generally took great care to select staff who, while being female, were not excessively so and tended to be industrious, clean in their habits, rosy-cheeked, and, in short, the kind of ladies who are never too far from gingham and an apple pie. This suited the wizards, who liked to be not far away from an apple pie themselves, although they could take gingham or leave it alone. Why, then, had the housekeeper employed Juliet? What could she have been thinking of? The girl had come into the place like a new world in a solar system, and the balance of the heavens was subtly wobbling. And, indeed, as she advanced, so was Juliet. By custom and practice, wizards were celibate, in theory because women were distracting and bad for the magical organs, but after a week of Juliet's presence, many of the faculty were subject to, mostly, unfamiliar longings and strange dreams, and were finding things rather hard, but you couldn't really put your finger on it. What she had went beyond beauty. It was a sort of distillation of beauty that travelled around with her, uncoiling itself into the surrounding ether. 
When she walked past, the wizards felt the urge to write poetry and buy flowers. You may be interested to know, gentlemen, said the new master of the traditions, that tonight's was the longest chase ever recorded in the history of the tradition. I suggest we owe a vote of thanks to tonight's megapode. He realized the statement had plummeted onto deaf ears. Uh, gentlemen, he said. He looked up. The wizards were staring in a soulful sort of way at whatever was going on inside their heads. Gentlemen, he said again, and this time there was a collective sigh as they woke up from their sudden attack of daydreaming. What say? said the Arch-Chancellor. I was just remarking that tonight's megapode was undoubtedly the finest on record, Arch-Chancellor. It was Rincewind. The official megapode headdress suited him very well, all things considered. I think he's gone for a lie down. What? Oh, that, well, yes, indeed, well done, that man, said Ridcully, and the wizards commenced that slow hand-clapping and table-thumping, which is the mark of appreciation amongst men of a certain age, class, and girth, accompanied by cries of, uh, Very, very, well done, that man, and jolly good. But eyes stared firmly fixed on the doorway, and ears strained for the rattle of the trolley which would herald the arrival of the new girl, and, of course, 107 types of cheese, and more than 70 different varieties of pickles, chutneys, and other tracklements. The new girl might be the very paradigm of beauty, but Yu Yu was not the place for a man who could forget his cheeses. Well, she was a distraction, at least, Ponder thought as he snapped the book shut, and the university needed a few of them right now. It had been tricky since the dean had left, very tricky indeed. Who ever heard of a man resigning from UU? It was something that simply did not happen. Sometimes people left in disgrace, in a box, or in a few cases, in bits. But there was no tradition of resigning at all. Tenure at Unseen University was for life, and often a long way beyond. The office of Master of the Traditions had fallen inevitably on Ponder Stibbons, who tended to get all the jobs that required someone who thought that things should happen on time and that numbers should add up. Regrettably, when he'd gone to check on things with the previous Master of the Traditions, who everyone agreed had not been seen around and about lately, he'd found that the man had been dead for two hundred years. This wasn't a wholly unusual circumstance, Ponder, after years at Unseen, still didn't know the full size of the faculty. How could you keep track of them in a place like this these days, where hundreds of studies all shared one window, but only on the outside, or rooms drifted away from their doorways during the night, travelled intangibly through the slumbering halls and ended up docking quite elsewhere? A wizard could do what he liked in his own study, and in the old days, that had largely meant smoking anything he fancied and farting hugely without apologizing. These days, it meant building out into a congruent set of dimensions. Even the Arch-Chancellor was doing it, which made it hard for Ponder to protest. He had half a mile of trout stream in his bathroom and claimed that messing about in his study was what kept a wizard out of mischief. And, as everyone knew, it did. It generally got him into trouble instead. Ponder had let that go, because he now saw it as his mission in life to stoke the fires that kept Mustrum Ridcully bubbling and made the university a happy place. As a dog reflects the mood of its owner, so a university reflects its arch-chancellor. All he could do now, as the university's sole self-confessed entirely sensible person, was to steer things as best he could keep away from squalls involving the person previously known as the Dean, and find ways of keeping the Arch-Chancellor too occupied to get under Ponder's feet. Ponder was about to put the Book of Traditions away when the heavy pages flopped over. That's odd. Oh, those old book bindings get very stiff, said Ridcully. They have a life of their own sometimes. Has anyone heard of Professor H. F. Pullander or Dr. Eratimus? The faculty stopped watching the door and looked at one another. Ring a bell, anyone? said Ridcully. Not a tinkle, said the lecturer in recent runes cheerfully. The Arch-Chancellor turned to his left. What about you, Dean? 
You know all the old. Ponder groaned. The rest of the wizards shut their eyes and brisked themselves. This might be bad. Red Cully stared down at two empty chairs with the imprint of a buttock in each one. One or two of the faculty pulled their hats down over their faces. It had been two weeks now, and it had not got any better. He took a deep breath and roared, Traitor! Which was a terrible thing to say to two dimples in leather. The chair of indefinite studies gave Ponder Stibbons a nudge, indicating that he was the chosen sacrifice for today. Again. Again. Just for a handful of silver he left us, said Red Cully to the universe in general. Ponder cleared his throat. He'd really hoped the megapode hunt would take the Arts Chancellor's mind off the subject, but Ridcully's mind kept on swinging back to the absent Dean the way a tongue plunges back to the sight of a missing tooth. Uh, in point of fact, I believe his remuneration is at least, he began, but in Ridcully's current mood, no answer would be the right one. Remuneration? Since when did a wizard work for wages? We are pure academics, Mr. Stibbins. We do not care for mere money. Unfortunately, Ponder was a clear, logical thinker who, in times of mental confusion, fell back on reason and honesty, which, when dealing with an angry arch-chancellor, were, to use the proper academic term, unhelpful. And he neglected to think strategically. Always a mistake when talking to fellow academics, and as a result made the mistake of employing, as at this point, common sense. That's because we never actually pay for anything very much, he said. And if anyone needs any petty cash, they just help themselves from the big jar. We are part of the very fabric of the university, Mr. Stibbins. We take only what we require, we do not seek wealth, and most certainly we do not accept a post of vital importance which includes an attractive package of remuneration, whatever the hell that means, and other benefits including a generous pension. A pension, mark you. Whenever has a wizard retired? Well, Dr. Earwig, Ponder began, unable to stop himself. He left to get married, snapped Ridcully. That's not retiring. That's the same as dying. What about Dr. House Martin? Ponder went on. The lecturer in recent runes kicked him on the ankle, but Ponder merely said, Ouch! and continued, He left with a bad case of work-related frogs, sir. If you can't stand the heat, get off the pot, muttered Ridcully. Things were subsiding a bit now, and the pointy hats were tentatively raised. The Arch-Chancellor's little moments only lasted a few minutes. This would have been more comforting were it not for the fact that at approximately five-minute intervals something suddenly reminded him of what he considered to be the Dean's totally treasonable activity, to wit, applying for and getting a job at another university via a common advertisement in a newspaper. That was not how a prince of magic behaved. He didn't sit in front of a panel of drapers, greengrocers and bootmakers, wonderful people though they may be, salt of the earth no doubt, but even so, to be judged and assessed like some champion terrier, had his teeth counted, no doubt. He'd let down the entire brotherhood of wizardry. That's what he'd done. There was a squeaking of wheels out in the corridor, and every wizard stiffened in anticipation. The door swung open, and the first overloaded trolley was pushed in. There was a series of sighs as every eye focused on the maid who was pushing it, and then some rather louder sighs when they realised that she was not, as it were, the intended. She wasn't ugly. She might be called homely, perhaps, but it was quite a nice home, clean and decent, and with roses round the door and a welcome on the mat and an apple pie in the oven. But the thoughts of the wizards were, astonishingly, not on food at this point, although some of them were still a bit hazy as to why not. She was, in fact, quite a pleasant-looking girl, even if her bosom had clearly been intended for a girl two feet taller, but she was not her. The egregious professor of grammar and usage would have corrected this to she was not she, which would have caused the professor of logic to spit out his drink. The faculty was crestfallen. 
but it brightened up considerably as the caravan of trolleys wound its way into the room. There was nothing like a 3 a.m. snack to raise the spirits. Everyone knew that. Well, Ponder thought, at least we've got through the evening without anything breaking. Better than Tuesday, at least. It is a well-known fact in any organisation that, if you want a job done, you should give it to someone who is already very busy. It has been the cause of a number of homicides, and in one case, the death of a senior director from having his head shut repeatedly in quite a small filing cabinet. In UU, Ponder Stibbins was that busy man. He had come to enjoy it. For one thing, most of the jobs he was asked to do did not need doing, and most of the senior wizards did not care if they were not done, provided they were not done by themselves. Besides, Ponder was very good at thinking up efficient little systems to save time, and was, in particular, very proud of his system for writing the minutes of meetings, which he had devised with the help of Hex, the university's increasingly useful thinking engine. A detailed analysis of past minutes, coupled with Hex's enormous predictive abilities, meant that for a simple range of easily accessible givens, such as the agenda, which Ponder controlled in any case, the committee members, the time since breakfast, the time to dinner, and so on, in most cases the minutes could be written beforehand. All in all, he considered that he was doing his bit in maintaining UU in its self-chosen course of amiable, dynamic stagnation. It was always a rewarding effort, knowing the alternative, to keep things that way. But a page that turns itself was, to ponder, an anomaly. Now, While the sound of the pre-breakfast supper grew around him, he smoothed out the page and read, carefully. Glenda would have cheerfully broken a plate over Juliet's sweet, empty head when the girl finally turned up in the night kitchen. At least, she would cheerfully have thought about it, in quite a deliberate way, but there was no point in losing her temper, because its target was not really much good at noticing what other people were thinking. There wasn't a nasty bone in Juliet's body, it's just that she had a great deal of trouble homing in on the idea that someone was trying to be unpleasant to her. So Glenda made do with, Where have you been? I told Mrs Whitlow you'd gone home ill. Your dad'll be worried sick, and it looks bad to the other girls. Juliet slumped into a chair, with a movement so graceful that it seemed to sing. Went to football, didn't I? You know... We were playing those buggers in Dimwell until three in the morning. That's the rules, isn't it? Playing till full time, first dead man or first score. Who won? Dunno. You don't know? When we left, it was being decided on head wounds. Anyway, I went with Rotten Johnny, didn't I? I thought you'd broken up with him. He bought me supper, didn't he? You shouldn't have gone, that's not the sort of thing you should do. Like you know, said Juliet, who sometimes thought the questions were answers. Just do the washing up, will you? said Glenda. And I'll have to do it again after you, she thought, as her best friend drifted over to the line of big stone sinks. Juliet didn't exactly wash dishes, she gave them a light baptism. Wizards weren't the type of people who noticed yesterday's dried egg on the plate, but Mrs. Whitlow could see it from two rooms away. Glenda liked Juliet. She really did, although sometimes she wondered why. Of course, they'd grown up together, but it had always amazed her that Juliet, who was so beautiful that boys went nervous and occasionally fainted as she passed, could be so, well, dumb about everything. In fact, it was Glenda who had grown up. She wasn't sure about Juliet. Sometimes it seemed to Glenda that she had done the growing up for both of them. Look, you just have to scrub a bit, that's all. She snapped after a few seconds of listless dipping and took the brush out of Juliet's perfect hand. And then, as the grease was sent down the drain, she thought, I've done it again. Actually, I've done it again again. How many times is that? I even used to play with her dolls for her. Plate after plate sparkled under Glenda's hands. Nothing cleans stubborn stains like suppressed anger. Rotten Johnny, she thought. Ye gods, he smells of cat wee. He's the only boy stupid enough to think he's got a chance. Good grief, she's got a figure like that and all she ever dates are total knobheads. 
What would she do without me? After this brief excitement, the night kitchen settled into its routine, and those who had been referred to as the other girls got on with their familiar tasks. It has to be said that girlhood, for most of them, had ended a long time previously, but they were good workers and Glenda was proud of them. Mrs. Hedges ran the cheese boards like a champion. Mildred and Rachel, known officially on the payroll as the vegetable women, were good and reliable. And indeed it was Mildred who had come up with the famous recipe for beetroot and cream cheese sandwiches. Everybody knew their job. Everybody did their job. The night kitchen was reliable, and Glenda liked reliable. She had a home to go to, and made sure she went to it at least once a day, but the night kitchen was where she lived. It was her fortress. Ponder Stibbins stared at the page in front of him. His mind filled up with nasty questions, the biggest and nastiest of which was simply... Is there any way at all in which people can make out that this is my fault? No? Good. Ah, there is one tradition here that regrettably we don't appear to have honoured for some considerable time, Arts Chancellor, he said, managing to keep the concern out of his voice. Well, does that matter? said Ridcully, stretching. It is traditional, Arts Chancellor, said Ponder reproachfully. Although I might go so far as to say that not observing it has now... Alas, become the tradition. Well, that's fine, isn't it? said Ridcully. If we can make a tradition of not observing another tradition, then that's doubly traditional, eh? What's the problem? It's Arts Chancellor Preserved Bigger's bequest, said the Master of the Traditions. The university does very well out of the bigger estates. They were a very rich family. Hmm, yes. Name rings a faint bell. Decent of him. So? Uh, I would have been happier had my predecessor paid a little more attention to some of the traditions, said Ponder, who believed in drip-feeding bad news. Well, he was dead. Yes, of course. Perhaps, sir, we should, uh, (coughs) start a tradition of checking on the health of the master of the traditions? Oh, he was quite healthy, said the Arch-Chancellor. Just dead. Quite healthy for a dead man. He was a pile of dust, Arch-Chancellor. That's not the same as being ill, exactly, said Ridcully, who believed in never giving in. Broadly speaking, it's stable. Ponder said, there is a condition attached to the bequest. It's in the small print, sir. Oh, I never bother with small print, Stibbons. I do, sir. It says, and this shall follow as long as the university shall enter a team in the game of foot the ball or poor boys funny. Oh, boys, funny, said the chair of indefinite studies. That's ridiculous, said Ridcully. Ridiculous or not, Arts Chancellor, that is the condition of the bequest. But we stopped taking part in that years ago, said Ridcully. Mobs in the streets, kicking and punching and yelling. And they were the players. Mark you, the spectators were nearly as bad. There were hundreds of men in a team. A game could go on for days. That's why it was stopped. Actually, it has never been stopped as such, Arts Chancellor, said the senior wrangler. We stopped, yes, and so did the guilds. It was no longer a game for gentlemen. Nevertheless, said the master of the traditions, running a finger down the page, such are the terms. There are all sorts of other conditions. Oh, dear. Oh, calamity. Oh, surely not. His lips moved silently as he read on. The room craned as one neck. Well, out with it, man, roared Red Cully. I think I'd like to check a few things, said the master of the traditions. I would not wish to worry you unduly, he glanced down. Oh, hell's bells. What are you talking about, man? Well, it looks as though... No, it would be unfair to spoil your evening, Arch-Chancellor, Ponder protested. I must be reading this wrongly. He surely can't mean... Oh, good heavens. In a nutshell, please, Stibbins, growled Ridcully. I believe I am the Arts Chancellor of this university. I'm sure it says so on my door. Of course, Arts Chancellor, but it would be quite wrong of me to... I appreciate that you do not wish to spoil my evening, sir, said Ridcully. But I would not hesitate to spoil your day tomorrow. With that in mind... 
What the hell are you talking about? Uh, it would appear, Arch-Chancellor, that, uh, when was the last game we took part in, do you know? Anyone? said Ridcully to the room in general. A mumbled discussion produced a consensus on the theme of, Around twenty years, give or take. Give or take what, exactly? said Ponder, who hated this kind of thing. Oh, you know, there's something of that order, I mean, in the general vicinity of, so to speak, round about then, you know. About? said Ponder. Can we be more precise? Why? Because if the university hasn't played in the poor boy's fun for a period of twenty years or more, the bequest reverts to any surviving relatives of Arch-Chancellor Bigger. But it's banned, man, the Arch-Chancellor insisted. Uh, not as such. It's common knowledge that Lord Vetinari doesn't like it, but I understand that if the games are outside the city centre and confined to the back streets, the watch turns a blind eye. Since I would imagine that the supporters and players easily outnumber the entire watch payroll, I suppose it is better than having to turn a broken nose. That's quite a neat turn of phrase there, Mr. Stibbins, said Ridcully. I'm quite surprised at you. Thank you, Arch-Chancellor, said Ponder. He had in fact got it from a leader in the Times, which the wizards did not like much because it either did not print what they said or printed what they said with embarrassing accuracy. Emboldened, he added, I should point out, though, that under UU law, Arch-Chancellor, a ban doesn't matter. Wizards are not supposed to take notice of such a ban. We are not subject to mundane law. Of course, but nevertheless, it is generally convenient to acknowledge the civil power, said Ridcully, speaking like a man choosing his words with such care that he was metaphorically taking some of them outside to look at them more closely in daylight. The wizards nodded. What they had heard was, Vetinari may have his little foibles, but he's the sanest man we've had on the throne in centuries. He leaves us alone, and you never know what he's got up his sleeve. We couldn't argue with that. All right, Stibbins, what do you suggest? said Ridcully. These days you only ever tell me about a problem when you've thought up a solution. I respect this, although I find it a bit creepy. Got a way to wriggle us out of this, have you? I suppose so, sir. I thought we might, well, put up a team. It doesn't say anything about winning, sir. We just have to play. That's all. It was always beautifully warm in the candle vats. Regrettably, it was also extremely humid and rather noisy in an erratic and unexpected way. This was because the giant pipes of Unseen University's central heating and hot water system passed overhead, slung from the ceiling on a series of metal straps with a greater or lesser coefficient of linear expansion. That was only the start, however. There were also the huge pipes for balancing the slewed differential across the university, the pipe for the anthropic particle flux suppressor, which did not work properly these days the pipes for the air circulation, which had not worked either since the donkey had been ill, and the very ancient tubes that were all that remained of the ill-fated attempt by a previous arts chancellor to operate a university communication system by means of trained marmosets. At certain times of the day, all this piping broke into a subterranean symphony of gurgles, twangs, upsetting organic trickling sounds, and occasionally an inexplicable boinging noise that would reverberate through the cellar levels. The general ad hoc nature of the system's construction was enhanced by the fact that, as an economy measure, the big iron hot water pipes were lagged with old clothing held on by string. Since some of these items had once been wizard's apparel, and however hard you scrubbed you could never get all of the spells out, there were sporadic showers of multicoloured sparks and the occasional ping-pong ball. Despite everything, Nut felt at home down among the vats. It was worrying. In the high country, people in the street had jeered at him that he'd been made in a vat. Although Brother Oates had told him that this was silly, the gently bubbling tallow called to him. He felt at peace here. He ran the vats now. Smeems didn't know, because he hardly ever troubled to come down here. Trev knew, of course, 
but since not doing his job for him meant that he could spend more time kicking a tin can around on some bit of waste ground, he was happy. The opinion of the other dribblers and dippers didn't really count. If you worked in the vats, it meant that, as far as the job market was concerned, you had been still accelerating when you'd hit the bottom of the barrel and had been drilled into the bedrock. It meant that you no longer had enough charisma to be a beggar. It meant that you were on the run from something, possibly the gods themselves or the demons inside you. It meant that if you dared to look up, you would see, high above you, the dregs of society. Best, then, to stay down here in the warm gloom, with enough to eat and no inconvenient encounters and, not added in his head, no beatings. No, the dippers were no problem. He did his best for them when he could. Life itself had beaten them so hard that they had no strength left to beat up anyone else. That was helpful. When people found out that you were a goblin, all you could expect was trouble. He remembered what the people in the villages had shouted at him when he was small, and the word would be followed by a stone. Goblin. It was a word with an ox train load of baggage. It didn't matter what you said, or did, or made. The train ran right over you. He'd shown them the things he had built, and the stones had smashed them while the villagers screamed at him like hunting hawks and shouted more words. That had stopped on the day Pastor Oates rode gently into town, if a bunch of hovels in one street of stamped mud could be called a town, and he had brought forgiveness. But on that day, no one had wanted to be forgiven. In the darkness, Concrete, the troll, who was so gooned out on slab, slice, sleek, and slump, and who would even snort iron filings if nut didn't stop him, whimpered on his mattress. Nut lit a fresh candle and wound up his homemade dribbling aid. It whirred away happily and made the flame go horizontal. He paid attention to his work. A good dribbler never turned the candle when he dribbled. Candles in the wild, as it were, almost never dripped in more than one direction, which was away from the draft. No wonder the wizards liked the ones he made. There was something disconcerting about a candle that appeared to have dribbled in every direction at once. It could put a man off his stroke. Employing professional dribblers might seem extravagant for a body like Unseen University. Nothing could be further from the truth. No traditional wizard worth his pointy hat could possibly work by the light of pure, smooth, dare one say, virgin, undribbled candles. It would just not look right. The ambience would be totally shattered, and when it did happen, the luckless wizard would mess about, as people do, with matchsticks and bent paper clips to try to get nice little dribbles and channels of wax, as nature intended. However, this sort of thing never really works and invariably ends with wax all over the carpet and the wizard setting himself on fire. Candle dribbling, it has been decreed, is a job for a dribbler. He worked fast and was putting the 19th well-dribbled candle into the delivery basket when he heard the clank of a tin can being bowled along the stone floor of the passage. Good morning, Mr. Trev, he said, without looking up. A moment later, an empty tin can landed in front of him, on end, with no more ceremony than a jigsaw piece falling into place. How did you know it was me, Gabbo? Your light motif, Mr. Trev, and I'd prefer nut, thank you. What's one of them motifs? said the voice behind him. It's a repeated theme or chord associated with a particular person or place, Mr. Trev, said Nut, carefully placing two more warm candles in the basket. I was referring to your love of kicking a tin can about. You seem in good spirits, sir. How went the day? You what? Did fortune favour Dimwell last night? What are you on about? Nut pulled back further. It could be dangerous not to fit in, not to be helpful, not to be careful. Did you win, sir? Nah, another no score draw. Waste of time, really. But it was only a friendly. Nobody died. 
Trev looked at the full baskets of realistically dribbled candles. That's a shitload you've done there, kid, he said kindly. Nut hesitated again and then said very carefully, Despite the scatological reference, you approve of the large but unspecified number of candles that I have dribbled for you? Blimey, what was all that about, Gubbo? Frantically, Nut sought for an acceptable translation. I done okay, he ventured. Trev slapped him on the back. Yeah, good job, respect. But you've got to learn to speak more proper, you know. You won't last five minutes down our way. You'd probably get a half brick heaved at you. That has, I mean, as been known to happen, said Nut, concentrating. I never seen why people make such a to-do, said Trev generously. So, there were all those big battles. So what? It was a long time ago and a long way away, right? And it's not like the trolls and dwarves weren't as bad as you lot, ain't I right? I mean, goblins? What was that all about? You lot just cut throats and nick stuff, right? That's practically civilised in some streets round here. Probably, not thought. No one could have been neutral when the Dark War had engulfed far Uberwald. Maybe there had been true evil there, but apparently the evil was, oddly enough, always on the other side. Perhaps it was contagious. Somehow, in all the confusing histories that had been sung or written, the goblins were down as nasty, cowardly little bastards who collected their own earwax and were always on the other side. Alas, when the time came to write their story down, his people hadn't even had a pencil. Smile at people. Like them. Be helpful. Accumulate worth. He liked Trev. He was good at liking people. When you clearly liked people, they were slightly more inclined to like you. Every little helped. Trev, though, seemed genuinely unfussed about history and had recognised that having someone in the vats who not only did not try to eat the tallow, but also did most of his work for him, and at that did it better than he could be bothered to do it himself, was an asset worth protecting. Besides, he was congenially lazy, except when it came to foot the ball, and bigotry took too much effort. Trev never made too much effort. Trev went through life on primrose paths. Mr. Smeems came looking for you, said Nut. I sorted it all out. Ta, said Trev, and that was that. No questions. He liked Trev. But the boy was standing there, just staring at him, as if trying to work him out. Tell you what, Trev said. Come on up to the night kitchen and we'll scrounge breakfast, okay? Oh, no, Mr. Trev said Nut, almost dropping a candle. I don't think, uh, sorry, think I ought to. Come on, who's going to know? And there's a fat girl up there who cooks great stuff, bitch food you ever tasted. Nut hesitated. Always agree. Always be helpful. Always be becoming. Never frighten anyone. I think... I will come with you, he said. There's a lot to be said for scrubbing a frying pan until you can see your face in it, especially if you've been entertaining ideas of gently tapping someone on the head with it. Glenda was not in the mood for Trev when he came up the stone steps, kissed her on the back of the neck, and said cheerfully, Hello, darling. What's hot tonight? Nothing for the likes of you, Trevor, likely, she said, batting him away with the pan. You can keep your hands to yourself, thank you. Not been keeping something warm for your best man? Glenda sighed. There's bubble and squeak in the warming oven, and don't say a word if anyone catches you, she said. Just a job for a man who's been working like a slave all night, said Trev, patting her far too familiarly and heading for the ovens. You've been at the football, snapped Glenda. You're always at the football. What kind of working do you call that? The boy laughed and she glared at his companion, who backed away quickly as though from armour-piercing eyes. And you boys ought to wash before you come up here, she went on, glad of a target that didn't grin and blow kisses at her. This is the food preparation area. Nut swallowed. 
This was the longest conversation he had ever had with a female, apart from ladyship and Miss Heel's tether, and he hadn't even said anything. I assure you, I bathe regularly, he protested. But you're grey. Well, some people are black and some people are white, said Nut, almost in tears. Oh, why had he, why had he left the vats? It was nice and uncomplicated down there, and quiet, too, when concrete hadn't been on the ferrous oxide. It doesn't work like that. You're not a zombie, are you? I know they do their best, and none of us can help how we die, but I'm not having all that trouble again. Anyone might get their finger in the soup, but rolling around in the bottom of the bowl, that's not right. I am alive, miss, said Nut helplessly. Yes, but alive what? That's what I'd like to know. I'm a goblin, miss. He hesitated as he said it. It sounded like a lie. I thought goblins had horns, said Glenda. Only the grown-up ones, miss. Well, that was true for some goblins. You lot don't do anything nasty, do you? said Glenda, glaring at Nut. But he recognised it as a kind of residual glare. She had said her piece, and now it was just a bit of play-acting to show she was the boss here. And bosses can afford to be generous, especially when you look a little fearful and suitably impressed. It worked. Glenda said, Trev, fetch Mr. Nut, said Nut. Fetch Mr. Nut some bubble and squeak, will ya? He looks half starved. I have a very fast metabolism, said Nut. Don't mind about that, said Glenda, as long as you don't go showing it to people. I have enough. There was a crash from behind her. Trevor dropped the tray of bubble and squeak. He was stock still, staring at Juliet, who was returning the stare with a look of deep disgust. Finally, she said, in a voice like Pearl's, Had you bleeding eye, foe? You got a nerve? Lodging it in here with that rag round your neck. Everyone knows Stimwell are well pants. Beasley couldn't carry the ball in a sack. Oh, yeah, right. Well, I hear that the Lubbins walked all over you last week, Lubbin clout. Everyone knows they're a bunch of grannies. Oh, uh, yeah, that's all you know. Stable Upright was let out of the tanty the day before. See if you dimmies like him stamping all over you. Oh, Stable, ha! He'll clog away, yeah, but he can't run above a canter. We'll run rings around. Glenda's frying pan clanged loudly on top of the iron range. Enough of that, the pair of you. Got to clean up for the day, and I don't want football dirtying up my nice surfaces, you hear me? You wait here, my girl, and you, Trevor Lightley, you get back to your cellar, and I shall want that dish cleaned and back here by tomorrow night, or you can try begging your meals off some other girl, right? Take your little friend with you. Nice to meet you, Mr Nut, but I wish I could find you in better company. She paused. Nut looked so lost and bewildered. Gods help me, she thought. I'm turning into my mom again. No, wait. She reached down, opened one of the warming ovens, and came back again with another large dish. The scent of cooked apples filled the kitchen. This is for you, Mr. Nut, with my compliments. You need fattening up before you blow away. Don't bother to share it with this scallywag, because he's a greedy beggar, ask anyone. Now, I've got to clean up, and if you boys don't want to help, get out of my kitchen. Oh. And I want that dish back as well. Trev grabbed Nut's shoulder. Come on, you heard what she said. Yes, and I don't mind helping. Come on. Thank you very much, miss. Nut managed as he was dragged down the stairs. Glenda folded her oven cloth neatly as she watched them go. Goblins, she said thoughtfully. Have you ever seen a goblin before, Jules? What? Have you ever seen a goblin? Dunno. Do you think he's a goblin? What? Mr. Nut, is he a goblin, do you think? Said Glenda as patiently as possible. He's a posh one, then. I mean, he sounded like he reads books and stuff. This was a discrimination that was, in Glenda's view, at practically forensic standards of observation for Juliet. She turned around and found, to her surprise, that Juliet had gone back to reading something, or at least staring intently at the words. What have you got there? she asked. It's called Bababble. It's like what important people are doing. 
Glenda looked over her friend's shoulder as she leafed through the pages. As far as she could tell, all the important people shared one smile and were wearing unsuitable clothes for this time of year. So what is it that makes them important? She asked. Just being in a magazine? There's fashion tips too, said Juliet defensively. Look, it says here chrome and copper micromail is the look for the season. That's the page for dwarves, sighed Glenda. Come on, get your things and I'll take you home. Juliet was still reading as they waited for the horse bus. Such sudden devotion to a printed page worried Glenda. The last thing she wanted to see was her friend getting ideas in her head. There was such a lot of room in there for them to bounce around and do damage. Glenda herself was reading one of her cheap novels wrapped in a page of the Times. She read the way a cat eats, furtively, daring anyone to notice. While the horses plodded up towards Dolly's sisters, she took her scarf out of her bag and absentmindedly wrapped it around her wrist. Personally, she hated the violence of the football, but it was important to belong. Not belonging, especially after a big game, could be dangerous to your health. It was important to show the right colours on your home turf. It was important to fit in. For some reason, that thought immediately turned her mind to not. How strange he was. Kind of ugly, but very clean. He had stunk of soap and seemed so nervous. There was something about him. The air in the uncommon room had gone as cold as meltwater. Are you telling us, Mr. Stibbins, that we should be seen to enter a game for bullies, louts and roughs? said the Chair of Indefinite Studies. That would be impossible. Unlikely, yes. Impossible, no, said Ponder wearily. Most certainly not possible, said the Senior Wrangler, nodding at the Chair. We would be trading kicks with people from the gutters. My grandfather scored two goals in a match against Dimwell, said Ridcully in a quiet, matter-of-fact voice. Most people never managed one in their lives in those days. I think the most number of goals scored by one man in his whole life is four. That was Dave Likely, of course. There was a ripple of hurried rethinking and retrenchment. Ah, well, of course, those were different times, said the senior wrangler suddenly all syrup. I'm sure that even skilled workmen occasionally took part in a spirit of fun. It wasn't much fun if they ran into Grandad, said Ridcully, with a faint little grin. He was a prize fighter. He knocked people down for money and pubs sent for him if there was a really dangerous brawl. Of course, in a sense, this made it even more dangerous, but by then, most of it was out in the street. He drew people out of the buildings. Oh, yes. In fairness, it was usually from the ground floor, and he always opened the window first. He was a very gentle man, I understand. Made musical boxes for a living. Very delicate. Won awards for them. Teetotal, you know, and quite religious as well. The punching was just a job of casual work. I know for a fact he never tore off anything that couldn't be stitched on again. Hmm, a decent chap, by all accounts. Never met him, unfortunately. I've always wished I had something to remember the old boy by. As one wizard, the faculty looked down at Redcully's huge hands. They were the size of frying pans. He cracked his knuckles. There was an echo. Mr. Stibbins, all we need to do is engage another team and lose, he said. That's right, Arts-Chancellor, said Ponder. You simply forfeit the game. But losing means being seen not to win, am I right? That would be so, yes. Then I rather think we ought to win, don't you? Really, Mustrum, this is going too far, said the senior wrangler. Excuse me, said Ridcully, raising his eyebrows. May I remind you that the Arch-Chancellor of this university is, by college statute, the first among equals? Of course. Good. Well, I am he. The word first is, I think, germane here. I see you scribbling in your little notebook, Mr. Stibbins. Yes, Arch-Chancellor. I'm looking to see if we could manage without the bequest. Good man. 
said the senior wrangler, glaring at Ridcully. I knew there was no reason to panic. In fact, I'm pleased to say that I think we could rub along quite well with only a minimal cut in expenditure, Ponder went on. There, said the senior wrangler, looking triumphantly at the first among equals. You see what happens if you don't simply panic? Indeed, said Ridcully calmly, with his gaze still fixed on the senior wrangler, he added, Mr. Stibbins, would you be so kind as to enlighten the rest of us to what, in reality, does a minimal cut in expenditure equate? The bequest is a trust, said Ponder, still scribbling. We have the use of the significant income from the very wise investments of the bigger trustees, but we cannot touch the capital. Nevertheless, the income is enough to cover, I'm sorry to be imprecise, about 87.4% of the university's food bill. He waited patiently until the uproar had died away. It was amazing, he thought, how people would argue against figures on no better basis than they must be wrong. I'm sure the bursar would not agree with those figures, said the senior wrangler sourly. That is so, said Ponder, but I'm afraid that is because he regards the decimal point as a nuisance. The faculty looked at one another. Then who's dealing with our financial affairs? said Ridcully. Since last month? Me, said Ponder. But I would be happy to hand the responsibility over to the first volunteer. This worked. Regrettably, it always did. In that case, he said, in the sudden silence, I have worked out, with reference to calorific tables, a regime that will give every man here a nourishing three meals a day. The senior wrangler frowned. Three meals? Three meals? What kind of person is three meals a day? Someone who can't afford nine, said Ponder flatly. We could eke out the money if we concentrate on a healthy diet of grains and fresh vegetables. That would allow us to keep the cheese board with a choice of, say, three types of cheese. Three cheeses isn't a choice, it's a penance, said the lecturer in recent runes. Or... We could play a game of football, gentlemen, said Ridcully, clapping his hands together cheerfully. One game, that's all. How hard would that be? As hard as a face full of hobnails, perhaps, said the chair of indefinite studies. People get trodden into the cobbles. If all else fails, we will find volunteers from the student body, said Ridcully. Corpse might be a better word. The Arch-Chancellor leaned back in his chair. What makes a wizard, gentlemen? A facility with magic? Yes, of course. But around this table, we know this is not, for the right kind of mind, hard to obtain. It does not, as it were, happen like magic. Good heavens, <laughs> witches manage it. But what makes a magic user is a certain cast of mind which looks a little deeper into the world and the way it works, the way its currents twist the fortunes of mankind, etc., etc. In short, they should be the kind of person who might calculate that a guaranteed double first is worth the occasional inconvenience of sliding down the street on their teeth. Are you seriously suggesting that we give out degrees for... Mere physical prowess, said the chair of indefinite studies. No, of course not. I'm seriously suggesting that we give out degrees for extreme physical prowess. May I remind you that I rode for this university for five years and got a brown? And what good did that do, pray? Well, it does say Arch-Chancellor on my door. Do you remember why? The University Council at the time took the very decent view that it might be the moment for a leader who was not stupid, mad, or dead. Admittedly, most of these are not exactly qualifications in the normal sense, but I like to think that the skill of leadership, tactics, and creative cheating that I learned on the river also stood me in good stead. And thus, for my sins, which I don't actually remember committing, but... Must have been quite crimson. I was at the top of a short list of one. Was it a choice of three cheeses, Mr. Stibbons? 
Yes, Arch-Chancellor. I was just checking. Ridcully leaned forward. Gentlemen, in the morning, correction, later this morning, I propose to tell Vetinari firmly that this university intends to once again play football. And the task falls to me because I am the first among equals. If any of you would like to try your luck in the oblong office, you have only to say. He'll suspect something, you know, said the chair of indefinite studies. He suspects everything. That is why he is still patrician, Ridcully stood up. I declare this meat, uh, this overly extended snack, over. Mr. Stibbins, come with me. Ponder hurried after him. Books clutched to his chest, happy for the excuse to get out of there before they turned on him. The bringer of bad news is never popular, especially when it's on an empty plate. Arts Chancellor, I, he began, but Ridcully held his finger to his lips. After a moment of cloying silence, there was a sudden festival of scuffling as of men fighting in silence. Good for them, Ridcully said, heading off down the corridor. I wondered how long it would take them to realize that they might be seeing the last overloaded snack trolley for some time. I'm almost tempted to wait and see them waddle out with their robes sagging. Ponder stared at him. Are you enjoying this, Arch-Chancellor? Good heavens, no, said Ridcully, his eyes sparkling. How could you suggest such a thing? Besides, in a few hours I have to tell Havelock Vetinari that we are intending to become a personal affront. The unschooled mob hacking at one another's legs is one thing. I don't believe he will be happy with the prospect of our joining in. Of course, sir. Uh, there is a minor matter, sir. A small conundrum, if you will. Who is Nut? There seemed to ponder to be a rather longer pause than necessary before Ridcully said, Nut would be... He works in the candle vats, sir. How do you know that, Stibbins? I do the wages, sir. The candle knave says Nut just turned up one night with a chitty saying he was to be employed and paid minimal wage. Well? That's all I know, sir. And I only found that out because I asked Smeems. Smeems says he's a good lad, but sort of odd. Then he should fit right in, don't you think, Stibbins? In fact, we are seeing how he fits in. Well, yes, sir, no problem there, but he's a goblin, apparently. And generally, you know, it's a sort of odd tradition, but when the first people from other races first come to the city, they start out in the watch. Ritkali cleared his throat loudly. The trouble with the watch, Stibbins, is that they ask too many questions. We should not emulate them, I suggest. He looked at Ponder and appeared to reach a decision. You know that you have a glowing future here at UU, Stibbins? Yes, sir, said Ponder gloomily. I would advise you, with this in mind, to forget all about Mr. Nutt. Excuse me, Arch-Chancellor, but that simply will not do. Ridcully swayed backwards, like a man subjected to an attack by a hitherto comatose sheep. Ponder plunged on, because when you have dived off a cliff, your only hope is to press for the abolition of gravity. I have twelve jobs in this university, he said. I do all the paperwork. I do all the adding up. In fact, I do everything that requires even a modicum of effort and responsibility. And I go on doing it, even though Brazeneck have offered me the post of bursar. With a staff. I mean real people, not a stick with a knob on the end. Now, will you trust me? What is it about Nut that is so important? The bastard tried to lure you away, said Ridcully. How sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless dean. Is there nothing he will not stoop to? How much did- I didn't ask, said Ponder quietly. There was a moment of silence, and then Ridcully patted him a couple of times on the shoulder. The problem with Mr. Nut is that people want to kill him. What people? Ridcully stared into Ponder's eyes. His lips moved. He squinted up and down like a man engaged in complex calculation. He shrugged. 
Probably everybody, he said. Please have some more of my wonderful apple pie, said Nut. But she gave it to you, said Trev, grinning. I'd never hear the end of it if I ate your pie. But you are my friend, Mr. Trev, said Nut. And since it is my pie, I can decide what to do with it. Nah, said Trev, waving it away. But there is a little errand you could do for me. Me being a kind and understanding boss what lets you work all the hours you want. Yes, Mr. Trev, said Nut. Glenda would come in around midday. To be honest, she hardly ever leaves the place. I would like you to go and ask her the name of that girl who was up there tonight. The one who shouted at you, Mr. Trev. The very same, said Trev. Of course I will do that, said Nut. But why don't you ask Miss Glenda yourself? She knows you. Trev grinned again. Yes, she does, and that's why I know she won't tell me. If I'm any judge, and I'm pretty sound, she would like to know you better. I've never met a lady so good at feeling sorry for people. There's not much of me to know, said Nut. Trev gave him a long, thoughtful glance. Nut had not taken his eyes off his work. Trev had never seen anyone who could be so easily engrossed. Other people who ended up working in the vats were a bit weird. It was almost a requirement, but the little dark grey fellow was somehow weird in the opposite direction. You know, you ought to get out more, Mr. Nuts, he said. Oh, I don't think I should like that at all, said Nut. And may I kindly remind you my name is not plural. Thank you. Have you ever seen a game of football? No, Mr. Trev. Then I'll take you to the match tomorrow. I don't play, of course, but I never miss a game if I can help it, said Trev. No edged weapons, probably. The season starts soon. Everyone's warming up. Well, that is very kind of you, but I... Tell you what, I'll pick you up down here at one o'clock. But people will look at me, said Nut. And in his head, he could hear Ladyship's voice, calm and cool as ever. Do not stand out. Be part of the crowd. No, they won't. Trust me on that, said Trev. I can sort that out. Enjoy your pie. I'm off. He pulled a tin can out of his coat pocket, dropped it on his foot, flicked it into the air, towed it a few times so it spun and twinkled like some celestial object, and then kicked it very hard so it sailed off down the huge gloomy room a few feet above the vats, rattling slightly. Against all probability, it stopped in its flight a few feet from the far wall, spun for a moment, and then started to come back with, it seemed to the amazed nut, a greater speed than before. Trev caught it effortlessly and dropped it back into his pocket. How can you do that, Mr. Trev? said Nut, astonished. Never thought about it, said Trev, but I always wonder why everyone else can't. It's just about the spinning. It's not hard. See you tomorrow, okay? And don't forget that name. The horse buses were not much faster than walking. But it wasn't you doing the walking, and there were seats and a roof and a guard with a battle axe, and all in all, it was, in the damp grey hours before dawn, good value for tuppence. Glenda and Juliet sat side by side, rocking gently to the sway, lost in their thoughts. At least Glenda was. Julia could get lost in half a thought, if that. But Glenda had become an expert at knowing when Juliet was going to speak. It was rather like the sense a sailor has that the wind is going to change. There were little signs, as if a thought had to get the beautiful brain warmed up and spinning before anything could happen. Who is that boy who came up for his bubble and squeak? She asked nonchalantly or what she probably thought was nonchalantly, or, again, what she might have thought was nonchalantly, had she known that there was a word like nonchalantly. That's Trevor Likely, said Glenda. And you don't want anything to do with him. Why not? He's a dimmer, fancies himself as a face too, and his dad was Big Dave Likely. Your dad would go mad if he heard you'd even talk to him. He's got a lovely smile, said Juliet, with a wistfulness that rang all kinds of alarms for Glenda. He's a scallywag, she said firmly. You try on anything. Can't keep his hands to himself, too. How come you knows that? said Juliet. 
That was another worrying thing about Juliet. Nothing much seemed to be going on between those perfect ears for hours on end, and then a question like that would come spinning towards you with edges on it. You know, you should try to speak better, Glenda said, to change the subject. With your looks, you could snag a man who thinks about more than beer and footy. Just speak with a little more class, eh? You don't have to sound like, My fair lady! They looked up at the guard who was holding his axe in a way that was very nearly not threatening. And when it came to looking up, this was not a long way. The axe's owner was very short. Glenda gently pushed the weapon out of the way. Don't wave it about, Roger, she sighed. Doesn't impress. Ah, sorry, Miss Glenda, said the dwarf, what was visible of his face behind the beard, colouring with embarrassment. It's been a long shift. That'll be fourpence, ladies. Uh, sorry about the axe, but we've been getting people jumping off without paying. He ought to be sent back to where he came from, muttered Juliet as the guard moved on along the bus. Glenda chose not to rise to this. As far as she had been able to tell, up until today at least, her friend had no opinions of her own and simply echoed anything other people said to her. But then she couldn't resist. That would be Treacle Mine Road, then. He was born in the city. He's a miners fan, then. I suppose it could be worse. I don't think dwarves bother much about football, said Glenda. I don't think you could be a real more porky than not shout for your team, was the next piece of worn-out folk wisdom from Juliet. Glenda let this one pass. Sometimes arguing with her friend was like punching mist. Besides... The plodding horses were laboriously passing their street. They got off without missing a step. The door to Juliet's house was covered in the ancient remnants of multiple layers of paint, or rather, multiple layers of paint that had bubbled up into tiny little mountains over the years. It was always the cheapest paint possible. After all, you could afford to buy beer, or you could afford to buy paint, and you couldn't drink paint unless you were Mr. Johnson at number 14, who apparently drank it all the time. Now, I won't tell your dad that you were late, said Glenda, opening the door for her, but I want you in early tomorrow, all right? Yes, Glenda, said Juliet meekly, and no thinking about that Trevor Likely. Yes, Glenda. It was a meek reply, but Glenda recognised the sparkle. She'd seen it in the mirror once. But now she cooked an early breakfast for Widow Crowdy, who occupied the house on the other side and couldn't get about much these days, made her comfortable, did the chores in the rising light, and finally went to bed. Her last thought, as she plummeted into sleep, was, Don't goblins steal chickens? Funny, he doesn't look the type. At half past eight, A neighbour woke her up by throwing gravel at her window. He wanted her to come and look at his father, described as poorly, and the day began. She had never needed to buy an alarm clock. Why did other people need so much sleep? It was a permanent puzzle for Nut. It got boring by himself. Back in the castle in Uberwald, there had always been someone around to talk to. Ladyship liked the night time and wouldn't go out in bright sunshine at all, so a lot of visitors came then. He had to stay out of sight, of course, but he knew all the passages in the walls and all the secret spy holes. He saw the fine gentlemen, always in black, and the dwarfs with iron armour that gleamed like gold. Later, down in his cellar that smelled of salt and thunderstorms, Igor showed him how it was made. There were trolls, too, looking a bit more polished than the ones he'd learned to run away from in the forests. He especially remembered the troll that shone like a jewel. Igor said his skin was made of living diamond. That alone would have been enough to glue him into Nut's memory, but there had been that moment, one day when the diamond troll was seated at the big table with other trolls and dwarfs, when the diamond eyes had looked up and had seen Nut looking through a tiny, hidden spy hole at the other end of the room. Nut was convinced of it. He jerked away from the hole so quickly that he'd banged his head on the wall opposite. 
he had grown to know his way around all the cellars and workshops in Ladyship's castle. Go anywhere you wish. Talk to everyone. Ask any questions. You will be given answers. When you want to learn, you will be taught. Use the library. Open any book. Those had been good days. Everywhere he went, men stopped work to show him how to plane and carve and mould and fettle and smelt iron and make horseshoes, but not how to fit them, because any horse went mad when he entered the stables. One once kicked the boards out of the rear wall. That particular afternoon, he went up to the library, where Miss Heel's tether found him a book on scent. He read it so fast that his eyes should have left trails on the paper. He certainly left a trail in the library. The twenty-two volumes of Breakfast's Compendium of Odors were soon stacked on the long lectern, followed by Spout's Trumpet of Equestrianism, and then, via a detour through the history section, Nut plunged into the folklore section, with Miss Heel's tether peddling after him on the mobile library steps. She watched him with a kind of gratified awe. He'd been barely able to read when he'd arrived but the goblin boy had set out to improve his reading as a boxer trains for a fight. And he was fighting something, but she wasn't sure in her own mind what it was, and, of course, ladyship never explained. He would sit all night under the lamp, book of the moment in front of him, dictionary and thesaurus on either side, wringing the meaning out of every word, punching ceaselessly at his own ignorance. When she came in the next morning, There was a dictionary of dwarfish and a copy of Postulum's The Speech of Trolls on the lectern too. Surely it's not right to learn like this, she told herself. It can't be settling properly. You can't just fork it into your head. Learning has to be digested. You don't just have to know, you have to comprehend. She mentioned this to Fassel, the smith, who said, Look, miss, it came up to me the other day. And said he'd watched a smith before, and could he have a go? Well, you know her ladyship's orders. So I gave him a bit of bar stock, and showed him the hammer and tongs, and next minute he was going at it like, well, hammer and tongs. Turned out a nice little knife, very nice indeed. He thinks about things. You can see his ugly little mush working it all out. Have you ever met a goblin before? Strange you should ask, she told him. Our catalogue says we've got one of the very few copies of J.P. Blunderbell's Five Hours and Sixteen Minutes Among the Goblins of Far Uberwald, but I can't find it anywhere. It's priceless. Five hours and sixteen minutes doesn't sound very long, said the smith. You'd think so, wouldn't you? But according to a lecture Mr. Blunderbell gave to the Ankh-Morpork Trespasser Society... Originally the Explorer's Society, until Lord Vetinari forcibly insisted that most of the places discovered by the Society's members already had people living in them, who were already trying to sell snakes to the newcomers. Said Miss Hill's tether. It was about five hours too long. He said they ranged in size from unpleasantly large to disgustingly small had about the same level of culture as yoghurt, and spent their time picking their own noses and missing. A complete waste of space, he said. It caused quite a stir. Anthropologists are not supposed to write that sort of thing. And young Nut is one of them? Yes, that puzzled me too. Did you see him yesterday? There's something about him that frightens horses, so he came to the library and found some old book about the horseman's word. They were a kind of secret society, which knew how to make special oils that would make horses obey them. Then he spent the afternoon down in Igor's crypt, brewing up God's know what, and this morning he was riding a horse around the yard. It wasn't happy, mind you, but he was winning. I'm surprised his ugly little head doesn't explode, said Fassel. Ha! Miss Heel's tether sounded bitter. Stand by, then because he's discovered the bonk school. What's that? Not that. Them. Philosophers. Well, 
I say, philosophers, but, well, oh, the mucky ones, said Fussell cheerfully. I wouldn't say mucky, said Miss Heels Tether, and this was true. A ladylike librarian would not employ that word in the presence of a smith, especially one who was grinning. Let's say indelicate, shall we? There was not a lot of call for delicacy on an anvil, so the smith continued unabashed. They are the ones who go on about what happens if ladies don't get enough mutton, and they say cigars are... That is a fallacy. That's right, that's what I read. The smith was clearly enjoying this. And ladyship lets him read this stuff? Indeed. She very nearly insists. I can't imagine what she's thinking. Or him come to that, she thought to herself. There was a limit to how many candles he could make, Trev had told Nut. It looked bad if he made too many, Trev explained. The pointy hats might decide that they didn't need all the people. That made sense to Nut. What would no face and concrete and weepy mucko do? They would have nowhere else to go. They had to live in a simple world. They too easily got knocked down by life in this one. He tried wandering around the other cellars, but there was nothing much happening at night, and people gave him funny looks. Ladyship did not rule here, but wizards are a messy lot, and nobody tidied up much and lived to tell the tale. So all sorts of old storerooms and junk-filled workshops became his for the use of. And there was so much for a lad with keen night vision to find. He had already seen some luminous spoon ants carrying a fork, and, to his surprise, the forgotten mazes were home to that very rare indoorivore, the uncommon sock eater. There were some things living up in the pipes, too, which periodically murmured, Ack! Ack! Who knew what strange monsters made their home here? He cleaned the pie plates very carefully indeed. Glenda had been kind to him. He must show that he was kind, too. It was important to be kind, and he knew where to find some acid. Lord Vetinari's personal secretary stepped into the oblong office with barely a disturbance in the air. His lordship glanced up. Ah, uh, drum not. I think I shall have to write to the Times again. I am certain that one down, six across, and nine down appeared in that same combination three months ago, on a Friday, I believe. He dropped the crossword page onto the desk with a look of disdain. So much for a free press. Well done, my lord. The Arts Chancellor has just entered the palace. Vetinari smiled. He must have looked at the calendar at last. Thank goodness they have ponder stibbons. Show him straight in after the customary wait. Five minutes later, Mustrum Ridcully was ushered in. Arts Chancellor, to what urgent matter do I owe this visit? Our usual meeting is not until the day after tomorrow, I believe. Uh, yes, said Ridcully as he sat down. A very large sherry was placed in front of him. There are those who say that sherry should not be drunk early in the morning. They are wrong. Well, Havelock, the fact of the matter is... But it is, in fact, quite providential that you have arrived just now, Vetinari went on, ignoring him. Because a problem has arisen on which I would like your advice. Oh, really? Yes, indeed. It concerns this wretched game called Foot the Ball. It does. The glass, now in Ridcully's hand, trembled not a fraction. He'd held his job for a long time, right back to the days when a wizard who blinked died. One has to move with the times, of course, said the patrician, shaking his head. We tend not to over the road, said Ridcully. It only encourages them. People do not understand the limits of tyranny, said Vetinari, as if talking to himself. 
They think that because I can do what I like, I can do what I like. A moment's thought reveals, of course, that this cannot be so. Oh, it is the same with magic, said the Arch-Chancellor. If you flash spells around like there's no tomorrow, there's a good chance that there won't be. In short, Vetinari continued, still talking to the air, I am intending to give my blessing to the game of football, in the hope that its successes can be more carefully controlled. Well, it worked with the Thieves' Guild, Ridcully observed, amazed at his own calmness. If there has to be crime, then it should be organized. I think that's what you said. Exactly. I have to admit to the view that all exercise for any purpose other than bodily health, the defense of the realm, and the proper action of the bowels is barbaric. Really? What about agriculture? Defense of the realm against starvation. But I see no point in people just running about. Did you catch your megapod, by the way? How the hells does he do it? Red Cully wondered. I mean, how? Aloud, he said. Indeed we did, but surely you are not suggesting that we were merely running about. Of course not. All three exceptions apply. Tradition is at least as important as bowels, if not quite so useful. And indeed, the poor boy's fun has some remarkable traditions of its own, which some might find it worthwhile exploring. Let me be frank, Mustrum. I cannot enforce a mere personal dislike against public pressure. Well, I can, strictly speaking, but not without going to ridiculous and indeed tyrannical lengths. Over a game? I think not. So, as things stand, we find teams of burly men pushing and shoving and kicking and biting in the faint hope, it seems to me, of propelling some wretched object at some distant goal. I have no problem with them trying to kill one another, which has little in the way of a downside, but it has now become so popular once more that property is being damaged, and that cannot be tolerated. There have been comments in the Times. No, what the wise man cannot change, he must channel. And how do you intend to do that? By giving the job to you. Unseen University has always had a fine sporting tradition. Had is the right word, sighed Ridcully. In my day, we were all so, so relentlessly physical. But if I was to suggest so much as an egg and spoon race these days, they'd use the spoon to eat the egg. Alas, I did not know your day was over, Mustrum, said Lord Vetinari with a smile. The room, never normally noisy, sank into deeper silence. Now look here, Ridcully began. This afternoon I shall be speaking to the editor of the Times, said Vetinari, gently surfing his voice over that of the wizard with all the skill of a born committee manipulator, who is, as we know, a very civic-minded person. I am sure he will welcome the fact that I am asking the university to tame the demon foot the ball, and that you have, after careful thought, agreed to the task. I don't have to do this, Ridcully thought carefully. On the other hand, since it is what I want, and thereby don't have to ask for, this may be unwise. Damn, this is so like him. You would not object if we raise our own team, he managed. Indeed, I positively demand that you do so, but no magic, Mustrum. I must make that clear. Magic is not sporting, unless you are playing against other wizards, of course. Oh, I am a very sporting man, Havelock. Capital. How is the dean settling in at Brazenick? by the way. 
If it had been anyone else asking, Ridcully thought, that would simply be a polite inquiry. But this is Vetinari, isn't it? I've been too busy to find out, he said loftily. But I'm sure he will be fine when he finds his feet. Or manages to see them without a mirror, he added to himself. I'm sure you must be pleased to see your old friend and colleague making his way in the world, said Vetinari innocently. And so is Pseudopolis itself, of course. I must say I admire the sturdy burghers of that city for embarking on their noble experiment in this, uh, this democracy, he went on. It is always good to see it attempted again, and sometimes amusing, too. There is something to be said for it, you know, grunted Ridcully. Yes, I believe you practice it at the university said the patrician, with a little smile. However, on the matter of football, we are in accord. Capital. I will tell Mr. De Word what you are doing. I'm sure that the keen players of football will be interested when someone explains the longer words to them. Well done. Do try the sherry. I am told it is highly palatable. Veterinary stood up a signal that, in theory at least, the business of the meeting was concluded, and strolled over to a polished stone slab set into a square wooden table. On a different note, Mustrum, how is your young visitor? My visit? Oh, you mean the... Uh... Uh... That's right. Fetinari smiled at the slab as if sharing a joke with it. The... As you put it, ah. Uh... I note the sarcasm. As a wizard, I must tell you that words have power. As a politician, I must tell you I already know. How is he getting along? Concerned minds would like to know. Ridcully glanced at the little carved men on the plane slab as if they were listening to him. In a roundabout way, they probably were. Certainly it was well known now that the hands that guided half the pieces lived in a big castle in Uberwald and were female and belonged to a lady who was mostly rumour. Smeems says he keeps himself to himself. He says he thinks the boy is cunning. Oh, good, said Vetinari, still seeming to find something totally engrossing in the layout of playing pieces. Good? We need cunning people in Angmore Pork. We have a street of cunning artificers, do we not? Well, yes, but... Ah, then it is context that has power, said Vetinari, turning around with a look of unmasked delight. Did I say that I am a politician? Cunning, artful, sly, deceptive, shrewd, astute, cute, on the ball, and indeed, arch. A word for any praise and every prejudice. Cunning is a cunning word. You don't think that maybe this experiment of yours might be a step too far? Said Ridcully. People said that about the vampires, did they not? It's alleged that they have no proper language, but I am told he speaks several languages fluently. Smeems did say he talked la di da Ridcully admitted. Mustrum, compared with Natchbull, Smeems, trolls, speak, la di da The uh, boy was brought up by a priest of some sort, I know that, said Ridcully. But what will he become when he grows up? By the sound of him, a professor of linguistics. You know what I mean, Havelock. Possibly, although I wonder if you do. But he is, I suggest, unlikely to become a ravening horde all by himself. Ridcully sighed. He glanced towards the game again, and Vetinari noticed. Look at them. Ranks, files, he said, waving a hand over the little stone figures. Locked in everlasting conflict at the whim of the player. They fight, they fall and they cannot turn back because the whips drive them on. 
and all they know is whips, kill or be killed. Darkness in front of them, darkness behind them, darkness and whips in their heads. But what if you could take one out of this game, get him before the whips do, take him to a place without whips? What might he become? One creature, one singular being. Would you deny them that chance? You had three men hanged last week, said Red Cully, without quite understanding why. They had their chances. They used them to kill, and worse. All we get is a chance. We don't get a benison. He was chained to an anvil for seven years. He should get his chance, don't you think? Suddenly Vetinari was smiling again. Let us not get somber, however. I look forward to your ushering in a new era of lively, healthy activity in the best sporting tradition. Indeed, tradition will be your friend here, I am sure. Please don't let me trespass any further on your time. Ridcully drained the sherry. That, at least, was palatable. It's a short walk from the palace to Unseen University. Positions of power like to keep an eye on one another. Ridcully walked back through the crowds, occasionally nodding at people he knew, which, in this part of the city, was practically everyone. Trolls, he thought. We get along with trolls now that they remember to look where they're putting their feet. Got them in the watch and everything. Jolly decent types, bar a few bad apples and gods know we have enough of those of our own. Dwarfs? Been here for ages. Can be a bit tricky, can be as tight as a duck's arse. Here he paused to think and edited that thought to drive a hard bargain. You always know where you are with them anyway, and of course they are short, which is always a comfort, provided you know what they are doing down there. Vampires. Well... Wow. The Uberwald League of Temperance seemed to be working. Word on the street, or in the vault, or whatever, was that they policed their own. Any unreformed bloodsucker who tried to make a killing in the city would be hunted down by people who knew exactly how they thought and where they hung out. Lady Margolotta was behind all that. She was the person who, by diplomacy, and probably more direct means, had got things moving again in Uberwald, and she had some sort of relationship with Vetinari. Everyone knew it, and that was all everyone knew. A dot-dot-dot relationship, one of those. And nobody had been able to join up the dots. She had been to the city on diplomatic visits, and not even the well-practiced dowagers of Ankh-Morpork had been able to detect a whisper of anything other than a business-like amiability and international cooperation between the two of them and he played endless and complex games with her via the Clax system, and apart from that, that was, well, that, until now. And she'd sent him this nut to keep safe. Who knew why, apart from them? Politics, probably. Red Cully sighed. One of the monsters, all alone. It was hard to think of it. They came in thousands, like lice, killing everything and eating the dead, including theirs. The evil empire had bred them in huge cellars, grey demons without a hell. The gods alone knew what had happened to them when the empire collapsed, but there was convincing evidence now that some still lived up in the far hills. What might they do? And one, right now, was making candles in Red Cully's cellars. What might he become? Bloody nuisance, said Ridcully aloud. Here, who are you calling a nuisance, mister? It's my road, same as yours. The wizard looked down at a young man who appeared to have stolen his clothes only from the best washing lines, though the tattered black and red scarf around his neck was probably his own. There was an edginess to him, a continual shifting of wit, as though he might at any moment run off in a previously unguessable direction and he was throwing a tin can up in the air and catching it again. For Ridcully, it brought back memories so sharp that they stung, 
but he pulled himself together. I am Master Ridcully, Arch-Chancellor and Master of Unseen University, young man, and I see you are sporting colours. For some game? A game of football, I suggest? As it happens, yes. So what? said the urchin, then realised that his hand was empty when it should now, under normal gravitational rules, be full again. The tin had not fallen back from its last ascent, and was in fact turning gently twenty feet up in the air. Childish of me, I know, said Ridcully. But I did want your full attention. I want to witness a game of football. Witness? Look, no, I never saw nothing, Ridcully sighed. I mean I want to watch a game, okay? Today, if possible. Yo, are you sure? It's your funeral, mister. Got a shilling? There was a clink high above. The tin will come back down with a sixpence in it. Time and place, please. How do I know I can trust you? said the urchin. I don't know, said Ridcully. The subtle workings of the brain are a mystery to me too, but I'm glad that is your belief. What? With a shrug, the boy decided to gamble, what with having had no breakfast. Lou Bally, off the scours, our past one, and I've never seen you before in my life, got it? That is quite probable, said Ridcully, and snapped his fingers. The tin dropped into the urchin's waiting hand. He shook out the silver coin and grinned. Best of luck to you, Gav. Is there anything to eat at these affairs, said Ridcully, for whom lunchtime was a sacrament. There's pies, Gav. Peas pudding, jelly deal pies, pie and mash, lobster pies, but mostly they are just pies, just pies, sir, made of pie. What kind? His informant looked shocked. They're pies, Gov. You don't ask. Ridcully nodded. And as a final transaction, I'll pay you one penny for a kick of your can. Tuppence, said the boy promptly. You little scamp, we have a deal. Ridcully dropped the can on the toe of his boot, balanced it for a moment, then flicked it into the air and, as it came down, hit it with a roundhouse kick that sent it spinning over the crowd. Not bad, Grandad, said the kid, grinning. In the distance there was a yell and the sound of someone bent on retribution. Ridcully plunged a hand into his pocket and looked down. Two dollars to start running, kid. You won't get a better deal today. The boy laughed grabbed the coins and ran. Ridcully walked on sedately, while the years fell back on him like snow. He found Ponder Stibbins pinning up a notice on the board just outside the Great Hall. He did this quite a lot. Ridcully assumed it made him feel better in some way. He slapped Ponder on the back, causing him to spill drawing pins all over the flagstones. It is a bulletin from the Ank Committee on Safety, Arts Chancellor, said Ponder scrabbling for the spinning, wayward pins. This is a university of magic, Stibbons. We have no business with safety. Just being a wizard is unsafe, and so it should be. Yes, Arch-Chancellor. But I should pick up all those pins if I were you. You can't be too careful. Tell me, didn't we used to have a sportsmaster here? Yes, sir. Evans the Striped. He vanished about forty years ago, I believe. Killed? It was dead men's shoes in those days, you know. I can't imagine who would want his job. Apparently, he evaporated while doing press-ups in the Great Hall one day. Evaporated? What kind of death is that for a wizard? Any wizard would die of shame if he just evaporated. We always leave something behind, even if it's only smoke. Oh, well, cometh the hour, cometh the... Uh, whatever. General comethness, perhaps. <laughs> What is that thinking engine of yours doing these days? Ponder brightened. As a matter of fact, Arch-Chancellor, Hex has just discovered a new particle. It travels faster than light in two directions at once. Can we make it do anything interesting? Well, yes. It totally explodes Spallwittle's transcongruency theory. Good, said Ridcully cheerfully. Just so long as something explodes... Since it's finished exploding, set it to finding either Evans or a decent substitute. Sportsmasters are pretty elementary particles, it shouldn't be difficult. And call a meeting of the council in ten minutes. We are going to play football. Truth is female. 
since truth is beauty rather than handsomeness. This, Red Cully reflected as the council grumbled in, would certainly explain the saying that a lie could run around the world before truth has got its, correction, her, boots on, since she would have to choose which pair. The idea that any woman in a position to choose would have just one pair of boots being beyond rational belief. Indeed, as a goddess, she would have lots of shoes, and thus many choices. Comfy shoes for home truths, hobnail boots for unpleasant truths, simple clogs for universal truths, and possibly some kind of slipper for self-evident truth. More important right now was what kind of truth he was going to have to impart to his colleagues, and he decided not on the whole truth, but instead on nothing but the truth, which dispensed with the need for honesty. Well, go on then, what did he say? He responded to reasoned argument. He did. Where's the catch? None, but he wants the rules to be more traditional. Surely not. Gathered they are practically prehistoric as it is. And he wants the university to take the lead in all this and quickly. Gentlemen, there is a game going to be played in about three hours' time. I suggest we observe it. And to this end, I will require you to wear trousers. After a while, Ridcully took out his watch, which was one of the old-fashioned imp-driven ones and was reliably inaccurate. He flipped up the gold lid and stared patiently as the little creature peddled the hands around. When the expostulating had not stopped after a minute and a half, he snapped the lid shut. The click had an effect that no amount of extra shouting could have achieved. Gentlemen, he said gravely, we must partake of the game of the people from whom, I might add, we derive. Has any of us, in the last few decades, even seen the game being played? I thought not. We should get outside more. Now, I'm not asking you to do this for me, or even for the hundreds of people who work to provide us with a life in which discomfort so seldom rears its head. Yes, many other ugly heads have reared, it is true, but dinner has always beckoned. We are, fellow wizards, the city's last line of defense against all the horrors that can be thrown against it. However, none of them are as potentially dangerous as us. Yes, indeed. I don't know what might happen if wizards were really hungry. So do this, I implore you, on this one occasion. For the sake of the cheese board. There had been some nobler calls to arms in history, Ridcully would be the first to admit, but this one was well tailored to its target audience. There was some grumbling, but that was the same as saying that the sky was blue. What about lunch? said the lecturer in recent runes, suspiciously. We'll eat early, said Ridcully, and I am told that the pies at the game are just amazing. Truth, in front of her huge walk-in wardrobe, selected black leather boots with stiletto heels for such a barefaced truth. Nut was already waiting with a proud but worried look on his face when Glenda got into the night kitchen. She didn't notice him at first, but she turned back from hanging her coat on its peg, and there he was, holding a couple of dishes in front of him like shields. She almost had to shade her eyes because they gleamed so brightly. I hope this is all right, said Nut nervously. What have you done? I plated them with silver, miss. How did you do that? Oh, there's all kinds of old stuff in the cellars and, well, I know how to do things. It won't cause trouble for anyone, will it? Nut added, looking suddenly anxious. Glenda wondered if it would. It shouldn't, but you could never be sure with Mrs. Whitlow. Well, she could solve that problem by hiding them somewhere until they're tarnished. It's kind of you to take the trouble. I generally have to chase people to get plates back. You are a real gentleman, she said, and his face lit up like a sunrise. You are very kind, he beamed. 
and a very handsome lady with your two enormous chests that indicate bountifulness and fecundity. The morning air froze in one enormous block. He could tell he'd said something wrong, but he had no idea what it was. Glenda looked around to see if anyone had heard, but the huge gloomy room was otherwise empty. She was always the first one in and the last one out. Then she said, Stay right there. Don't you dare move an inch. Not an inch. And don't steal any chickens, she commanded as an afterthought. She should have trailed steam as she headed out of the room, her boots echoing on the flagstones. What a thing to come out with. Who did he think he was? Come to that, who did she think he was? And what did she think he was? The cellars and undercrofts of the university were a small city in themselves, and bakers and butchers turned to look as she clattered past. She didn't dare stop now. It would be too embarrassing. If you knew all the passages and stairs, and if they stayed still for five minutes, it was possible to get to just about anywhere in the university without going above ground. Probably none of the wizards knew the maze. Not many of them cared to know the dull details of domestic management. Ha! They thought the dinners turned up by magic. A small set of stone steps led up to the little door. Hardly anyone used it these days. The other girls wouldn't go in there, but Glenda would. Even after the very first time that she had, in response to the bell, delivered the midnight banana, or rather had failed to deliver it on account of running away screaming, she knew she'd have to face it again. After all, we can't help how we're made, her mother had said, and nor can we help what a magical accident might turn us into through no fault of our own as Mrs. Whitlow had explained slightly more recently, when the screaming had stopped. And so Glenda had picked up the banana and had headed right back there. Now, of course, she was surprised that anyone might find it odd that the custodian of all the knowledge that could be was a reddish brown, and generally hung several feet above his desk, and she was pretty certain that she knew at least fourteen meanings of the word ook. As it was daytime, The huge building beyond the little door was bustling, insofar as the word can be applied to a library. She headed towards the nearest lesser librarian, who failed to look the other way in time and demanded, I need to see a dictionary of embarrassing words beginning with F. His haughty glance softened somewhat when he realised she was a cook. Wizards always had a place in their hearts for cooks, because it was near their stomach. Ah. Then I think Birdcatcher's discomforting misusage will be our friend here, he said cheerfully, and led her to a lectern, where she spent several enlightening minutes before heading back the way she had come, a little wiser and a great deal more embarrassed. Nut was still standing where she told him to stand, and looked terrified. I'm sorry, I didn't know what you meant, she said, and thought, abundant, productive, and fruitful. Well, Yes, I can see how he got there. Worse luck. But that's not me. Not really me, I think. I hope. Um, it was kind of you to say that about me, she said, but you should have used more appropriate language. Ah, yes, I'm so sorry, said Nut. Mr. Trev told me about this. I should not talk posh. I should have said that you have enormous tick. Just stop there, will you? Trevor Likely is teaching you elocution. Don't tell me. I know this one. You mean talking proper? Said Nut. Yes, and he's promised to take me to the football, he added proudly. This led to some explanation, which only made Glenda gloomy. Trev was right, of course. People who didn't know long words tended to be edgy around people who did. That's why her male neighbours, like Mr. Stollop and his mates, distrusted nearly everybody. Their wives, on the other hand, shared a much larger, if somewhat specialised, vocabulary, owing to the cheap romantic novels that passed like contraband from scullery to washhouse in every street. That's why Glenda knew elocution, torrid, boudoir, and reticule, although she wasn't too certain about reticule and boudoir, and avoided using them, which in the general scheme of things was not hard. She was deeply suspicious about what a lady's boudoir might be, and certainly wasn't going to ask anybody, even in the library, just in case they laughed. 
And he's going to take you to the football, is he? Mr. Nutt, you will stand out like a diamond in a sweep's ear hole. Do not stand out from the crowd. There were so many things to remember. He says he will look after me, said Nutt, hanging his head. Uh, I was wondering who that nice young lady was who was in here last night, he added desperately, as transparent as air. He asked you to ask me, right? Lie. Stay safe. But ladyship wasn't here, and the nice apple pie lady was right here in front of him. It was too complicated. Yes, he said meekly, and Glenda surprised herself. Her name is Juliet, and she lives bang next door to me, so better not come round, okay? Juliet Stollop. See if he likes that. You fear he will press his suit? Her dad will press a lot more than that if he sees he's a dimmer supporter. Not looked blank, so she went on. Don't you know anything? Dimwell Old Pals, the football team. The Dollies are Dolly's sister's football club. Dollies hate the Dimmers. The Dimmers hate the Dollies. It's always been like that. What could have caused such a difference between them? What? There is no difference between them, not when you've got past the colours. The two teams, alike in villainy. Dolly Sisters wears white and black. Dimwell wears pink and green. It's all about football. Bloody, bloody, clogging, hacking, punching, gouging, silly football. The bitterness in Glenda's voice would have soured cream. But you have a Dolly Sisters scarf. When you live there, it's safer that way. Anyway, you have to support your own. But it is not a game like Spillikins or Helma or Thud. No, it's more like war, but without the kindness and consideration. Oh dear, but war is not kind, is it? Said Nut, bewilderment clouding his face. No. Oh, I see. You were being ironic. She gave him a sideways look. I might have been, she conceded. You are an odd one, Mr Nut. Where are you from, really? The old panic contained again. Be harmless. Be helpful. Make friends. Lie. But how did you lie to friends? I must go, he said, scurrying down the stone steps. Mr Trev will be waiting. Nice, but odd, Glenda thought, watching him leap down the steps. Clever, too to spot my scarf on a hook ten yards away. The sound of a rattling tin can alerted Nut to his boss's presence before he had even hurried through the old archway to the vats. The other habitué had paused in their work, which, frankly, given its usual snail-like progress, meant hardly any change at all, and were watching him listlessly. But they were watching, at least. Even Concrete looked vaguely alert, but not saw a little dribble of brown in the corner of his mouth. Someone had been giving him iron filings again. The can shot up as Trev caught it with his boot, flew over his head, and then came back obliquely as if rolling down an invisible slope and landed in his waiting hand. There was a murmur of appreciation from the watchers, and Concrete banged his hand on the table, which generally meant approval. What kept you, Gubbo? Chatting up Glenda, were you? You got no chance there, take it from me. Been there, tried that. Ah, yes. No chance, mate. He threw a grubby bag towards Nut. Get these on quick, else you'll stand out like a diamond in... A sweep's ear hole? Nut suggested. Yeah, <laughs> you're getting it. Now don't hang about or we'd be late. Nut looked doubtfully at a long, very long, scarf in pink and green and a large yellow woolly hat with a pink bobble on it. Pull it down hard so it covers your ears, Trev commanded. Get a move on. Uh, pink, said Nut doubtfully, holding up the scarf. What about it? Well, isn't football a rough man's game? Whereas pink, if you will excuse me, is rather a... Female colour. Trev grinned. Yeah, that's right. Think about it. You are the clever one around here. And you can walk and think at the same time. I know that. Makes you stand out from the crowd in these parts. Ah, I think I have it. 
The pink proclaims an almost belligerent masculinity, saying as it does, I am so masculine, I can afford to tempt you to question it, giving me the opportunity to proclaim it anew by doing violence to you in response. I don't know if you have ever read Offal Burgers die weissend lichten und goes heiten suki horig der offen kundigen man lichtheit. Trev grabbed his shoulder and spun him round. What do you think, Gabbo? He said, his red face a couple of inches from nuts. What's your problem? What are you all about? You come out with ten dollar words and you lay them down like a man doing a jigsaw. So how come you're down in the vats, eh? Working for someone like me? Don't make sense. Are you on the run from the old Sam? No problem there, unless you did up an old lady or something. But you got to tell me. Too dangerous, thought Nut desperately. Change the subject. She's called Juliet, he gasped. The girl you asked about. She lives next door to Glenda, honestly. Trev looked suspicious. Glenda told you that? Yes. She was winding you up. She knew you'd tell me. I don't think she would lie to me, Mr. Trev. She is my friend. I kept thinking about her all last night, said Trev. Well, she is a wonderful cook. Nut agreed. I meant Juliet. Um, and Glenda said to tell you that Juliet's other name is Stollop, said Nut, hating to be the bearer of worse news. What? That girl is a Stollop? Yes, Glenda said I was to see how you liked that, but I know the meaning of irony. But it's like finding a strawberry in a dog meat stew, yeah? I mean, the stollops are buggers. The lot of them, biters and cloggers to a man. The kind of bastards who kick your family jewels up into your throat. But you don't play football, do you? You just watch. Damn right. But I'm a face, right? I'm known in all the boroughs. You can ask anyone. Everyone knows Trev Likely. I'm Dave Likely's lad. Every supporter in the city knows about him. Four goals. No one else scored that much in a lifetime. And gave as good as he got, did Dad. One game he picked up the dolly bust holding the ball and threw him over the line. He gave as good as he got, my Dad, and then some. So he was a bugger and a clogger and a biter too, was he? What? Are you pulling my tonka? I would not wish to do so initially, Mr. Trev, said Nut, so solemnly that Trev had to grin. But, you see, if he fought the opposing team with even more force than they used, does that not mean that he... He was my dad, said Trev. That means you don't try any fancy maths, OK? OK, indeed. And you never wanted to follow in his footsteps? What? And get brung home on a stretcher? Got my brains from my old mum, not from dad. He was a good bloke and loved his football but he wasn't flush with brains to start with, and on that day, some of them were leaking out of his ear. The dollies got him in the melee and sorted him out good and proper. That's not for me, Gubbo. I'm smart. Yes, Mr. Trev, I can see that. Get the gear on and let's go, OK? We don't want to miss anything. Thing, said Nut automatically, as he started to wind the huge scarf round his neck. What? said Trev, frowning. What? said Nut, his voice a little muffled. There was a lot of scarf. It was almost covering his mouth. Are you pulling my chuff, Gubbo? said Trev, handing him an ancient sweater, faded and saggy with age. Please, Mr. Trev, I don't know. There appears to be so much. I might inadvertently pull. He tugged on the big woolly hat with the pink pom-pom on it. They are so very pink, Mr. Trev. We must be bursting with machismo. I don't know what you personally are bursting with, Gubbo, but here's something to learn. Come on if you think you're hard enough. Now you say it. Come on if you think you're hard enough, said Nut obediently. Well, OK, said Trev, inspecting him. Just remember, if anyone starts pushing you around during the game and giving you grief, just you say that to them and they'll see you're wearing the dimmer colours and they'll think twice. Got it? Not somewhere in the space between the big, bobbly hat and the boa constrictor of a scarf, nodded. Wow, there you are, Gubbo, a complete... Uh, fan. Your own mother wouldn't recognise you. 
There was a pause before a voice emerged from inside the mound of ancient woolens, which looked very much like a nursery layette made by a couple of giants who weren't sure what to expect. I believe you are accurate. Yeah? Well, that's good, isn't it? Now, let's go and meet the lads. Move fast, stay close. Now, remember, this is a pre-season friendly between the angels and the whoppers, right? said Trev, as they stepped out into a fine rain which, because of Ank Morpork's standing cloud of pollution, was morphing gently into smog. They're both pretty crap. They'll never amount to anything but the dimmers shout for the angels, right? It took some explaining, but the core of it, as far as Nut could understand it, was this. All football teams in the city were rated by Dimwell in proportion to their closeness, physical, psychological, or general gut feeling, to the hated Dolly sisters. It had just evolved that way. If you went to a match between two other teams, you automatically, according to some complex and ever-changing ready reckoner of love and hate, cheered the team most nearly allied to your native turf or, more accurately, cobbles. Do you see what I mean? Trev finished. I have committed what you said to memory, Mr. Trev. Oh, brother, and I'll bet you have at that. And it's just Trev when we're not at work, right? We shout together, right? He punched Nut playfully on the arm. Why did you do that, Mr. Trev? Said Nut, his eyes almost the only part of him visible, looked hurt. You struck me. That wasn't me hitting you, Gabbo. It was just a friendly punch. Big difference. Don't you know that? It's a little tap in the arm to show we're mates. Go on, do it to me. Go on. Trev winked. You will be polite, and most of all, you will never raise your hand in anger to anyone. But this wasn't like that, was it? Nut asked himself. Trev was his friend. This was friendly. A friend thing. He punched. The friendly arm. That was a punch, said Trev. You call that a punch? A girl could punch better than that. How come you're still alive with a weedy punch like that? Go on, try a proper punch. Nut did. Be one of the crowd? It went against everything a wizard stood for, and a wizard would not stand for anything if he could sit down for it. But even sitting down... You had to stand out. There were, of course, times when a robe got in the way, especially when a wizard was working in his forge, creating a magic metal or mobiloid glass or any of those other little exercises in practical magic were not setting fire to yourself as a happy bonus. So every wizard had some leather trousers and a stained, rotted by acid shirt. It was the shared, dirty little secret, not very secret, but ingrained with deep-down dirt. Rid Cully sighed. His colleagues had aimed for the look of the common man, but had only a hazy grasp of what the common man looked like these days, and now they were sniggering and looking at one another and saying things like, "'Oh, blimey, don't you scrub down well, as it were, me old mate!' Beside them, and looking extremely embarrassed, were two of the university's bledlows, not knowing what to do with their feet and wishing that they were having a quiet smoke somewhere in the warm. Gentlemen, Ridcully began, and then with a gleam in his eye added, Or should I say fellow workers by hand and brain, this afternoon we... Yes, Senior Angler? Are we, in point of fact, workers? This is a university, after all said the senior wrangler. I agree with the senior wrangler, said the lecturer in recent runes. Under university statutes, we are specifically forbidden to engage, other than within college precincts, in any magic above level four, unless specifically asked to do so by the civil power or under clause three. We really want to. We are acting as placeholders and as such forbidden from working. Would you accept Slackers by hand and brain, said Ridcully, always happy to see how far he could go. Slackers by hand and brain by statute, said the senior wrangler primly. Ridcully gave up. 
He could do this all day, but life couldn't be all fun. That being settled, then, I must tell you that I have asked the stalwart Mr. Frankly Otomy and Mr. Alf Nobbs to join us in this little escapade. Mr. Nobbs says that since we are not wearing football favours, we should not attract unwanted attention. The wizards nodded nervously at the Bledlows. They were, of course, merely employees of the university, while the wizards were, well, were the university, weren't they? After all, a university was not just about bricks and mortar, it was about people, specifically wizards. But to a man, the Bledlows scared them. They were all hefty men with a look of having been carved out of bacon. And they were all descendants of, and practically identical to, those men who had chased those wizards, younger and more limber, and it was amazing how fast you could run with a couple of bledlows behind you, through the foggy nighttime streets. If caught, said bledlows, who took enormous pleasure in the prosecution of the university's private laws and idiosyncratic rules, would then drag you before the Arch-Chancellor on a charge of attempting to become rascally drunk. That was preferable to fighting back, when the Bledlows were widely believed to take the opportunity for a little class warfare. That was years ago, but even now the unexpected sight of a Bledlow caused sullen, shameful terror to flow down the spines of men who had acquired more letters after their names than a game of Scrabble. Mr. Otomy, recognising this, leered and touched the brim of his uniform cap. Afternoon, Jinx, he said. Don't you worry about a thing. Me and Alf here will see you right. We'd better get moving, though. they bully off in half an hour. The senior wrangler would not have been the senior wrangler if he did not hate the sound of silence. As they shuffled out of the back door, wincing at the unfamiliar chafing of trouser upon knee, he turned to Mr. Nobbs and said, Nobbs, that's not a common name. Tell me, Alf, are you by any chance related to the famous Corporal Nobby Nobbs of the Watch? Mr. Nobbs took it well, Ridcully thought, given the clumsy lack of protocol. No, sir. Ah, uh, a distant branch of the name, then? No, sir. Different tree. In the greyness of her front room, Glenda looked at the suitcase and despaired. She'd done her best with brown boot polish week after week, but it had been bought from a shonky shop, and the cardboard under the leatherish exterior was beginning to show through. Her customers never seemed to notice, but she did, even when it was out of sight. It was a secret part of a secret life that she lived for an hour or two on her half-day off once a week, and maybe a little longer if today's cold calls worked out. She looked at her face in the mirror, and said in a voice that was full of jaunt, We all know the problem of underarm defoliation. It is so hard, isn't it, to keep the lichens healthy? But, she flourished a green and blue container with a golden stopper, one spray with verdant spring will keep those crevices moist and forest fresh all day long. She faltered, because it really wasn't her. She couldn't do jaunty. The stuff was a dollar a bottle. Who could afford that? Well, a lot of troll ladies, that's who. But Mr. Strong in the arm said it was okay because they had the money, and anyway, it did let the moss grow. She'd said all right, but a dollar for a fancy bottle of water with some plant food in it was a bit steep, and he'd said you are selling the dream. And they bought it. That was the worrying part. They bought it and recommended it to their friends. The city had discovered the heavy dollar now. She'd read about it in the paper. There had always been trolls around, doing the heavy lifting and generally being there in the background, if not being the actual background itself. But now they were raising families and running businesses, moving on and up and buying things, and that made them people at last. And so you got other people like Mr. Strong in the arm, a dwarf, selling beauty products to Miss and Mrs. Troll, via ladies like Glenda, a human, because although dwarfs and trolls were officially great chums these days, because of something called the Coombe Valley Accord, that sort of thing only meant much to the sort of people who signed treaties. 
even the most well-intentioned dwarf would not walk down some of the roads along which Glenda every week dragged her nasty semi-cardboard case selling the dream. It got her out of the house and paid for the little treats. There was money to put away for a rainy day. Mr. Strong in the arm had the knack of coming up with new ideas, too. Who would have thought that lady trolls would go for fake tan lotion? It sold. Everything sold. The dream sold, and it was shallow and expensive and made her feel cheap. It, her ever-straining ears, caught the sound of next door's front door opening very slowly. Ha! Juliet jumped as Glenda suddenly loomed beside her. Off somewhere? Gonna watch the game, ain't I? Glenda glanced up the street. A figure was disappearing rapidly around the corner. She grinned a grim grin. Oh, yes, good idea. I wasn't doing anything. Just wait while I fetch my scarf, will ya? To herself, she added. You just keep walking, Johnny. With a thump that caused pigeons to explode away like a detonating daisy, the librarian landed on his chosen rooftop. He liked football. Something about the shouting and the fighting appealed to his ancestral memories. And this was fascinating, because, strictly speaking, his ancestors had been blamelessly engaged for centuries as upstanding corn and feed merchants and, moreover, were allergic to heights. He sat down on the parapet with his feet over the edge, and his nostrils flared as he snuffed up the scents rising from below. It is said that the onlooker sees most of the game, but the librarian could smell as well, and the game, seen from outside, was humanity. Not a day went past without his thanking the magical accident that had moved him a few little genes away from it. Apes had it worked out. No ape would philosophize, the mountain is and is not. They would think, the banana is, I will eat the banana. There is no banana. I want another banana. He peeled one now, in a preoccupied way, while watching the evolving tableau below. Not only does said onlooker see most of the game, he might even see more than one game. This street was indeed a crescent, which would probably have an effect on tactics if the players had any truck with such high-flown concepts. People were pouring in from either end, and also from a couple of alleyways. Mostly they were male, extremely so. The women fell into two categories, those who had been tugged there by the ties of blood or prospective matrimony, after which they could stop pretending that this bloody mess was in any way engrossing, and a number of elderly women of a sweet old lady construction who bawled indiscriminately in a rising cloud of lavender and peppermint, screams of, Game Daddy, kick him in the nuts, and similar exhortations. And there was another smell now, one he had learned to recognize but could not quite fathom. It was the smell of nut. Tangled with it were the smells of tallow, cheap soap, and shonky shop clothing that the ape part of him categorized as belonging to Tin Flinging Man. He had been just another servant in the maze of the university, but now he was a friend of nut, and nut was important. He was also wrong. He had no place in the world, but he was in it, and the world was becoming aware of him soon enough. The librarian knew all about this sort of thing. There had been no space in the fabric of reality marked Simeon Librarian until he'd been dropped into one, and the ripples had made his life a very strange one. Ah, another scent was riding the gentle updraft. It was easy. Screaming banana pie woman. The librarian liked her. Oh, she had screamed and run away the first time she'd seen him. They all did. But she had come back, and she'd smelled ashamed. She also respected the primacy of words, and, as a primate, so did he. And sometimes she baked him a banana pie, which was a kind act. The librarian was not very familiar with love, which had always struck him as a bit ethereal and soppy, but kindness, on the other hand was practical. You knew where you were with kindness, especially if you were holding a pie it had just given you. 
she was a friend of Nut, too. Nut made friends easily for someone who'd come from nowhere. Interesting. The librarian, despite appearances, liked order. Books about cabbages went on the brassica shelves. Blit UUSSFY 890-9046, anti-Blit 1.1. Although obviously, Mr. Cauliflower's Big Adventure would be better placed in UUSSJ 3.2, greater than Blit 9. While the Tau of Cabbage would certainly be a candidate for UUSS Blit plus 60-SP55-09-HL Blit. Dash 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 blit. To anyone familiar with a seven-dimensional library system in blit dimensional space, it was as clear as day, if you remember to keep your eyes on the blit. Ah, and here came his fellow wizards, walking awkwardly in the chafing trousers and trying so hard not to stand out in a crowd that they would have stood out even more if the rest of the crowd had been the least bit interested. Nobody noticed. It was enthralling and exciting at the same time, Ridcully concluded. Normally the pointy hat, robe and staff cleared the way faster than a troll with an axe. They were being pushed and shoved, but it was not as unpleasant as the words suggested. There were moderate pressures on all sides as people poured in behind, as though the wizards were standing chest deep in the sea and were swaying and shifting to the slow rhythm of the tide. My goodness, said the chair of indefinite studies. Is this football? It's a bit dull, isn't it? Pies were mentioned, said the lecturer in recent runes, craning his neck. People are still coming in, Gov, said Otomy. But however do we see things? Depends on the shove, Gov. Usually people near the action shout out. Ah, I see a pie cellar, said the chair of indefinite studies. He took a couple of steps forward, there was a random shift and sway in the crowd, and he vanished. How is it now, Mr. Triv? said Nut, as people surged around them. Hurts like buggery, excuse my clutch in muttered Trev, clutching his injured arm to his coat. Are you sure you weren't holding a hammer? No hammer, Mr. Trev. I'm sorry, but you did ask me. Oh, no, oh, no. Where did you learn to punch like that? Never learned, Mr. Trev. I must never raise my hand to another person. But you went on so, and... I mean, you're so skinny. Long bones, Mr. Trev. Long muscles. I really am very sorry. My fault, Gabo. I didn't know your own strength. Suddenly Trev shot forward, cannoning into Nut. Where have you been, more man? said the person who had just slapped him hard on the back. We said to meet at the eel pie stall. Now the speaker looked at Nut and his eyes narrowed. And who's this stranger who thinks he's one of us? He did not exactly glare at Nut, but there was a definite sense of a weighing in the balance and on unfriendly scales. Trev brushed himself off, looking uncharacteristically embarrassed. Hi, Andy. Uh, this is Nut. He works for me. What is? A bog brush, said Andy. There was laughter from the group behind him. Andy always got a laugh. It was the first thing you noticed after the glint in his eye. And his dad is Captain of Dimwell, Gobbo. Pleased to meet you, sir, said Nut, extending a hand. Oh, pleased to meet you, sir. Andy mimicked, and Trev grimaced as a calloused hand the size of a plate grasped Nut's cheese straw fingers. He's got hands like a girl, Andy observed, taking a grip. Mr. Trev has been telling me wonderful things about the dimmers, sir, said Nut. Andy grunted. Trev saw his knuckles whiten with effort while Nut chattered. The camaraderie of the sport must be a wonderful thing. Yeah, right. Andy grunted, finally managing to pull his hand away, his face full of angry puzzlement. And this is my mate, Maxie, said Trev quickly. And this is Carter, the farter. He's fartmeister now, said Carter. Yeah, right. And this is Jumbo. You want to watch out for him? He's a thief. Jumbo can pick a lock faster than you can pick your nose. The said Jumbo held up a small bronze badge. Guild, of course he said. I nail your ears to the door, else. You mean you break the law for a living, 
said Nut, horrified. And you ever heard of the Thieves' Guild? said Andy. Gabbo's new, said Trev protectively. Hasn't got out much. He's a goblin from the high country. Coming down here, taking our jobs, yeah? said Carter. Like, how often do you do a hand's turn? said Trev. Well, I might want to one day. Milking the cows when they come home, said Andy. This got another laugh on cue, and that was the introduction sorted out, to Nut's surprise. He'd been expecting chicken theft to be mentioned. Instead, Carter pulled a couple of tin cans out of a pocket and tossed them to Nut and Trev. Did a few hours unloading down the docks, didn't I? he said defensively, as though a bit of casual labour was some kind of offence. This come off a boat from Forex. Jumbo fished in his pocket again and pulled out someone else's watch. Game on in five minutes, he declared. Let's shove. Uh, if that's all right with you, Andy. Andy nodded. Jumbo looked relieved. It was always important that things were all right with Andy, and Andy was still watching Nut as a cat watches an unexpectedly cheeky mouse while massaging his hand. Mr. Otomy cleared his throat, causing his red Adam's apple to bob up and down like an indecisive sunset. Shouting in public? Yes, he liked that. He was good at that. Speaking in public? No, that was a different kettle of humiliation. Well, uh, gents, what we will have here is your actual football what is basically about the shove, which is what you gentlemen will be doing soon. I thought we watched two groups of players vie with one another to get the ball in the opponent's goal. Could be, sir, could very much be, the Bledlow conceded. But in the streets, see, your actual supporters on both sides try and endeavour to shorten the length of the field, as it were, depending on the flow of play, so to speak. Like living walls, do you mean? said Ridcully. That style of thing, sir, yes, sir, said Otomy loyally. What about the goals? Oh, they're allowed to move the goals too. Sorry, said Ponder. The spectators can move the goals? You have put your finger firmly on it, sir. But that's sheer anarchy. It's a mess. Some of the old boys do say the game has gone downhill, sir, that is true. Downhill? Into and out through the bottom of the world, I'd say. Good one to play with magic, though, said Dr. Hicks. Well worth a try. A word to the wise, sir said Otomy with unwitting accuracy. But you'd be wearing your guts for garters if you tried it with some of the types who play these days. They take it seriously. Mr. Otomy, I'm sure none of my blokes wear garters. Ridcully stopped and listened to Ponder Stibbins' whispered interjection and continued. Well, possibly one. Two, at most. It would be a very dull world if we were all the same, that's what I say. He looked around and shrugged. So, this is football, is it? Rather a wizened shell of a game, yes? I, for one, don't want to stand around all day in the rain while other people have all the fun. Let's go and find the ball, gentlemen. We are wizards. That must count for something. I thought we were blokes now, said the lecturer in recent runes. Same thing, said Red Cully, straining to see over the heads of the crowd. Surely not. Well, said Ridcully, isn't a bloke someone who likes drinking with his mates and without the company of women? Anyway, I'm fed up with this. Form up behind me, nevertheless. We're going to see some football. The progress of the wizards astonished Otomy and Nobs, who had hitherto seen them as fluffy plump creatures quite divorced from real life. But to get to be a senior wizard and stay there called for deep reserves of determination, viciousness, and the sugared arrogance that is the mark of every true gentleman, as in, Oh, was that your foot? I'm so terribly sorry. And of course, 
there was Dr. Hicks, a good man to have in a tight spot because he was, by college statute, an officially bad person in accordance with UU's happy grasp of the inevitable. In short, every wizard knew that whatever you did, you'd get some wizards creeping off to do weird and messy magic in some cave somewhere. A less mature organisation than UU might have taken the view that the way forward would be to hunt such renegades down at great risk and expense. UU, on the other hand, had given Hicks and his team a department and a budget and a career structure and also the chance to go out into dark caves occasionally and throw fireballs at unofficial evil wizards. It all worked rather well, so long as nobody pointed out that the Department of Postmortem Communications was really, when you got right down to it, just a politer form of necromancy, wasn't it? And so Dr. Hicks was now tolerated as a useful, if slightly irritating, member of the Council, largely because he was allowed, by statute, to say some of the naughty things that the other wizards would really have liked to say themselves. Someone with a widow's peak, a skull ring, a sinister staff, and a black robe was expected to spread a little evil around the place. Although university statute had redefined acceptable evil, in this case, as being inconveniences on a par with shoelaces tied together, or a brief attack of groinal itch. It wasn't the most satisfactory of arrangements, but it was the best UU tradition. Hicks occupied, amiably, a niche that might otherwise be occupied by someone who really got off on the whole mouldering corpses and peeled skulls thing. Admittedly, he was always giving fellow wizards free tickets to the various amateur dramatic productions he was obsessively involved with, but, on balance, they agreed, taking one thing with another— This was still better than peeled skulls. For Hicks, a crowd like this was too good to waste. Not only was there a plethora of bootlaces to be expertly tied together, but there were an awful lot of pockets as well. He always had some flyers for the next production in his robe. Hicks had flatly refused to wear trousers. No self-disrespecting dark wizard would dream of wearing such common garb as a trouser, he declared. It totally spoiled the effect. And it wasn't the same as picking pockets. Quite the reverse. He stuffed them into any he could find. The day was all a mystery to Nut, and it stared a mystery becoming a little more mysterious with every passing minute. In the distance a whistle was blown, and somewhere in this moving, jostling, crushing, and in most cases drinking mob of people, there was a game going on, apparently. He had to take Trev's word for it. There were oohs and ahs in the distance, and the crowd ebbed and flowed in response. Trev and his chums, who called themselves as far as Nut could make out over the din, the dimwell massive pussy, took advantage of every temporary space to move nearer and nearer to the mysterious game, holding their ground when the press went against them and pushing hard when an eddy went their way. Push, sway, shove, and something in this spoke to Nut. It came up through the soles of his feet and the palms of his hands and slid into his brain with a beguiling subtlety, warming him, stripping him away from himself and leaving him no more than a beating part of the living, moving thing around him. A chant came past. It had started somewhere at the other end of the game, and, whatever it had been once, it was now just four syllables of roar from hundreds of people and many gallons of beer. As it faded, it took the warm, belonging feeling away with it, leaving a hole. Not looked into the eyes of Trev. Happened to you, did it? Trev said. That was quick. It was, Nut began. Oh no, we don't talk about it, said Trev flatly. But it spoke to me without... We don't talk about it, okay? Not that sort of thing. Look, they're being pushed back. It's opening up. Let's shove. And Nut was good at shoving. Very good. 
Under his inexorable pressure, people slid or gently spun out of the way, their hobnailed boots scraping on the stones as, short of an alternative, the owners were rolled and squeezed alongside Nut and Trev and deposited behind them, somewhat dizzy, bewildered, and angry. Now, though, there was a frantic tugging at Nut's belt. Stop pushing, Trev shouted. We've left the others behind. In fact, my progress is now hindered by a peas pudding and chowder stand. I have been doing my best, Mr. Trev, but it has really been slowing me down, said Nut over his shoulder, and also Miss Glenda. Uh, Hello, Miss Glenda. Trev glanced behind him. There was a fight going on back there, and he could hear Andy's battle cry. There was generally a fight going on around Andy, and if there wasn't, he started one. But you had to like Andy, because, well, you just had to. He, Glenda, was up ahead? Surely that meant that she would be there too. There was a commotion further on, and a vaguely oblong thing, wrapped now in tatters of cloth, rose up in the air and fell back to cheers and catcalls from the crowd. Trev had been right up to the game face many times before. It was no big deal. He'd seen the ball dozens of times. But how long had not been pushing a pudding stall in front of him like a snowplow? Oh my, Trev thought, I've found a player. How can he do it? He looks half starved all the time. In the absence of anywhere round in the press of people, Trev scrambled between Nut's legs and, for a moment, looked down an avenue of coat hems, boots, and, right in front of him, a pair of legs that were considerably more attractive than those of Nut. He surfaced a few inches away from the milky blue eyes of Juliet. She did not look surprised. Surprise is an instant thing, and by the time Juliet could register surprise, she generally wasn't. Glenda, on the other hand, was the kind of person who instantly whacks surprise on the meat slab of indignation and hammers it into fury. And as their gazes locked and metaphorical bluebirds cleared their throats for the big number, she appeared between them and demanded, What the hells were you doing down there, Trevor Likely? The bluebirds evaporated. What are you doing up front here? said Trev. It wasn't repartee, but it was the best he could do, with his heart pounding. We got shoved, growled Glenda. You lot were shoving us. Me? I never did, said Trev indignantly. He was... He hesitated. Not? Look at him standing there all nervous and skinny, like he's never had a good meal in his life. I wouldn't believe me, and I am me. He was then behind, he said lamely. Trolls with big boots on, were they? said Glenda, her voice all vinegar. We'd be in the game if it wasn't for Mr. Nut here holding you all back. The unfairness of this took Trevor back, but he decided to stare there rather than argue with Glenda. Nut could do no wrong in her eyes, and Trev could do no right, which he couldn't contest, but rather felt should be amended to never did any serious wrong. But there was Juliet, smiling at him. When Glenda looked away to talk to Nut, she slipped something into his hand and then turned her back on him as if nothing had happened. Trev opened his hand, heart pounding, and there was a little enamel badge in black and white, the colours of the hated enemy. It was still warm from her hand. He closed his hand quickly and looked around to see if anyone had spotted this betrayal of all that was good and true, i.e. the good name of Dimwell. Supposing he got knocked down by a troll and one of the lads found it on him. Supposing Andy found it on him. But it was a gift from her. He put it into his pocket and rammed it down to the bottom. This was going to be really difficult, and Trev was not a man who liked problems in his life. The owner of the pudding stand, having enterprisingly sold a number of portions to passing trade during its journey, strolled up to Trev and offered him a bag of hot peas. Soft mate you got there, he said. Some kind of troll, is he? Not troll, goblin, said Trev, as the sounds of the strife drew nearer. I thought they were little buggers. This one isn't, said Trev, 
wishing the man would go away. There was a sudden localized silence, kind of noise made by people who are holding their breath. He looked up and saw the ball for the second time in the game. There was a core of ashwood in there somewhere, then a leather skin and finally dozens of layers of cloth for grip and it was dropping with pinpoint inevitability towards the beautiful dreamy head of Juliet. Trev dived at her without a moment's thought, dragging her under the cart as the ball thumped onto the cobbles where she had been gracing the world with her presence. Many things went through Trev's mind as the ball hit the ground. She was in his arms. Even if she was complaining about getting mud on her coat, he'd probably saved her life, which, from a romantic point of view, was money in the bank and, oh yes, dimmer or dolly. If one of the hardcore posses found out about this, the next thing to go through his head would be a boot. She giggled. Shush, he managed. Not a good idea if you'd rather not know how you would look with that beautiful hair shaved off. Trev peeped out from under the stall and attracted no attention at all. This is because Nut had picked up the ball and was turning it over and over in his hands with a frown on what was visible of, if you were kind, his face. Is this all it is? he said to a bewildered Glenda. A most inappropriate ending to a pleasant social gathering with interesting canapes. Where is this wretched thing supposed to be, then? Glenda, hypnotized by the sight, pointed a wavering finger in the general direction of down the street. There's a big pole, painted white, well spattered with red at the bottom. Oh, yes, I see it. Well, in that case, I'll... Look, will will you men please stop pushing? Not added to the crowd, who were craning to see. But there's no way you'll ever get it there, Glenda yelled. Just put it down and come away. Trev heard a grunt from Nut and absolute silence from the rest of the world. Oh, no, he thought. Really, no. It must be more than, what, a hundred and fifty yards to that goal, and those things fly like a bucket. There is no way that he could... A distant pock broke the breathless silence, which healed itself instantly. Trev peered over a shoulder as the sixty-foot goal post gave up its battle with termites, rot, weather, gravity, and not and fell into its own base in a cloud of dust. He was so astonished that he hardly noticed Juliet standing up next to him. In fact, Juliet's rising from beneath the cart passed relatively unnoticed by all, except an art student, who was almost blinded by the light at the spectacle, and many years later, painted the picture known as Beauty Arising from the Peas Pudding Cart attended by cherubs carrying hot dogs and pies. It was widely regarded as a masterpiece, although no one could ever work out exactly what the hell it was all about. But it was beautiful, and so it was true. Is that a kind of, like, sign? said Juliet, who believed in such things. At that moment, Trev believed in pointing a finger towards the other side of the street and shouting, He went that way! And then hauling Juliet upright and butting Nut in the stomach. Let's go! He added. He couldn't do anything about Glenda, but that would not matter. While he held Juliet's hand, Glenda would follow him like a homing vulture. People were trying to run towards the hidden goal. Others were making for the apparent location of the long-distance scorer. Trev pointed in a random direction and yelled, He went down there, big man with a black hat. Confusion always helped, when it wasn't yours. When it was time for a hue and cry, make sure who was Hugh. They halted a few alleys away. There was still a commotion far off, but a city crowd is easier to get lost in than a forest. Look, perhaps I should go back and apologize, Nut began. I could make a new pole quite easily. I hate to tell you this, Gabbo, but I think you might have upset the kind of people who don't listen to apologies, said Trev. Keep moving, everyone. Why might they be upset? 
Well, Mr Nutt, first, you are not supposed to score a goal when it is not your game. And anyway, you are a watcher, not a player, said Glenda. And second, a shot like that gets right at people's noses. You could have killed someone. No, Miss Glenda, I assure you I could not. I deliberately aimed at the pole. So, that doesn't mean you were sure to hit it. Uh, I have to say it does, Miss Glenda, he mumbled. How did you do it? You took the pole to bits. They don't grow on trees. You get us all into trouble. Why can't he be a player? said Juliet, staring at her reflection in a window. What? said Glenda. Bloody hell, said Trev. With him on the team, you wouldn't need a team. That'd save a lot of trouble then, said Juliet. So you say, said Glenda. And where would be the fun in that? That wouldn't be football anymore. We are being watched, said Nut. I am sorry to interrupt you. Trev glanced around. The street was busy, but mostly with its own affairs. There's no one interested, Gubbo. We're well away. I can feel it on my skin, Nut insisted. What? Through all that wool, said Glenda. He turned around, soulful eyes on her. Yes, he said and remembered ladyship testing him on that. It had seemed like a game at the time. He glanced up, and a large head drew back quickly from a parapet. There was a very faint smell of bananas. Ah, that one. He was nice. Nut saw him sometimes, going hand over hand along the pipes. You ought to get our home, said Trev to Glenda. Glenda shuddered. Not a good idea. Old Stollop will ask her what she saw at the game. Well? She'll tell him. And who she saw? Can't she lie? Not in the way you can, Trev. She's just no good at making stuff up. Look, let's get back to the university. We all work there, and I often go in to catch up. We'll go directly now, and you two go back the long way. We never saw one another, right? And for heaven's sake, don't let him do anything silly. Excuse me, Miss Glenda said Nut meekly. Yes, what? Which of us were you addressing? I have let you down, said Nut, as they strolled through the post-match crowds. At least Trev ambled. Nut moved with a strange gait that suggested there was something wrong with his pelvis. Nah, it's fixable, said Trev. Everything is fixable. I'm a fixer, me. What did anybody really see? Just a bloke in dimmy kit. There's thousands of us. Don't worry. Uh, how come you're so tough, Gubbo? You spent your life lifting weights or what? You are correct in your surmise, Mr. Trev. Before I was born, I did indeed use to lift weights. I was only a child then, of course. They strolled on, and after a while, Trev said, Could you say that again? It's got stuck in my head. Actually, I think part of it's sticking out of my ear. Ah, yes. Uh, Perhaps I have confused you. There was a time when my mind was full of darkness. Then Brother Oates helped me to the light, and I was born. Oh, uh, religion stuff. But here I am. You asked why I am strong. When I lived in the dark of the forge, I used to lift weights the tongs at first, and then the little hammer, and then the biggest hammer, and then one day I could lift the anvil. That was a good day. It was a little freedom. Why was it so important to lift the anvil? I was chained to the anvil. They walked on in silence again until Trev, picking each word with care, said, I guess things must be sort of tough in the high country. It's not so bad now, I think. Might you count your blessings, that sort of thing. The presence of a certain lady, Mr. Trev? Yes, since you ask. I think about her all the time. I really like her. But she's a dolly. A small group of supporters turned to glance at them, and he lowered his voice to a hiss. She's got brothers with fists the size of a bull's arse. I have read, Mr. Trev, that love laughs at locksmiths. Really? And what does it do when it's been smacked in the face by a bull's ass? 
The poets are not forthcoming in that respect, Mr. Trev. Besides, said Trev, locksmiths tend to be quiet blokes, you know, careful and patient and that, like you. I reckon you could get away with a bit of a joke. You must have met girls. I mean, you know, oil painting, that's a fact, but they like a posh voice. I bet you had them eating out of your hand. Well, after you'd washed it, obviously. Nut hesitated. There had been ladyship, of course, and Miss Heel's tether, neither of whom fitted easily into the category of girl. Of course, there were the little sisters, who were certainly young and apparently female, but it had to be said, looked rather like intelligent chickens, and certainly weren't seen at their best when you watched them feeding. But once again, girls did not seem the right word. I have not met many girls, he volunteered. There's Glenda. She's taken a real shine to you. Watch out, though. She'll run your life for you if you let her. It's what she does. She does it to everyone. You do have a history, I think, said Nut. You are a sharp one, aren't you? Quiet and sharp, like a knife. Yeah, I suppose it was a history. I wanted it to be more of a geography, but she kept slapping my hand. Trev paused to search for any flicker in Nut's face. That was a joke he added, without much hope. Thank you for telling me, Mr. Trev. I will decipher it later. Trev sighed. But I ain't like that any more, and Juliet, oh, well, I'd crawl a mile over broken glass just to hold her aid. No funny business. Writing a poem is often the way to the intended's heart, said Nut. Trev brightened. Oh, I'm good with words. If I wrote her a letter, you could give it to her, right? If I write it on posh paper, something like, let's say, uh, I think you are really fit. How about a date? No hanky-panky. Promise. Love, Trev. How's that sound? The soul of it is pure and noble, Mr. Trev, but uh, if I could assist in some way? It needs longer words, right? And more sort of curly language, said Trev. But Nut was not paying attention. Sounds lovely to me, said a voice above Trev's head. Who do you know what can read, smart boy? There was this to be said about the Stollop brothers. They weren't dandy. It was, in the great scheme of things, not a huge difference when you couldn't see for blood, but, in short, Stollops knew that force had always worked, and so had never bothered to try anything else whereas Andy was a stone-cold psychopath who had a following only because it was safer than being in front of him. He could be quite charming when the frantically oscillating mood swing took him. That was the best time to run. As for the Stollops, it would not take long for a researcher to realize that Juliet was the brains of the family outfit. One advantage from Trev's point of view was that they thought they were clever because no one had ever told them otherwise. Ha, Mr. Psycho Trev, said Billy Stollop, prodding Trev with a finger like a hippopotamus sausage. You're full of smart. You tell us who broke the goal, right? I was in the shove, Billy. Didn't see a thing. He gonna play for the dimmers, Billy persisted. Billy, not even your dad and his best could throw the ball half as far as everyone is saying. You know it, right? You couldn't do it. I'm hearing that the Angels post just fell apart and someone made up a story. Would I lie to you, Billy? Trev could make up lies that were very nearly truths. Yeah, because you're a dimmer. All right, you got me. I'll come clean, said Trev, holding out his hands. Respecting all that, Billy. It was not here that threw that ball. That's my last offer. I ought to smack your head off for that said Billy, sneering at Nut. That kid don't look like he could even lift the ball. And then a voice behind Trev said, What? Billy! Have they let you out without your colour on? Nut heard Trev mutter, Oh, God, and I was doing so well, under his breath. And then his friend turned and said, It's a free street, Andy. No army passing the time, eh? The dolly's killed your own man, Trev. Ain't you got no shame? The rest of the massive posse was standing behind Andy, their expressions a mix of defiance and the realisation that, once again, 
they were going to be dragged into something. They were out in the main streets now. The watch was not inclined to get involved in alley scuffles, but out in the open they had to do something in case the taxpayers complained. And since tired coppers didn't like having to do something, they did it good and hard. So with any luck, they wouldn't have to do it again any time soon. What do you know about all this they're saying about a dimmer man and a dolly tart holding hands in the shove? Andy demanded. He put a heavy hand on Trev's shoulder. Come on, you're smart. You always know everything before anyone else. Tart? That was Billy. It was a long way from his ears to his brain. It's not a girl in Dolly Sisters who'd look at you, Poxy lot. Uh, so that's where we got it from, said Carter the farter. This struck Nut as inflammatory in the circumstances. Perhaps, he thought, the ritual is that childish insults shall be exchanged until both sides feel fully justified in attacking, just as Dr. von Mausberger noted in Ritual Aggression in Pubescent Rats. But Andy had fished his short cutlass out of his shirt. It was a nasty little weapon, alien to the true spirit of football, which generally smiled indulgently on things that bruised, scared, fractured, and, okay, worst case, heat of the moment and so on, blinded. But you'd got another eye, right? And now you had solid proof that you were a hard man especially if you've got one of those scars that run across the eye and down the cheek. Get a black eye patch and you would never have to wait to be served at a bar ever again. But then came Andy, who had issues. And once you had someone like Andy around you, you got other Andys around too. And every kid who might otherwise have gone to a match with a pair of brass knuckles for bravado noticeably clanked when he walked, and needed to be helped up if he fell over. Now, weapons were being loosened here too. Careful now, everyone, Trev cautioned, stepping back and waving his empty hands in a conciliatory way. This is a busy street, okay? If the old Sam catch you fighting, they'll be down on you with big, big truncheons, and they'll beat you until you honk your breakfast, because for why? Because they hate you. Because you're making paperwork for them and keeping them out of the donut shop. He stepped back a little further. But then on account of you damaging their weapons with your heads, they'll run you down to the tanty for a nice night in the tank. Been there? Was it so much fun you want to go back again? He noted with satisfaction the looks of dismayed recollection on the faces of all except Nut, who couldn't have any idea, and Andy, who was brother to the tank. But even Andy was not inclined to go up against the Sam. Kill just one of them, and Veterinary would give you one chance to see if you could stand on air. They relaxed a little, but not too much. All it took in these sphincter-taught circumstances was one idiot. As it happened, one very clever person was able to do the job when Nut turned to Algernon, the youngest Stollop, and said cheerfully, Do you know, sir? that your situation here is very similar to that described by von Mausberger in his treatise on his experiment with rats? At this point, Algernon, after one second of what passed for Algernon as thought, whacked him hard with his club. Algernon was a big boy. Trev managed to grab his friend before he hit the cobbles. The club had hit not square in the chest and tore the ancient sweater open. Blood was soaking through the stitches. What did you have to go and hit him for, you bloody fool? Trev said to Algernon, agreed even by his brothers to be as thick as elephant soup. It wasn't doing a thing. What was that all about, eh? He sprang to his feet, and before Algernon could move, Trev had ripped his own shirt off and was ministering to Nut, trying to staunch the wound. He came back up again after half a minute and flung the sodden shirt at Algernon. It's no heartbeat, you moron! What did he ever do to you? Even Andy was frozen. No one had ever seen Trev like it, not old Trev. Even the dollies knew Trev was smart. Trev was slick. Trev wasn't the sort to commit suicide by yelling at a bunch of men who were already tensed for a fight. The luckless Algernon, with Trev's rage baking his face, managed, But, uh, look, he's a dimmer. Who are you? 
You're a bloody fool, that's what you are, screamed Trev. He rounded on the others, finger shaking. Who are ya? Who are ya? Nothing, you rubbish, you shite. He jabbed the finger at Nut. And him, he made stuff. He knew things. And he'd never seen a game before today. He was only wearing the strip to fit in. Don't you worry, Trev, mate. Andy hissed and raised his cutlass menacingly. It's going to be a bloody war about this. But Trev was suddenly in his face like a wasp. You what? You're a mental. You just don't get it, do you? I can see helmets, Andy, said Jumbo urgently. Me? What did I do? As much as the stupid stollops, dimmers and dollies? I hope the god shit thin shit on both of you. You're getting really close, Andy. The stollop boys, who were not altogether dumb, were already leaving. People in football strip were crisscrossing the city. The watch couldn't chase everyone, but, well, belting some bloke who then bled a lot and stopped breathing, well, that was tantamount to murder, and the old Sam could develop quite a turn of speed in those circumstances. Andy shook a furious finger at Trev. It's a hard life in a shove when you're a dumb chuff with no mates. This ain't the shove. Better wake up, kid. It's all shove. The posse left at speed, although Jumbo turned for a moment to mouth. Sorry. They weren't the only ones hurrying off. The street people were all for a free cabaret, but this one might have associated difficulties. For example, the asking of dangerous metaphysical questions, such as, did you see anything, and similar. It was all very well for the watch to say, the innocent have nothing to fear. But what was that all about? Who cared about the innocent and their problems when the watch were on their way? Trev knelt by the cooling body of the lit nut. And now, for the first time in a minute, it seemed to Trev, he started to breathe again. He had stopped when he had raged at Andy, because if you talked like that to Andy, you were dead anyway, so why waste your breath? There were things you had to do, weren't there? Weren't you supposed to keep banging on the chest to, like, show the broken heart how to beat again? But he didn't know how, and you didn't need much smarts to know that it was not a good idea to try to learn with the watch on the way. It would not give a good first impression. That was why, when two watchmen turned up at speed, Trev was walking unsteadily towards them with Nut in his arms. He was relieved to see that in charge was Constable Haddock. At least he was one of the ones who asked questions first. Behind him, and eclipsing most of the scenery, was Troll Officer Blue John, who could clear a whole street just by walking down the centre of it. Can you help me get him to the Lady Sybil, Mr Haddock? He's very heavy, said Trev. Constable Haddock pulled the sodden shirt aside and made a sad little clicking sound. With experience comes familiarity. Morg's closer, lad. No, Haddock nodded. You're Dave Likely, son, aren't you? I don't have to tell you. No, because I'm right, said Constable Haddock evenly. OK, Trev. Blue John here will take this man, who I expect you have never seen before in your life, and we'll both run to keep up. There was a decent thunderstorm the night before last. He might be lucky, and so might you. I never did it. Course not. And now, let's see who's fastest at running, shall we? The hospital first. I want to stay with him, said Trev, as Blue John's huge hand gently cradled Nut. No, lad, said Haddock. You stay with me. It didn't stop with Constable Haddock. It never did. Everyone called him Kipper and his calm, unspoken message that, since we're all in this together, why make it hard for one another, often worked. But sooner or later you'd be handed over to a senior copper who manufactured hard in a little room with another copper at the door. And this one had been working double shifts by the look of her. I'm Sergeant Angua, sir, and I hope you are not in trouble. She opened a notebook and smoothed down the page. Shall we go through the motions? 
You told Constable Haddock that you saw a fight going on, and when you got there, all the big boys had run away, and amazingly, you found your workmate, Mr. Nuts, bleeding to death. Well, I bet I can name all the big boys, every last one of them. I wonder why can't you, and what, Trevor Likely, is this about? She flicked a black and white enamel token across the table, and by luck, or judgment, its pen stuck in the wood a few inches from Trev's hand. The unofficial motto of the Lady Sybil Free Hospital was, Not everybody dies. It was true that, subsequent to the founding of the Lady Sybil, the chances of death from at least some causes in the city were quite amazingly reduced. Its surgeons were even known to wash their hands before operating as well as after. But moving through its white corridors now was a figure who knew, from personal experience, that the unofficial motto was, in reality, entirely mistaken. Death stood by the well-scrubbed slab and looked down. Mr. Nut, well, this is a surprise, said Death, reaching into his robe. Let me see what I have here. You know, he said, I used to wonder why people scrabbled so. After all, compared with the length of infinity, people do not live any time at all, even you, Mr. Nutt. Although I can see that scrabbling would work a little magic in your case. I can't see you, said Nutt. Just as well, said Death. You will not remember me, in any case, later on. I'm dying, then, said Nut. Yes, dying, and then again living. He fished out a lifetimer from his robe and watched as the sand fell upwards. See you later, Mr. Nut. I fear that you will have an interesting life. A dolly favour and a good dimmer, boy. God's bless my soul, I say. What can this be about? And you know what? I will find out. It's all a matter of shoving. Trev said nothing. He was out of options. Besides, he had seen the sergeant before, and she always seemed to be looking at his throat. Constable Haddock tells me the eagles on duty down at the Lady Sybil. I hope he's got a heart in his vats that'll fit your friend. I really do, she said. But it'll still be a murder case, even if he comes walking in here tomorrow. Lord Veterinari's rules. If it takes an Igor to bring you back, you were dead. Briefly dead, it's true, which is why the murderer will be briefly hanged. A quarter of a second usually does it. I didn't touch him! I know. But you have to keep solid with your mates, right? Jumbo, and of course, Carter, and oh yes, Andy, Shank, your mates who aren't here. Look, you are not under arrest, yet. You are helping the watch with their inquiries. That means you can use the privy, if you're feeling brave. If you're feeling suicidal, use the canteen. But if you try to run off, I will hunt you down. She sniffed and added, like a dog. Understand? Can I go and see how Nut is getting on? No. Kip is still down there now. That's Constable Haddock to you. Everyone calls him Kipper. Maybe, but not when it's you talking to me. The sergeant twirled the fever around on the table in an absent-minded way. Has Mr. Nutt got any next of kin? That means relatives. I know what it means. He talks about people in Uberwald. That's all I know. Trev lied instinctively, saying that someone had spent his youth chained to an anvil was not going to help here. He gets on all right with the other guys in the vats. How come he's in there? We never ask. There's usually some bad story. Anyone ever ask you? He stared at her. That was coppers for you. They came over all friendly, and just when you dropped your guard, they stuck a pickaxe in your brain. Was that an official copper question, or were you just being nosy? Coppers are never nosy, Mr. Likely. However, sometimes we ask tangential questions. So it wasn't official? Not really. Then shove it where the sun does not shine. Sergeant Angua smiled a copper's smile. You've got no card in your hand that you dare play, and you come out with something like that. 
From Andy, yes, I'd expect it, but Kipper says you're smart. How smart does someone have to be to be as stupid as you? There was a tentative knock at the door, and then a watchman put his head around it. Someone was shouting in the background in a large authoritative voice. I mean you deal with this sort of thing all the time, don't you? For heaven's sake, it's not that hard. Yes, Nobby? We've got a bit of a situation, Sarge. That stiff that went to the Lady Sybil. Uh, Dr. Lawn's here, and he says the man's got up and gone home. Did they get an Igor to look at him? Uh, yes, uh, sort of... Uh, the watchman was elbowed out of the way by an expansive man in a long green rubber robe who was clearly trying to balance angry and friendly at the same time. He was tailed by Constable Haddock, who was clearly trying to mollify him and definitely failing. Look, we try to help, all right, said Dr. Lawn. You people say you've got a murder case and I'll pull old Eager off his slab and hang the overtime. But you tell Sam Vimes from me that I'd like him to send his boys down when they're not busy for a bit of first aid tuition to wit the difference between dead and sleeping. It's a fine line sometimes, but it's generally possible to spot the clues. The profession has always tended to consider walking about to be among the more reliable. Although in this city we've learned to look on that as just a very good start. But when we pulled back the sheet, he sat up and asked Igor if he had a sandwich, which is generally conclusive. Apart from a fever, he was fine. Strong heartbeat, which suggests he's got one, not a scratch on him, but he could certainly do with a good dinner. He must have been hungry because he ate the sandwich Igor made for him. On the subject of dinners, frankly, I could do with mine. You let him go? said Sergeant Angua, horrified. Of course I can't keep a man in hospital for being inconveniently alive. She turned to Constable Haddock. And you let him go, Kipper? It looked like a case of doctor's orders, Sarge, said Haddock, giving Trev a wretched look. He was covered in blood. He was really messed up, Trev exploded. A prank then? Angua tried. I'd have sworn there wasn't a heartbeat, Sergeant, Haddock volunteered. Maybe he's one of those monks from the hub that do the hocus-pocus stuff. Then someone has been wasting watch time, said Angua, glaring at Trev. He spotted that one for the desperate throw that it was. What would be in it for me? He said. Do you think I want to be here? Constable Haddock cleared his throat. It's match night, Sarge. The desk is heaving and there are supporters roaming around all over the place and someone's been feeding them a lot of rumours. We're stretched, that's all I'm saying. We've had a couple of big shouts already. And he did walk away after all. Not a problem for me said the doctor. Came in horizontal, went out upright. It's the preferred way. And I've got to get back, Sergeant. We're going to have a busy night, too. The sergeant looked for someone to shout at, and there was Trev. You, Trev Likely. This one's down to you. Go and find your chum, and if there's any more trouble, there'll be... trouble. Is that clear? Twice, Sarge. He couldn't resist it. He just couldn't not even with the cold sweat running down his spine. But he felt light, uplifted, released. But some people just can't respect an epiphany when you're having one. It's not a cop skill. It's sergeant to you, likely. Here. Trev managed to catch the favour as it was skimmed across the room. Thanks, Sarge. Get out. He got out and was half expecting the shadowy ship that stepped up to him when he was clear of the building. There was a faint odour in the grey air. Well, at least it wasn't Andy. He could do without Andy right now. Yes, Carter, he said to the fog. How did you know it was me? Trev sighed. I guessed. He started to walk fast. Andy wouldn't deny what you said. Don't worry, it's sorted. Sorted? How? Carter, always a bit overweight, had to scurry to keep up not going to tell you. Oh, the joy of the moment. But can I tell him we're in the clear? It's all sorted, done and dusted. I blew it out. It's fixed, all gone away. It never happened. Are you sure? said Carter. He was pretty busted up. Hey, what can I tell you? Trev flung out his arms and twirled a pirouette. I'm Trev Likely. 
Well, that's firm then. Hey, I'll bet Andy will let you back in the posse now. That'd be great, eh? Do you know what Nat thought the posse was called, Carter? No, what? Trev told him. Well, that's... Carter began, but Trev interrupted. It's funny, Carter. It's funny and sort of sad and hopeless, it really is. Trev stopped walking so abruptly that Carter collided with him. And here's a tip. Carter the farter isn't going to take you anywhere. And that goes for the fartmeister too, trust me. But everyone calls me Carter the farter, the fartmeister wailed. Punch the next one who does. See a doctor, cut down on carbohydrates, keep out of confined spaces, use aftershave, said Trev, speeding up again. Where are you going, Trev? I'm getting out of the shove, Trev called over his shoulder. Carter looked around desperately. What shove? Haven't you heard? It's all shove. Trev wondered if he glowed as he trotted through the fog. Things were going to be different. As soon as Smeems got in, he'd go and see him about a better job or something. A figure appeared out of the mist ahead of him. This was something of an achievement, since the figure was a head shorter than him. Mr. Lightly? It said. Who's asking? said Trev and added. What's asking? The figure sighed. I understand that you are a friend of the gentleman recently admitted to the hospital. It said. What's that to you? Quite a lot, said the figure. May I ask if you know very much about the gentleman? I don't have to talk to you, said Trev. Everything's been fixed, okay? Would that this was the case, said the figure. I have to talk to you. My name is Igor. You know, I had a feeling about that. Are you the one who made the sandwich for Nut? asked Trev. Yes, tuna, spaghetti and jam with sprinkles. My signature dish. Do you know anything about his background? Not a thing, mister. Really? Look, in the vats you stir up tallow, not the past, okay? You just don't, right? I know he's had some bad times and that's all I'm telling you. I thought so, said Igor. I believe he comes from Uberwald. Some strange and dangerous things come from Uberwald. This might sound a stupid question, but do you come from Uberwald by any chance? said Trev. Think you ask? Yes, said Igor. Trev hesitated. You saw Igor's around occasionally. The only thing most people knew was that they could stitch you up even better than the watch and did strange things in cellars and only tended to come out much when there were thunderstorms. I think your friend may be very dangerous, said Igor. Trev tried to picture Nut as dangerous. It was quite hard until you remembered a throw that knocked down a whole goalpost half a street away. He wished he didn't. Why should I listen to you? How do I know you are not dangerous? He said. Oh, I am, said Igor. Believe me, and Uberwald contains things that I would not want to meet. I am not going to listen to you, said Trev. And you are pretty hard to understand in any case. Is he subject to strange moods? Igor plied on. Does he get into a rage? Do you know anything about his eating habits? Yes, he likes apple pies, said Trev. What are you on about? I can see you are great friends, said Igor. I am sorry that I have trespassed on your time. Treth passed, hanging in the air considerably, added to the water drops hanging in the fog. I will give you some advice when you need me. 
just scream. I regret that you will find it very easy to scream. The figure turned and instantly vanished into the mist. And Igor's moved about oddly, Trev remembered, and you never saw one at a football game. He noticed that last thought go past. What had he tried to tell himself? That someone who did not watch football was not a real person? He couldn't think of a proper answer. He was amazed that he had even asked the question. Things were changing. Glinda arrived in the night kitchen with Juliet sworn to silence, and beneficently gave Mildred and Mrs. Hedges the rest of the night off. That suited them both very well, as it always does, and a little favour had been done there that she could call upon when necessary. She took her coat off and rolled up her sleeves. She felt at home in the night kitchen, in charge, in control. Behind black iron ranges, she could defy the world. All right, she said to the subdued Juliet. We weren't there today. Today did not happen. You were here helping me clean the ovens. I'll see you get some overtime so your dad won't suspect, okay? Have you got that? Yes, Glenda. And while we're here, we'll make a start on the pies for tomorrow night. It'll be nice to get ahead of ourselves, right? Juliet said nothing. Say yes, Glenda, Glenda prompted. Yes, Glenda. Go and chop some pork, then. Being busy takes your mind off things, that's what I always say. Yes, Glenda, that's what you always say, said Juliet. An inflection caught Glenda's ear and worried her a little. Do I always say that? When? Every day when you come in and put your apron on, Glenda. Mother used to say that, said Glenda, and tried to shake the thought out of her head. And she was right, of course. Hard work never hurt anybody. And she tried to unthink the treacherous thought, except her. Pies, she thought. You can rely on pies. Pies don't give you grief. I think that Trev likes me, Juliet muttered. He don't give me funny looks like the other boys. He looks like a little puppy. You want to look out for that look, my girl? I think I love him, Glendy. Wild boar, thought Glenda, and apricots. There's some left in the cool room, and we've got mutton pies with a choice of tracklements. Always popular. So, pork pies, I think, and there's some decent oysters in the pump room, so they'll do for the wet pie. I'll do sea pie, and the anchovies look good, so there's always room for a stargazy or two, even though I feel sorry for the little fishes. But right now I'll bake some blind pastry so that... What did you say? I love him. You can't. He saved my life. That's no basis for a relationship. A polite thank you would have sufficed. I've got a feeling about him. That's just silly. Well, silly's not bad, is it? Now you listen to me, young... Oh, hello, Mr. Otomy. It is in the way of the Otomies all around the worlds to look as if they have been built out of the worst parts of two men and to be annoyingly hushin-footed on thick red rubber soles, all the better to peep and pry and they always assume that a free cup of tea is theirs by right. What a day, miss, what a day. Were you at the match? he inquired, glancing from Glenda to Juliet. Been cleaning the ovens, said Glenda briskly. Yes, today didn't happen, Juliet added and giggled. Glenda hated giggling. Otomy looked around slowly and without embarrassment, noting the absence of dirt, discarded gloves, cloths, and we've only just finished getting everything all neat and tidy, Glenda snarled. Would you like a cup of tea, Mr. Otomy, and then you can tell us all about the game? It has been said the crowds are stupid, but mostly they are simply confused, since, as an eyewitness, the average person is as reliable as a meringue life jacket. It became obvious, as Otomy went on, that nobody had any clear idea about anything other than that some bloke threw a goal from halfway down the street and even then, only maybe. But, funny thing, Otomy went on as Glenda metaphorically let out a breath. While we was in the shove, 
I could have sworn I saw your lovely assistant here, chatting to a lad in the dimmest strip. No law against that, Glenda said. Anyway, she was here, cleaning the ovens. It was clumsy, but she hated people like him, who lived for the exercise of third-hand authority and loved every little bit of power they could grab. He'd seen more than he had told her, that was certain, and wanted her to wriggle. And out of the corner of her mind, she could feel him looking at their coats. Their wet coats. I thought you didn't go to the football, Mr. Otome. Ah, well, there you have it. The pointees wanted to go and watch a game, and me and Mr. Nobbs had to go with them in case they got breathed on by ordinary people. Blimey, you wouldn't believe it. Touching and complaining and taking notes like they owned the street. They're up to something, you mark my words. Glenda didn't like the word pointies, although it was a good description. Coming from Otomy, though, it was an invitation to greasy conspiracy. But however you baked it, wizards were knobs, people who mattered, the movers and the shakers. And when people like that got interested in the doings of people who, by definition, did not matter, little people were about to be shaken and shook. Vetinari doesn't like football, she said. Well, of course, they're all in it together, said Otomy, tapping his nose. This caused a small lump of dried matter to shoot from his other nostril into his tea. Glenda had a brief struggle with her conscience over whether to point this out, but one. I thought you should know this on account of how people up in the sisters look up to you, said Otomy. I remember your mum. She was a saint, that woman. Always had a helping hand for everyone. Yes, and didn't they grab, said Glenda to herself. She was lucky to die with all her fingers. Otomy drained his mug and plonked it on the table with a sigh. Can't stand around here all day, eh? Yes, I'm sure you've got loads of other places to stand. Otomy paused at the entrance arch and turned to grin at Juliet. The girl, the spitting image of you, I'd swear it. With a dimmer boy. Amazing. You must have one of those double gangers. Well, it'll have to remain a mystery. As the man said when he found something, that would have to remain a mystery. Toodaloo! He stopped dead, rather than walk, into the silvery knife that Glenda was holding, in a not totally threatening way, quite close to his throat. She had the satisfaction of seeing his Adam's apple pop back up and down again like a sick yo-yo. Sorry about that, she said, lowering it. I've always got a knife in my hand these days. We've been doing the pork. Very much like human flesh, pork, or so they say. She put her spare hand across his shoulders and said, Probably not a good idea spreading silly rumours, Mr. Otomy. You know, how people can be so funny about that sort of thing. Nice of you to drop by, and if you happen to be going past tomorrow, I'll see that you get a pie. Do excuse us. Have a lot of chopping up to do. He left at speed. Glenda, her heart pounding, looked at Juliet. Her mouth made a perfect O. What? What? I thought you was going to stab him. I just happened to be holding a knife. You are holding a knife. We hold knives. This is a kitchen. Do you think he's going to tell? He doesn't really know anything. It inches, she thought. That's as big as you can make a pie without a dish. How many pies could I make out of a weasel like Otomy? The big mincer would make it easy. Rib cages and skulls must be a problem, though. Probably better on the whole to stick to pork. But the thought blazed away at the back of her mind, never to become action, but unfamiliar, exciting, and oddly liberating. What were the wizards doing at the game? Making notes about what? A puzzle to think about. In the meantime, they were in a world of pies. Juliet could work quite well at repetitive jobs when she put her mind to it, and she had a meticulousness often found in people who were not very clever. Occasionally, she sniffed. Not a good thing when you are making pie filling. She was probably thinking about Trev and pasting him in her beautiful and not very overcrowded head into one of those glittery dreams sold by Bubble and other junk. 
where all you had to do to be famous was just be yourself. Ha! While Glinda had always known what she wanted, she worked long, pearly paid hours to get it, and here it was, her own kitchen and power, more or less, over pies. A moment ago, you were daydreaming of turning a man into pies. Why are you so angry all the time? What went wrong? I'll tell you what went wrong. When you got there, there was no there there. You wanted to see Quirm from an open carriage while a nice young man drank champagne out of your slipper, but you never did because they were a funny lot in Quirm and you couldn't trust the water. And how did that champagne thing work anyway? Didn't it drip out? What would happen if your toe trouble played up again? So you never did. Never will. I never said Trev's a bad lad, she said aloud. Not a gentleman, needs a slap to teach him manners and he takes life a good deal too easily. But he could make something out of himself if he had reason to put his mind to it. Juliet did not seem to be listening, but you never could tell. It's just the football. You're on different sides. It won't work, Glenda finished. Supposing I went and supported the Dimmers? A day ago, that would have sounded like some kind of sacrilege. Now, it just presented a huge problem. For a start, your dad wouldn't speak to you ever again, or your brothers. They don't now, much, anyway, except to ask when their grub is going to be ready. Do you know, today was the first time I ever saw the ball up close, and you know what? It weren't worth it. Hey, and they're going to have a fashion show on at Shatter tomorrow. Why don't we go? Never heard of it, Glenda snorted. It's a dwarf store. That sounds right. Can't imagine humans naming anything like that. You'd be hostage to the first misprint. We could go. Might be fun. Juliet waved a tattered copy of the bubble. And the new micromails are going to be really good and soft and don't chafe, it says here. Plus, horned helmets are making a return after too long in obscurity. What's that? And there's this mat in... A tomorrow. Yes, but we're not the kind of women who go to fashion shows, Jules. You're not. Why am I not? Well, because... Well, I wouldn't know what to wear. Glenda was getting desperate now. That's why you should go to fashion shows, said Juliet smugly. Glenda opened her mouth to snap a reply and thought, it's not about boys and it's not about football. It's safe. All right. I suppose it might be fun. Look, we've done a woman's job this evening. I'll take you home now and do my chores and come back. Your dad might be worrying. He'd be in the pub, said Juliet accurately. Well, he would be worrying if he wasn't, said Glenda. She wanted some time to herself with her feet up. It hadn't just been a long day. It had been a long and deep one as well. She needed some time for things to settle. And we'll take a chair, how about that? They're very expensive. Well, you're only young once, that's what I say. I never heard you say that before. Several troll chairs were waiting outside the university. They were expensive at five pence for the ride, but the seats in panniers round the carrier's neck were much more comfy than the slats on the buses. Of course, it was posh, and curtains twitched and lips pursed. That was the strange thing about the street. If you were born there, people didn't like it if you started not to fit in. Granny had called it getting ideas above your station. It was letting the side up. She opened Juliet's door for her because the girl always fumbled with the lock and watched it shut. Only then did she open her own front door, which was as patched and peeling as the other one. She had hardly taken her coat off when there was a hammering on the weather-beaten woodwork. She flung it open to find Mr. Stollop, Juliet's father, one fist still raised and a little cloud of powdered paint flecks settling around him. How'd you come in, Glendy? he said. What's this all about? His other huge hand rose, holding a crisp off-white envelope. You didn't see many of these in Dolly's sisters. It's called a letter, said Glenda. 
The man held it out imploringly, and now she noticed the large letter V on the dreaded government stamp, guaranteed to spread fear and despondency among those with taxes yet to pay. It's his lordship writing to me, said Mr. Stollop in distress. Why do you want to go and write to me? I haven't done nothing. Have you thought about opening it? said Glenda. That's generally how we find out what's in letters. There was another of those imploring looks. In Dolly's sisters, reading and writing was soft indoor work that was best left to the women. Real work required broad backs, strong arms, and calloused hands. Mr. Stollop absolutely fitted the bill. He was captain of the Dollies, and in one match had bitten an ear off three men. She sighed and took the letter from a hand which she noticed was slightly trembling and slit it open with her thumbnail. It says here, Mr. Stollop, she said, and the man winced. Yes, that would be you, Glenda added. Is there anything about taxes or anything? he said. Not that I can see. He writes that I would greatly appreciate your company at a dinner I am proposing to hold at Unseen University at eight o'clock Wednesday evening to discuss the future of the famous game football. I will be pleased to welcome you as the captain of the Dolly Sisters team. Why is he picked on me? Stollop demanded. He says, said Glenda, because you're the captain. Yes, but why me? Maybe he's invited all the team captains, Glenda volunteered. You could send a lad round with a white scarf and check, couldn't you? Yeah, but supposing it's just me, said Stollop again, determined to plumb the horror to its depths. Glenda had a bright idea. Well then, Mr. Stollop, it would look like the captain of the Dolly Sisters is the only one important enough to discuss the future of football with the ruler himself. Stollop didn't square his shoulders because he wore them permanently squared, but with a muscular nudge he managed to achieve the effect of cubed. Ha! <laughs> He's got that one right, he roared. Glenda sighed inwardly. The man was strong, but his muscles were melting into fat. She knew his knees hurt. She knew he got out of breath rather quickly these days, and in the presence of something he couldn't bully, punch, or kick, Mr. Stollop was entirely at a loss. Down by his sides, his hands flexed and unflexed themselves as they tried to do his thinking for him. What's this all about? I don't know, Mr. Stollop. He shifted his weight. Ah, uh, would it be about that dimmer boy that got himself hurt today, do you think? Could be anyone, thought Glenda, as cold dread blossomed. It's not as though it doesn't happen every week. It doesn't have to be either of them. It will be, of course, I know it. But I don't know it. Can't possibly know it. And if I repeat that long enough, it might all never have happened. Got himself hurt, thought Glenda in the roar of panic. That quite likely means he happened to be standing in the wrong place, in the wrong strip, which is tantamount to a self-inflicted wound. He got himself killed. My lads came in and said it was out in the street. That's what they just heard. He got killed. That's what they heard. They didn't see anything? That's right, they didn't see a thing. But they were doing a lot of listening. That one went over Stollop's head without even bothering to climb. And it was a dimmer boy? Yes, he said. They heard he died, but you know how those dimwell buggers lie. Where are your boys now? For a moment, the old man's eyes blazed. They're stopping indoors or I'll thrash them. You get some nasty gangs out when something like that's been happening. One less now, then, said Glenda. Stollop's face was painted in pigments of misery and dread. They're not bad boys, you know. Not at heart. People pick on them. Yes, down at the watch house, she said to herself where people say, That's them, the big ones. I'd know them anywhere. She left him shaking his head and ran down the road. The troll would never expect to get a fare up here, and there was no sense in hanging around and getting covered in paint. She might just about be able to catch up with it on its way downtown. 
After a minute or two, she realized that someone was following her, chasing her in the gloom. If only she'd remembered to bring the knife. She stepped into a patch of deeper shadow, and as the knife-wielding maniac drew level, stepped out and shouted, Stop following me! Juliet gave a little scream. I've got Trev, she sobbed as Glenda held her. Oh, now they have. Don't be silly, said Glenda. There's fighting all the time after a big match. No sense in getting too worried. So why were you running? said Juliet sharply. And there was no answer to that. The Bledlow nodded him through the staff door with a grunt and he headed straight away for the vats. A couple of the lads were dribbling in their meticulous and very slow way, but there was no sign of nut until Trev risked his sanity and nasal passages by checking the communal sleeping area, where he found Nut sleeping on his bedroll, clutching his stomach. It was an extremely large stomach. Given the usual neat shape of Nut, it made him look a little like a snake that had swallowed an extremely large goat. The curious face of the Igor and his worried voice came back to him. He looked down beside the bedroll and saw a small piece of pie crust and some crumbs. It smelled like a very good pie. In fact, he could think of only one person who could ever make a pie quite so beguiling. Whatever it was that had been filling Trev, the invisible illumination that had made him almost dance here from the watch house, drained out through his feet. He headed through the stone corridors to the night kitchen. Any optimism he might have retained was dashed one hope at a time by the trail of pie crumbs, but the illumination rose again as he saw Juliet and, oh yes, Glenda, standing in what was left of the night kitchen, which was a mess of torn open cupboards and pieces of pie crust. Oh, Mr. Trevor Likely, said Glenda, folding her arms. Just one question. Who ate all the pies? The illumination swelled until it filled Trev with a kind of silvery light. It had been three nights since he had slept in an actual bed, and it had not been your normal sort of day. He smiled broadly at nothing at all, and was caught by Juliet as he hit the ground. Trev woke up half an hour later, when Glenda brought him a cup of tea. I thought we'd better let you sleep, she said. Juliet said you looked awful, so obviously she's coming to her senses. He was dead, said Trev. Dead as a doorknob. And then he wasn't. What's that all about? He levered himself up and realised that he had been put to bed on one of the grubby bedrolls in the vats. Nut was lying on the roll next to him. All right, said Glenda. If you can do it without lying, tell me. She sat down and watched the sleeping nut for a while as Trev tried to make sense of the previous evening. What was in the sandwich again? The one that Igor gave him? Tuna, spaghetti and jam with sprinkles, said Trev, yawning. Are you sure? It's not the kind of thing you forget. What kind of jam? Glenda insisted. Why ask? I'm thinking it might work with quince or chilli. Can't see any place for sprinkles, though. They don't make any sense. What? He's an eagle. It doesn't have to make sense. But he warned you about Nut. Yes, but I don't think he meant lock up your pies, do you? Are you going to get into trouble about the pies? No, I've got plenty more maturing in the cool room. They're at their best when matured. You have to keep ahead of yourself with pies. She looked down at Nut and went on. Are you really telling me he got all smashed up by the Stollock boys and then walked out of the Lady Sybil? He was as dead as a doorknob. Even old Alec could spot that. This time, they both stared at Nut. He's alive now, said Glenda, as if it was an accusation. Look, said Trev, all I know about people who come from Ubervold is that some of them are vampires and some are werewolves. Well, I don't think vampires are much interested in pies. And it was a full moon last week and he didn't act odd. Well, odder than normal. Glenda lowered her voice. Maybe he's a zombie. No, they don't eat pies either. She continued to stare at Nut, but another part of her said, There's going to be a banquet on Wednesday night.
Lord Vetinari's up to something with the wizards. It's about the football, I'm sure of it. Well, for some plan I expect something nasty. The wizards were at the game today taking notes. Don't tell me that's healthy. They want to shut down football, that's what it is. Good. Trevor Likely, how can you say that? Your dad died because he was dumb, said Trev. Don't tell me it was the way he would have wanted to go. No one would want to go like that. But he loved his football. So, what does that mean? The Stollop boys love their football. Andy Shank loves his football. And what does it mean? Not counting today, how often have you seen the ball in play? Hardly ever, I bet. Well, yes, but it's not about the football. You're saying that football is not about football? Glenda wished she'd had a proper education, or failing that, any real education at all. But she was not going to back off now. It's the sharing, she said. It's being part of the crowd. It's chanting together. It's all of it. The whole thing. I believe, Miss Glenda, said Nut from his mattress, that the work you are looking for is Trousenblut's der selbst überschritten Dirk das Ganze. They looked down at Nut again, mouths open. He had opened his eyes and appeared to be staring at the ceiling. It is the lonely soul trying to reach out to the shared soul of all humanity, and possibly much further. W.E.G. Goodnight's translation of In Search of the Whole is marred, while quite understandable, by the mistranslation of Bewusst Steinschweller as haircut throughout. Trev and Glenda looked at one another. Trev shrugged. Where could they start? Glenda coughed. Mr. Nutt, are you alive or dead or what? Alive. Thank you very much for asking. I saw you killed, Trev shouted. We ran all the way to the Lady Sybil. Oh, said Nutt. I am sorry. I do not recall. It would seem that diagnosis was in error. Am I right? They exchanged glances. Trev got the worst of it. When Glenda was angry, her glance might just possibly etch glass. But Nut had a point. It was hard to argue with a man who insisted that he was not dead. Um, and then you came back here and ate nine pies, said Glenda. Looks like they did you good, said Trev, with brittle cheerfulness. But I can't see where they've gone, Glenda finished. Belly busters, every one of them. You will be angry with me. Not looked frightened. Let's all calm down, shall we? Said Trev. Look, I was pretty worried. My oath, yes. Not angry, okay? We're your friends. I must be becoming. I must be helpful. This came from Nut's lips like a mantra. Glenda took his hands. Look, I'm not bothered about the pies, really, I'm not. I like to see a man with a good appetite. But you must tell us what's wrong. Have you done something you shouldn't? I should be making myself worthy, Nut said, pulling away gently and not meeting her eyes. I must be becoming. I must not lie. I must gain worth. Thank you for your kindness. He got up and walked down the length of the vats, picked up a basket of candles, came back, wound up his dribbling machine and began to work, oblivious of their presence. Do you know what goes on in his head? Glenda whispered. When he was young, he was chained to an anvil for seven years, said Trev. What? That's terrible. Someone must have been very cruel to do something like that. Or desperate to make sure he didn't get free. Things are never all they seem, Mr. Trev, said Nut, without looking up from his feverish activity. And the acoustics in these cellars are very good. Your father loved you, did he not? What? Trev's face reddened. He loved you, took you to the football, shared a pie with you, taught you to cheer for the dimmers. Did he hold you on his shoulders so that you could see more of the game? Stop talking about my dad like that. Glenda took Trev's arm. It's okay, Trev, it's all right. It's not a nasty question, really, it isn't. But you hate him because he became a mortal man, dying on the cobbles, said Nut picking up another undribbled candle. That is nasty, said Glenda. Not ignored her. He let you down, Mr. Trev. 
He wasn't the small boy's god. It turned out that he was only a man. But he was not only a man. Everyone who has ever watched a game in this city has heard of Dave Lightly. If he was a fool, then any man who has ever climbed a mountain or swam a torrent is a fool. If he was a fool, then so was the man who first tried to tame fire. If he was a fool, then so was the man who tried the first oyster. He was a fool too. Although I'm bound to remark that, given the division of labor in early hunter-gatherer cultures, he was probably a woman as well. Probably only a fool gets out of bed, but after death, some fools shine like stars, and your father is such a one. After death, people forget the foolishness, but they do remember the shine. You could not have done anything. You could not have stopped him. If you could have stopped him, he would not have been Dave Lightly, a name that means football to thousands of people. Not very carefully put down a beautifully dribbled candle and continued. Think about this, Mr. Trev. Don't be smart. Smart is only a polished version of dumb. Try intelligence. It will surely see you through. That's just a load of words, said Trev hotly, but Glenda saw the glistening lines down his cheeks. Please, think about them, Mr. Trev, said Nut, and added, There, I have done a complete basket. That is worth. It was the calmness. Nut had been spinning, almost sick with anxiety. He'd been repeating himself, as if he'd had to learn things for a teacher. And then he was otherwise totally reserved and collected. Glenda looked from Trev to Nut and back again. Trev's mouth hung open. She didn't blame it. What Nut had said, with quiet matter-of-factness, had sounded like not an opinion, but the truth, winched out of some deep well. Then Trev broke the silence, speaking as if hypnotized, his voice hoarse. He gave me his old jersey when I was five. It was like a tent. I mean, it was so greasy, I never got wet. He stopped. After a moment, Glenda pushed at his elbow. He's gone all stiff, she said, as stiff as a piece of wood. Ah, catatonic, said Nut. He is overwhelmed by his feelings. We should lay him down. These old mattresses I sleep on in here are rubbish, said Glenda, looking around for a better alternative to cold flagstones. I know the very thing, said Nut, suddenly all action and plunging off down the passage. This left Glenda still holding a rigid trev when Juliet appeared from the direction of the kitchens. She stopped instantly when she saw them and burst into tears. He's dead, isn't he? Uh, no, Glenda began. I talked to some of the bakery lads coming into work and they're telling me there's been fights all over the city and someone got himself murdered. Trev's just had a bit of a shock, that's all. Mr Nutt's gone to find something for him to lie down on. Oh. Juliet sounded a little disappointed, presumably because a bit of a shock was not sufficiently dramatic. But she rallied just as a loud, rough, and uniquely wooden noise from the other direction heralded Nut pushing a large couch which shuddered to a halt in front of them. There's a big room piled up with old furniture up the hall, he said, patting the faded velvet. It's a bit musty, but I think all the mice have fallen out on the way here. Quite a find, actually. I believe it is a chaise long from the workshop of the famous Gurning Upspire. I think I can probably restore it later. Let him down gently. What happened to him? said Juliet. Oh, the truth can be a little bit upsetting, said Nut. But he will get over it and feel better. I would very much like to know the truth myself, Mr. Nut, thank you very much said Glenda, folding her arms and trying to look stern, while all the time a voice in her head was whispering, Shays long, Shays long. When no one else is here, you can have a go at languishing. It's a kind of medicine with words, said Nut carefully. Sometimes people fool themselves into believing things that aren't true, and sometimes they can be quite dangerous for the person. They see the world in a wrong way. 
they won't let themselves see that what they believe is wrong. But often there is a part of the mind that does know, and the right words can let it out. He gave them a worried look. Well, that's nice, said Juliet. Sounds like hocus pocus to me, said Glenda. Folk know their own minds. She folded her arms again and saw Nut glance at them. Well, she demanded, have you ever seen elbows before? Never such pretty dimpled ones, Miss Glenda, on such tightly folded arms. Up until that point, Glenda had never realized that Juliet had such a dirty laugh, to which Glenda fervently hoped she was not entitled. Glenda's got a B.O. <laughs> Glenda's got a B.O. It's Bo, actually, Glenda said, swiping to the back of her mind the recollection that it had taken her years to find that out herself. And I was just helping. We're helping him, aren't we, Mr. Nutt? Doesn't he look sweet lying there? Said Juliet. All pink. She stroked Trev's greasy hair inexpertly. Just like a little boy. Yes, he's always been good at that, said Glenda. Why don't you go and get the little boy a cup of tea and a biscuit? Not one of the chocolate ones. That'll take some time, she said as the girl shimmied away. She tends to get distracted. Her mind wanders and amuses itself elsewhere. Trev tells me that despite your more mature appearance, you are the same age as her, said Nut. You really don't talk to many ladies, do you, Mr. Nut? Oh dear, have I made another faux pas, said Nut, suddenly all nerves again, to such an extent that she took pity on him. Would this be faux pas that looks as if it should be said like Fawkes Pass? Uh, yes. Glenda nodded, satisfied. Another literary puzzle solved. Better not to use the word mature unless you are talking about cheese or wine. Not good to use it for ladies. She stared at him, wondering how to pose the next question. She opted for directness. She wasn't very good at anything else. Trev is sure you sort of died and came alive again. So I understand. Not many people do that. The vast majority do not, I believe. How did you do it? I don't know. This is rather late in the day, I must admit, but you don't feel any hunger for blood or brains, do you? Not at all. Just pies. I like pies. I am very ashamed about the pies. It will not happen again, Miss Glinda. I fear my body was acting on its own. It needed instant nourishment. Trev says you used to be chained to an anvil. Yes, that was because I was worthless. Then I was taken to see Ladyship and she told me, You are worthless, but I think not unworthy, and I will give you worth. But you must have had parents. I do not know. There are many things I don't know. There is a door. What? A door. In my head. Some things are behind the door, and I don't know them. But that is all right, Ladyship says. Glenda felt like giving up. Not answered questions, yes, but really all you ended up with was more questions. But she persevered. It was like stabbing away at a tin can, hoping to find a way in. Ladyship is a real lady, is she? Castles and servants and what not. Oh, yes, even a what-not. She is my friend, and she is mature like cheese and wine, because she has lived for a long time and is not old. But she sent you here, yes? Did she teach you whatever it was you used on Trev? Beside Glenda, Trev stirred. No, said Nut. I read the works of the masters in the library all by myself. But she did tell me that people, too, were a kind of living book, and I would have to learn to read them. Well, you read Trev well enough. Be told, though, don't try that stuff on me, or you'll never see another pie. Yes, Miss Glenda. Sorry, Miss Glenda. She sighed. What is it about me? The moment they look downcast, I feel sorry for them. She looked up. He was watching her. Stop that. Sorry, Miss Glinda. But you got to see the football, at least. Did you enjoy it? Nut's face lit up. Yes, it was wonderful. 
The noise, the crowds, the chanting, oh, the chanting, it becomes a second blood, the unison, to not be alone, to be not just one, but one and all, of one mind and purpose. Excuse me. He had seen her face. So he quite liked it then, said Glenda. The intensity of Nut's outburst had been like opening an oven door. It was a mercy her hair hadn't frizzled. Oh, yes. The ambience was wonderful. I didn't try those, Glenda hazarded, but the peace pudding is usually good. The scrip of crockery and the tinkling of a teaspoon heralded the arrival of Juliet, or rather of the cup of tea that she was holding in front of her, as if it were a grail, so that she drifted along behind it like a comet's tail. Glenda was impressed. The tea was in the cup instead of in the saucer and it was the acceptable brown colour that is usually characteristic of tea, and was usually the only tea-like characteristic of tea made by Juliet. Trev sat up, and Glenda wondered how long he might have been paying attention. All right, he might be good in an emergency, and at least he washed sometimes and owned a toothbrush. But Juliet was special, wasn't she? All she needed was a prince. Technically, that meant Lord Vetinari, but he was far too old. Besides, no one was sure which side of the bed he got out of, or even if he went to bed at all. But one day a prince would come, even if Glenda had to drag him on a chain. She turned her head. Not was watching her intently again. Well, her book was locked down tightly. No one was going to riffle through her pages. And tomorrow she would find out what the wizards were up to. That was easy. She'd be invisible. In the stillness of the night, Nut sat in his special place, which was yet another room very close to the vats. Candles burned as he sat at a rescued table, staring at a piece of paper and absent-mindedly cleaning out his ear with the point of his pencil. Nut was technically an expert on love poetry throughout the ages, and had discussed it at length with Miss Heels Tether, the castle librarian. He had also tried to discuss it with Ladyship, but she had laughed and said it was frivolity, although quite helpful as a tutorial on the use of vocabulary, scansion, rhythm, and effect as a means to an end, to wit, getting a young lady to take all her clothes off. At that particular point, Nut had not really understood what she meant. It sounded like some sort of conjuring trick. He tapped the pencil on the page. The castle library had been full of poetry, and he'd read it avidly as he read all books, not knowing why it had been written or what exactly it was supposed to achieve. But generally, poems written by men to women followed a very similar format. Now, with a world's worth of the finest poetry to choose from, he was lost for words. Then he nodded to himself. Ah, yes. Robert Scandal's famous poem, Oi to his deaf mistress. It surely had the right ship and tempo. Of course, there had to be a muse. Oh, yes, all poetry needed a muse. That might present a difficulty. Juliet, while quite attractive, was also, in his mind, a kind of amiable ghost. Hmm. Ah, of course. Nut pulled the pencil out of his ear hesitated and wrote. I sing, but not of love, for love is blind, but celebrate instead the muse of kindness. The fires in the vats cooled, but Nut's brain was suddenly ablaze. Round about midnight, Glenda decided it was safe enough to leave the boys alone to get up to whatever it was boys got up to when women weren't around to look after them, and made sure that she and Juliet were on the late crosstown bus. That meant she actually got to sleep in her own bed. She looked around the tiny bedroom by candlelight and met the gaze, which was quite difficult, of Mr. Wobble, the three-eyed transcendental teddy bear. It would have been nice to have a bit of cosmic explanation at this point, but the universe never gave you explanations. It just gave you more questions. She reached down surreptitiously, even though there was only a three-eyed teddy bear watching her, and picked up the latest Aradney comb buttworthy from the cache unsuccessfully hidden below. After ten minutes of reading, 
which took her some way into the book, Miss Combe Butworthy producing volumes that were even slimmer than her heroines, she experienced déjà vu. Moreover, the déjà vu was squared because she had the feeling of having had the déjà vu before. They're really all the same, aren't they? she said to the three-eyed teddy bear. You know, it's going to be Mary the Maid or someone like her, and there's got to be two men and she will end up with the nice one, and there has to be misunderstandings and they never do anything more than kiss, and it's absolutely guaranteed that, for example, an exciting civil war or an invasion by trolls or even a scene with any cooking in it is not going to happen. Best you can expect is a thunderstorm. It really had nothing to do with real life at all, which, although short on civil wars and invasions by trolls, at least had the decency to have lots of cooking. The book dropped out of her fingers and thirty seconds later, she was sound asleep. Surprisingly, no neighbour needed her in the night, so she got up, dressed, and breakfasted in what was an almost unfamiliar world. She opened her door to take breakfast to Widow Crowdy and found Juliet on the doorstep. The girl took a step back. Are you going out, Glenda? It's early. Well, you're up, said Glenda. And with the newspaper, I'm pleased to see. Isn't it exciting? said Juliet, and thrust the paper at her. Glenda took one look at the picture on the front page, took a second closer look, and then grabbed Juliet and pulled her inside. You can see their tonkers, Juliet observed in a voice that was much too matter-of-fact for Glenda's liking. You shouldn't know what they look like, she said, smacking the paper down on her kitchen table. What? I've got three brothers, ain't I? Everyone bathes in a tub in front of the fire, don't they? It's not like they're anything special. Anyway, it's culture, all right? Remember when you took me to that place full of people in the nuddy? You stayed in there hours. It was the Royal Art Museum, said Glenda, thanking her stars that they were indoors. That's different. She tried to read the story, but it was very difficult with that amazing picture beside it, just where an eye might stray again and again. Glenda enjoyed her job. She didn't have a career. There were for people who could not hold down jobs. She was very good at what she did, so she did it all the time without paying much attention to the world. But now her eyes were opened. In fact, it was time to blink. Under the headline, New Light on Ancient Gim was a picture of a vase, or rather more grandly, an urn, in orange and black. It showed some very tall and skinny men. Their masculinity was beyond doubt, but possibly beyond belief. They were apparently struggling for possession of a ball. One of them was lying on the ground and looked as if he was in some pain. The translation of the name of the urn was, said the caption, The Tackle. According to the accompanying story, someone at the Royal Art Museum had found the urn in an old storeroom, and it contained scrolls which, it said here, had the original rules of football laid down in the early years of the century of the summer weevil, a thousand years ago, when the game was played in honour of the goddess Pedestriana. Glenda skimmed through the rest of it, because there was a lot of rest to skim, an artist's impression of the aforesaid goddess adorned page three. She was, of course, beautiful. You seldom saw a goddess portrayed as ugly. This probably had something to do with their ability to strike people down instantly. In Pedestriana's case, she would probably have gone for the feet. Glenda put the paper down, seething with anger, and, as a cook, she knew how to seethe. This wasn't football, except but the Guild of Historians said that it was, and could prove it not only with old parchments, but also with an urn, and she could see that you were on the wrong end of an argument if you were up against an urn. But it was too neat, wasn't it? Except, why? His lordship didn't like football, but here was an article saying that this game was very old and had its own goddess, and if there were two things this city liked, it was tradition and goddesses, especially if the goddesses were a bit short on the chiffon above the waist. 
Did his lordship let them put anything in the paper? What was going on? I've got business to attend to, she said sternly. It's good that you bought a decent paper, but you don't want to read this kind of stuff. I didn't. Who's interested in that? I got it for the advert. Look. Glenda had never bothered much about the adverts in the paper, because they were put there by people who were after your money. But there it was, right there. Madame Sharn of Bonk gives you micromail. You said we could go, said Juliet pointedly. Yes, well, that was before. You said we could go. Yes, but, well, has anyone from the sisters ever gone to a fashion show? It's not our kind of thing, is it? Doesn't say that in the paper. Says admission free. You said we could go. Two o'clock, thought Glenda. Suppose I could manage it. All right. Meet at work at half past one, do you hear? Not a minute later. I've got things to do. The University Council meets every day at half past eleven, she thought to herself. Oh, to be a fly on that wall. She grinned. Trev was sitting in the battered old chair that served as his office in the vats. Work was proceeding at its usual reliable snail's pace. Ah, I see you are in early, Mr. Trev, said Nut. I am sorry not to have been here. I have to go and deal with an emergency candelabra upset. He leaned closer. I have done what you asked, Mr. Trev. Trev snapped out of his daydream of Juliet and said, Huh? You asked me to write, to improve your poem for Miss Juliet. You've done it. Perhaps you would like to have a look, Mr. Trev. He handed the paper to Trev and stood nervously by the chair as a pupil stands by the teacher. After a very short while, Trev's forehead wrinkled. What's air? That's air, sir, as in where air she walks. You mean like she walks on air? said Trev. No, Mr. Trev, I should just put it down to poetry if I were you. Trev struggled on. He had never had much to do with poetry, except the sort that started, There was a young lady of Quirm, but this looked like the real stuff. The page seemed to be crowded and yet full of space as well. Also, the writing was extremely curly, and that was a sure sign, wasn't it? You didn't get that sort of thing from the lady of Quirm. This is great stuff, Mr. Nutt. This is really great stuff. This is poetry. But what really is it saying? Nutt cleared his throat. Well, sir, the essence of poetry of this nature is to create a mood that will make the recipient, that is to say, sir, the young lady who you are going to send it to, feel very kindly disposed to the author of the poem, which would be you, sir, in this case. According to ladyship, everything else is just showing off. I have brought you a pen and an envelope if you would kindly sign the poem. I will ensure that it gets to Miss Juliet. I bet no one's ever written her a poem before, said Trev, scaling quickly over the truth that he hadn't either. I'd love to be there when she reads it. That would not be advised, said Nutt quickly. The general consensus is that the lady concerned reads it in the absence of the hopeful swain, that is you, sir, and forms a beneficent mental picture of him. Your actual presence might actually get in the way, especially since I see you haven't changed your shirt again today. Besides... I am informed that there is a possibility that all her clothes will fall off. Trev, who'd been struggling with the concept of swain, fast-forwarded to this information at speed. Uh, Say that again. All her clothes might fall off. I am sorry about this, but it appears to be a byproduct of the whole business of poetry. But, broadly speaking, sir, it carries the message you have asked for, which is to say... I think you're really fit. I really fancy you. Can we have a date? No hanky-panky, I promise. However, sir, since it is a love poem, I have taken the liberty of altering it slightly to carry the suggestion that if hanky or panky should appear to be welcomed by the young lady, she will not find you wanting in either department. Arch-Chancellor Ridcully rubbed his hands together. Well, gentlemen... 
I hope we have all seen the papers this morning, or glanced at them at any rate. I thought that the front page was not the place, said the lecturer in recent runes. It quite put me off my breakfast, metaphorically speaking, of course. Apparently, the urn has been in the museum cellars for at least three hundred years, but for some reason it makes its presence felt now, said Ridcully. Of course they have tons of stuff in there that's never really been looked at properly, and the city was going through a prudish period then and didn't care to know about that sort of thing. What? That men have tonkers, said Dr. Hicks. That sort of news gets out sooner or later. He looked around at the disapproving faces and added, Skull ring, remember? Under college statute, the head of the Department of Post-Mortem Communications is entitled, nay, required to make tasteless, divisive, and moderately evil remarks. I'm sorry, but these are your rules. Thank you, Dr. Hicks. Your uncalled for remarks are duly noted and appreciated. You know, it seems very suspicious to me that this wretched urn has turned up at just this time, observed the senior wrangler, and I hope I am not alone in this. I know what you mean, said Hicks. If I didn't know that the Arch-Chancellor had his work cut out to persuade Vatanari to let us play, I would think that this was some sort of plan. Yes, said Ridcully thoughtfully. The old rules look a lot more interesting, sir, said Ponder. Yes. Did you read the bit that said players were not allowed to use their hands, sir? and the high priest takes to the field of play to ensure that the rules are honoured. I can't see that catching on these days, said the lecturer in recent runes. He's armed with a poisoned dagger, sir, said Ponder. Ah, well, that should make for a more interesting game at least, eh, Mustrum? Uh, Mustrum? What? Ah, oh, yes. Yes, uh, something to think about indeed, yes. Indeed, uh, one man in charge. The onlooker who sees most of the game. The gamer, in fact. So, what move have I missed? Sorry, asked Chancellor. Ridcully blinked at Ponder Stibbons. What? Uh, just composing my thoughts, as one does. He sat up straight. In any case, the rules don't concern us at this point. We have to play this game in any eventuality, and so we will abide by them in the best traditions of sportsmanship until we have worked out where they may be most usefully broken to our advantage. Mr. Stibbons, you are collating our studies of the game. The floor is yours. Thank you, asked Chancellor. Ponder cleared his throat. Gentlemen, the game of football is clearly about more than the rules and the nature of the play. In any case... These are pure mechanical considerations. The chanting and, of course, the food are of more concern to us, I feel. They seem to be an integral part of the game. Regrettably, so do the supporters' clubs. What is the nature of this problem? Ridcully inquired. They hit one another over the head with them. It would be true to say that brawling and mindless violence, such as occurred yesterday afternoon, is one of the cornerstones of the sport. A far cry from its ancient beginnings, then, said the chair of indefinite studies, shaking his head. Well, yes. I understand that in those days the losing team was throttled. However, I suppose this would be called mindful violence that took place with the enthusiastic consent of the entire community, or at least that part of it that was still capable of breath. Fortunately, we do not yet have supporters, so that this is not at present our problem and I propose we go directly to the pies. There was a chorus of general agreement from the wizards. Food was their cup of tea, and if possible, slice of cake too. Some of them were already watching the door in anticipation of the tea trolley. It seemed like an age since nine. Central to the game is the pie, Ponder went on, which is generally of short crust pastry containing appropriate pie-like substances. I collected half a dozen and tested them on the usual subjects. The students, said Ridcully. Yes, they said they were pretty awful. Not a patch on the pies here, they said. 
They finished them off, however. Examination of the ingredients suggests that they consisted of gravy, fat and salt. And insofar as it was possible to tell, none of the students appears to have died. So we are ahead on pies, then, said Ridcully cheerfully. I suppose so, Arch-Chancellor, although I do not believe that the pie quality plays any role. He stopped, because the door had swung open to allow the ingress of a reinforced heavy-duty tea trolley. Since it was not being propelled by her, the wizards paid no further attention and settled down to the passing of cups, the handing round of the sugar bowl, the inspection of the quality of the chocolate biscuits, with a view to taking more than one's entitlement, and all the other little diversions without which a committee would be a clever device for making worthwhile decisions quickly. When the rattling had ceased, and the last biscuit had been fought for, Ridcully tinkled his teaspoon on the rim of his cup for silence, although since he was Ridcully this only added the crash of broken crockery to the hubbub. Once the girl in charge of the trolley had sponged everybody down, he continued. The chanting, gentlemen, appears to be another inconsequentiality at first sight, but I have reason to believe that it has a certain power, and we will ignore it at our peril. I see the museum's translators say the modern chants were originally hymns to the goddess, calling on her to grant her favors to the team of choice while naiads danced on the edges of the field of play, the better to encourage the players to greater feats of prowess. Naiads, said the chair of indefinite studies, they're water nymphs, aren't they? Young women with very thin, damp clothing. Why would anyone want them around? Besides, didn't they drown sailors by singing to them? Ridcully let the thoughtful pause hang in the air for a while before volunteering, Fortunately, I don't think anyone these days would expect that we play football underwater. The pies would float, said the chair of indefinite studies. Not necessarily, said Ponder. What about clothing, Mr. Stibbons? I assume there will be some. Temperatures were somewhat warmer in olden days. I can assure you that no one will insist on nudity. Ponder might have noticed the rattle as the girl with the tea trolley almost dropped a cup but was gracious enough not to notice that he had noticed. He went on. Currently, the teams wear old shirts and short trousers. How short? said the chair of indefinite studies, urgency in his voice. About mid-knee, I believe, said Ponder. Is this likely to be a problem? Yes, it is. The knees should be covered. It is a well-known fact that a glimpse of the male knee can drive women into a frenzy of libidinousness. There was another rattle from the tea trolley, but Ponder ignored it because his own head had rattled a bit too. Are you sure about that, sir? It is established fact, young Stibbons. Ponder had found a grey hair on his comb that morning and was not in the mood to take this standing up. And precisely in what books does... He began, but Ridcully interrupted with unusual diplomacy. Generally, he liked little tiffs among the faculty. A few more inches to prevent mobbing by the ladies should present us with no problems, surely, Mr. Stibbons. Oops. This last was to Glenda, who had dropped two spoons on the carpet. She gave him a cursory curtsy. Uh, yes, uh, and we should sport the university colours, he went on with a hint of nervousness. Ridcully prided himself on treating the staff well, and indeed did so whenever he remembered them but the expression of intelligent amusement on the face of the dumpy girl had unnerved him. It was as if a chicken had winked. Um, yes. Yes, indeed, he said. The good old red jersey we used to wear in my rowing days with the big U's on the front, bold as brass. He glanced at the maid who was frowning. But he was Arch-Chancellor, wasn't he? It said so on his door, didn't it? That's what we'll do, he declared. We'll look into pies, although I've seen a few pies that don't bear looking into. <laughs> and uh, we'll adapt the good old red sweater. What's next, Mr. Stibbons? With regard to the chanting, sir, I've asked the master of the music to work on some options, said Ponder smoothly. We need to select a team as soon as possible. I don't see what the rush is, 
said the chair of indefinite studies, who'd almost gnawed it off in the arms of a chocolate biscuit surfeit. The bequest, remember, said the head of the Department of Postmortem Communications. We... Pas devant la domestique, snapped the lecturer in recent runes. Automatically, Ridcully turned again to look at Glenda and got a distinct feeling that here was a woman about to learn a foreign language in a hurry. It was an odd but slightly exciting idea. Until this moment, he had never thought of the maids in the singular. They were all servants. He was polite to them and smiled when appropriate. He assumed they sometimes did other things than fetch and carry and sometimes went off to get married and sometimes just went off. Up until now, though, he had never really thought that they might think, let alone what they thought about, and least of all what they thought about the wizards. He turned back to the table. Who will be doing the chanting, Mr. Stibbons? The aforesaid supporters. Fans, sir. It's short for fanatics. And ours will be... Who? Well, we are the largest employer in the city, sir. As a matter of fact, I think Vetinari is, and I wish to all hells I knew exactly who he is employing, said Ridcully. I'm sure our loyal staff will support us, said the lecturer in recent runes. He turned to Glenda, and to Ridcully's dismay said gluttonously, I'm sure you would be a fan, would you not, my child? The Arch-Chancellor sat back. He had a definite feeling that this was going to be fun. Well, she hadn't blushed, and she hadn't yelled. In fact, she had not done anything, apart from carefully pick up the china. I support Dolly's sisters, sir. Always have done. And are they any good? Having a poor patch at the moment, sir. Ah, then I expect you will want to support our team, which will be very good indeed. Can't do that, sir. You've got to support your team, sir. But you just said they weren't doing well. That's when you support your team, sir. Otherwise, you're a number. A number being? Said Ridcully. He's someone who's all cheering when things are going well and then runs off to another team when there's a losing streak. But he always shouts the loudest. So you support the same team all your life? Well, if you move away, it's OK to change. No one will mind much unless you go to a real enemy. She looked at their puzzled expressions, sighed, and went on. Like Nap Hill United and the Whoppers, or Dolly Sisters and Dimwell, old pals, or the Pigsty Hill Pork Packers and the Cockbill Boars, you know. When they clearly didn't, she continued. They hate each other. Always have done, always will. They are the bad matches. The shutters go up for those. I don't know what my neighbours would say if they saw me cheering a dimmer. But that's dreadful, said the chair of indefinite studies. Excuse me, miss, said Ponder, but most of those pairs are quite close to one another. So why do they hate one another so much? That at least is easy, said Dr. Hicks. It's hard to hate people who are a long way away. You forget how dreadful they are, but you see a neighbor's warts every day. That's just the sort of cynical comment I'd expect from a post-mortem communicator, grumbled the chair of indefinite studies. Or a realist, said Ritcully, smiling. But Dolly's sisters and Dimwell are quite far apart, miss. Glenda shrugged. I know, but it's always been like that. That's how it is. That's all I know. Well, thank you. There was no mistaking the hanging question. Glenda, she said. I see there are a great many things we don't yet understand. Yes, sir. Everything. She hadn't meant to say that aloud. It just escaped of its own accord. There was a stirring among the wizards who were nonplussed because what had happened could not really have happened. The tea trolley might as well have neighed. Ridcully banged his hand on the table before the others could summon up words. Well said, miss, he chuckled, as Glenda waited for the floor to open up and swallow her. And I'm sure that remark came from the heart, because I suspect it could not have come from the head. Sorry, sir, but the gentleman did ask for my opinion. No, that one was from the head. Well done, said Ridcully. So do, therefore, give us the benefit of your thinking, Miss Glenda. 
Still in a kind of shock, Glenda looked into the Arch-Chancellor's eyes and saw that it was no time to be less than bold. But that was unnerving, too. Well, what's this all about, sir? If you want to play, just go and do it, yes? Why change things? The game of football is very behind the times, Miss Glenda. Well, so are you. Sorry, sorry, but, well, you know, wizards are always wizards. Not a lot changes in here, does it? And then you talk about some master of the music to make a new chant, and that's not how it goes. The shove makes up the chants. They just happen. They just, like, come out of the air. And the pies are pretty awful, that's true. But when you're in the shove and it's mucky weather and the water's coming through your coat and your shoes are leaking and then you bite into your pie and you know that everyone else is biting into their pie and the grease slides down your sleeve. Well, sir, I don't have the words for it, sir. I really don't, sir. There's a feeling I can't describe, but it's a bit like being a kid at Hogswatch. And you can't just buy it, so you can't write it down or organise it or make it shiny or make it tame. <laughs> Sorry to speak out of turn, sirs, but that's the long and short of it. You must have known it, sir. Didn't your father ever take you to a game? Ridcully looked down the table at the council and noted a certain moistness of eye. Wizards were, largely, of that generation from which grandfathers are carved. They were also, largely, large, and awash with cynical crabbiness and the barnacles of the years. But the smell of cheap overcoats in the rain, which always had a tint and taste of soot in it, and your father, or maybe your grandfather, lifting you onto his shoulders. And there you were, above all those cheap hats and scarves, and you could feel the warmth of the shove. Watch its tides, feel its heartbeat, and then, certainly, a pie would be handed up, or maybe even half a pie if times were hard. And if they were really bad, it might be a handful of fat, greasy peas which were to be eaten one at a time to make them last longer. Or when times were flush, there might be a real treat, like a hot dog you didn't have to share, or a plate of scouse with yellow fat beating on the top and lumps of gristle you could chew at on the way home. Meat, which now you would not give to a dog, but which was sacred lotus eaten with the gods in the rain, in the cheering, in the bosom of the shove. The Arch-Chancellor blinked. No time seemed to have passed, unless you count seventy years which had gone past like that. A uh, very graphically argued, he said and pulled himself together. Interesting points well made. But, you see, we have a responsibility here. After all, this city was just a handful of villagers before my university was built. We are concerned about the fighting in the streets yesterday. We heard a rumour that someone was killed because he supported the wrong team. We can't stand by and let this sort of thing happen. So, you'll be shutting down the Assassin's Guild, will you, sir? There was a gasp from every mouth including her own. The only rational thought that didn't flee from her mind was, I wonder if that job is still going in the Fool's Guild. The pay wasn't much, but they do know how to appreciate a pie. When she dared look, the Arch-Chancellor was staring at the ceiling while his fingers drummed on the table. I should have been more careful, Glenda whined in her own ear. Don't get chatty with knobs. You forget what you are, but they don't. The drumming stopped. Good point, well put, said Ridcully, and I shall marshal my responses thusly. He flicked a finger, and, with a smell of gooseberries and a pop, a small red globe appeared in the air over the table. One, the assassins, while deadly, are not random, and indeed are mostly a danger to one another. Assassination is only to be feared, generally speaking, by those powerful enough to have a stab, as it were, at defending themselves. Another little globe appeared. Two, it is an article of faith with them that property is undamaged. They are invariably courteous and considerate and notoriously silent, and would never dream of inhuming their target in a public street. A third globe appeared. Three, 
They are organized and therefore amenable to civic influence. Lord Vetinari is very keen on that sort of thing. And another globe popped into life. And four, Lord Vetinari is himself a trained assassin, majoring in stealth and poisons. I am not sure he would share your opinion, and he is a tyrant even if he has developed tyranny to such a point of metaphysical perfection that it is a dream rather than a force. He does not have to listen to you, you see. He doesn't even have to listen to me. He listens to the city. I don't know how he does, but he does, and he plays it like a violin. Ridcully paused, then went on. Or like the most complicated game you can imagine. The city works not perfectly, but better than it has ever done. I think it's time for football to change, too. He smiled at her expression. What is your job, young lady? Because you are wasted in it. It was probably meant as a compliment, but Glenda, her head so bewilderingly full of the Arch-Chancellor's words that they were trickling out of her ears, heard herself say, I'm certainly not wasted, sir. You've never eaten better pies than mine. I run the night kitchen. The metaphysics of real politics were not a subject of interest to most of those present, but they knew where they were with pies. She was the center of attention already, but now it blazed with interest. You do, said the chair of indefinite studies. We thought it was the pretty girl. Really? said Glenda brightly. Well, I run it. So, who does that wonderful pie you send up here sometimes with the cheese pastry and the hot pickle layer? The ploughman's pie? Me, sir, my own recipe. Really? How do you manage to get the pickled onions to stay so hard and crispy in the baking? It's just amazing. My own recipe, sir, said Glenda firmly. It wouldn't be mine if I told anyone else. Well said, said Ridcully gleefully. You can't go around asking craftsmen the secrets of their trade, old chap. It's a thing you just don't do. Now, I am concluding this meeting, although what it has in fact concluded, I shall decide later. He turned back to Glenda. Thank you for coming here today, Miss Glenda, and I shall not inquire why a young lady who works in the night kitchen is pouring tea up here at nearly noon. Do you have any further advice for us? Well said Glenda, since you ask. Uh, no, I really shouldn't say. This is hardly the moment for bashfulness, do you think? Well, it's about your strip, sir. That means your team colours. Nothing wrong with red and yellow. No one else uses those two, but, well, you want two big U's on the front, right? Like, you, you? She waved her hands in the air. Yes, that's exactly right. After all, it's what we are. Ridcully nodded. Are you sure? I mean, I know you gentlemen are bachelors and all, but... Well, you'll look like you've got bosoms, honestly. Oh, God, sir, she's right, said Ponder. It will make a rather unfortunate shape. What kind of mind would see something like that in a pair of innocent letters? The lecturer in recent rooms demanded angrily. I don't know, sir, said Glenda, but every man watching the football has got one, and they would make up nicknames. They love doing that. I suspect you may be right, said Ridcully. But we never had any trouble when I was rowing in the old days. Football followers are rather more robust in their language, sir, said Ponder. Yes, and in those days we were pretty careless when it came to throwing fireballs, as I recall, Ridcully mused. Oh dear, what a shame. I was looking forward to giving the old rag a bit of an airing again. <laughs> Still, I'm sure we can change the design a little to save embarrassment all round. Thank you once again, Miss Glenda. Bosoms, eh? <laughs> Narrow escape there, all round. Good day to you. He shut the door after the trolley, which Glenda was pushing as if in a race. Molly, the head maid in the day kitchen, was fretting at the end of the corridor beyond. She sagged with relief when Glenda came round the corner, teacups rattling. Was it all right? Did anything go wrong? I'll get into so much trouble if anything went wrong. Tell me nothing went wrong. It was all fine, said Glenda. That got her a suspicious look. Are you sure? You owe me for this. 
The laws of favors are amongst the most fundamental in the multiverse. The first law is nobody asks for just one favor. The second request, after the granting of the first favor, prefaced by, and can I be really cheeky, is the asking of the second favor. If the aforesaid second request is not granted, the second law ensures that the need for any gratitude for the first favor is nullified, and in accordance with the third law, the favor giver has not done any favors at all, and the favor field collapses. But Glenda reckoned she'd won a lot of favors over the years, and was owed a few herself. Besides, she had reason to believe that Molly had been spending the welcome break in dalliance with her boyfriend, who worked in the bakery. Can you get me into the banquet on Wednesday night? Sorry, the butler chooses who gets those jobs, said Molly. Ah, yes, the tall, thin girls, Glenda thought. Why in the world would you want to get in anyway? Molly said. It's a lot of running around and not much pay when all's said and done. I mean, we get some decent leftovers after a big affair. But what's that to you? Everyone knows that you're the leftover queen. She paused, too awkwardly. Oh, I mean, we all know you're really good at making wonderful food with always a little something left over. She gabbled. That's all I meant. I didn't think you meant anything else, said Glenda, keeping her voice level. But she raised it again to add as Molly scurried off. I can pay back the favour right now. You've got two flowery handprints on your ass. The glare that came back was a small victory, but you have to take what you can get. Still, that strange interlude, which she was sure she would regret, had taken up a lot of time. She had to get the night kitchen organised. When the door had closed behind the rather forthright maid, Ridcully nodded meaningfully at Ponder. All right, Mr. Stibbins. You were glancing at your thermometer the whole time I was talking to her. Out with it. Some kind of entanglement, said Ponder. And there was me thinking that Veterinarius behind the business with the urn, said Ridcully gloomily. I should have realized he's never that unsubtle. Oh, I assumed it was going to be something like that right at the start, said the lecturer in recent runes. Indeed, said the chair of indefinite studies. It crossed my mind as soon as I saw it in the paper. Gentlemen, said Red Cully, I'm humbled that as soon as I have an idea about what something is, it turns out that you all knew what it was. I am amazed. Excuse me, said Dr. Hicks, but I don't have a clue what you're talking about. You are out of touch. You've been spending too long underground, sir, said the lecturer in recent runes sternly. You don't often let me out, that's why. And can I remind you that I have to maintain a vital line of cosmic defense in this establishment here with a staff of exactly one, and he's dead. You mean Charlie? Ah, remember old Charlie, keen worker nevertheless, said Ridcully. Yes, but I have to keep rewiring him all the time, sighed Hicks. I do try to keep you abreast of things in my monthly reports. I hope you read them. Tell me, Dr. Hicks, said Ponder, did you experience anything unusual when that young lady was speaking so eloquently? Well, yes, I had a pleasant moment of happy recollection about my father. So did we all, I am sure, said Ponder. There was sombre nodding around the table. I never knew my father. I was brought up by my aunts. I had deja vu without the original vu. And it wasn't magic, suggested the lecturer in recent runes. No, religion, I suspect, said Ridcully. A god invoked that sort of thing. Not invoked, Mustrum, said Dr. Hicks. Summoned by bloodshed. Oh, I hope not, said Ridcully, getting to his feet. I would like to try a little experiment this afternoon, gentlemen. We will not talk about football. We will not speculate about football. We will not worry about football. You're going to make us play it, aren't you? said the lecturer in recent runes glumly. Yes, said Ridcully, more than somewhat miffed at the spoiling of a perfectly good peroration. 
Just a little kickabout to help us get some hands-on experience of the game as it is played. Uh, strictly, under the new rules, by which I mean the ancient rules, we are taking as our model, hands-on experience means no hands, said Ponder. Well pointed out, that man. Put the word out, will you? Football practice on the lawn after lunch. One thing you had to remember when dealing with dwarfs was that while they shared the same world as you did, metaphorically, they thought about it as if it were upside down. Only the richest and most influential dwarfs lived in the deepest caverns. For a dwarf, a penthouse in the center of a city would be some kind of slum. Dwarfs liked it dark and cool. It didn't stop there. A dwarf on the up and up was really on his uppers, and upper-class dwarfs were lower class. A dwarf who was rich, healthy, and had respect, and his own rat farm, justifiably, felt at rock bottom and was held in low esteem. When you talked to dwarfs, you turned your mind upside down. The city, too. Of course, when you dug down in Ankhmore Pork, you just found more Ankhmore Pork. Thousands of years of it, ready to be dug out and shored up and walled in with the shiny dwarf brick. It was Lord Vetinari's grand undertaking. The city's walls corseted it like a fetishist's happiest dream. Gravity offered only a limited supply of up, but the deep loam of the plain had a limitless supply of down. Glenda was surprised, therefore, to find Shatta right at the surface in the mall, alongside the really posh dress shops that were for human ladies. That made sense, however. If you were going to make a scandalous profit selling clothes, it made sense to camouflage yourself amongst other shops doing the same thing. She wasn't sure about the name, but apparently Shatta meant a wonderful surprise in Dwarfish. And if you started to laugh about that sort of thing, then you would never have time to pause for breath. She approached the door with the apprehension of one who is certain that the moment she sets foot inside, she will be charged five dollars a minute for breathing, and then be held upside down and have all her wealth removed with a hook. And it was indeed classy. But it was dwarf classy. That meant an awful lot of chain mail and enough weaponry to take over a city. But if you paid attention, you realized it was female chain mail and weaponry. That was how things were happening, apparently. Dwarf women had got fed up with looking like dwarf men all the time and were metaphorically melting down their breastplates in order to make something a little lighter and with adjustable straps. Juliet had explained this on the way down, although, of course, Juliet did not use the word metaphorically, it being several syllables beyond her range. There were battle axes and war hammers, but all with that certain feminine touch. One war axe, apparently capable of cleaving a backbone lengthwise, was beautifully engraved with flowers. It was another world, and as she stood just inside the doorway looking around, Glenda felt relieved that there were other humans in the place. In fact, there were quite a few, and that was surprising. One of them, a young human woman with steel boots six inches high, gravitated towards them as if drawn by a magnet, and given the amount of ferrous metal on her body— a magnet was something she would never pass in a hurry. She was holding a tray of drinks. There's black mead, red mead, and white mead, she said, and then lowered her voice by a few decibels and three social classes. Actually, the red mead is really sherry and all the dwarf ladies are drinking it. They like not having to quaff. Do we have to pay for this? said Glenda, nervously. It's free, said the girl. She indicated a bowl of small black things on the tray each one pierced with a cocktail stick, and said slightly hopelessly, And do try the rat fruit. Before Glenda could stop her, Juliet had taken one and was chewing enthusiastically. What part of a rat is its fruit? asked Glenda. The girl with the tray did not look directly at her. Well, you know shepherd's pie, she said. I know twelve different recipes, said Glenda, in a moment of rare smugness. This was actually a lie. She probably knew about four recipes, because there was only so much she could do with meat and potatoes. But the glittering metallic grandeur of the place was getting on her nerves, and she felt the need to stick up for herself. And then realization dawned. Oh, you mean like traditional shepherd's pie, she said, made with the... 
I'm afraid so, said the girl, but they're very popular with the ladies. Don't have any more jewels, said Glenda quickly. It's quite nice, said Juliet. Can't I have one more? Just one then, said Glenda. That should even up the rat. She helped herself to a sherry, and the girl, balancing carefully as she managed three different things with two different hands, handed her a glossy brochure. Glenda glanced through it and knew her original impression had been right. This place was so expensive they didn't tell you the price of anything. You could always be sure things were going to be expensive when they didn't tell you the price. No point in looking through it. It'd suck your wages out through your eyeballs. Free drinks, oh yes. With nothing else to do, she scanned the rest of the crowd. Everyone, except the growing and, in fact, quite large number of humans, had a beard. All dwarfs had beards. It was part of being a dwarf. Here, though, the beards were a little finer than you usually saw around the city, and there had been some experimentation with perms and ponytails. There were mining pickaxes on view, it was true, but carried in expensively tooled bags, as if the owner might spot a likely-looking coal seam on the way to the shops and wouldn't be able to help herself. She shared this thought with Juliet, who pointed down at the feet of another well-heeled customer and said, What? And spoil those gorgeous boots? The snaky cleave helms they are. Four hundred dollars a pop. And you've to wait for six months. Glenda couldn't see the face of the boots' owner, but she did see the change in her body language. The hint of preening, even from the rear. Well, she thought, I suppose if you're going to spend all of a working family's yearly income on a pair of boots, it's nice that someone notices. When you watch people, you forget the people are watching you. Glenda was not very tall, which meant that from her point of view, dwarfs were not very short. And she realized that they were being approached in a determined kind of way by two dwarfs, one of whom was extremely expansive around the waist and wearing a breastplate so beautifully hammered and ornamented that taking it into battle would be an act of artistic vandalism. He and you had to remember that all dwarfs were he, unless they asserted otherwise, had, when he spoke, a voice that sounded like the darkest and most expensive type of dark chocolate, possibly smoked. And the hand he offered had so many rings on each finger that you had to look with care to realise that he was not wearing a gauntlet. And she was a she, Glenda was sure of it. The chocolate was just too rich and fruity. So glad you could come, my dears, she said, and the chocolate swirled. I am Madame Sean. I wondered if you could be of assistance to me. I really would not dream of asking, but I am, as you would put it, between a rock and a hard one. All this was, to Glenda's annoyance, addressed to Juliet, who was eating rat fruit as if there was no tomorrow, which, presumably, there had not been for the rat. She giggled. She's with me, said Glenda, and without meaning to, added, Madam? Madam waved another hand and more rings glistened. This salon is technically a mine, and that means that under dwarf law, I am the king of the mine, and in my mine, my rules go. And since I am king... I declare that I am queen, she said. Dwarf floor bends and creaks, but is not broken. Well, Glenda began, we... Hey! This was the madam's smaller companion, who was actually holding a tape measure up against Juliet. That is Pepe, said madam. Well, if he's going to take liberties like that, I hope he's a woman, said Glenda. Pepe is... <gasps> Pepe, said madam calmly. And there is no changing him, as it were, or her. Labels are such unhelpful things, I feel. Especially yours, because you don't put the prices on them, said Glenda, out of sheer nervousness. Ah, yes, you notice these things, said Madam, with a wink that disarmed to the point of melting. Peppy looked up excitedly at Madam, who went on. I wonder if you, if she, if you both would mind joining me backstage? The matter is a little delicate. Oh, yes, said Juliet immediately. 
Out of nowhere, other human girls materialised among the crowd and carefully opened a path towards the back of the enormous room along which Madame progressed as though propelled by invisible forces. Glenda felt that the situation had suddenly got away from her, but it had been a good measure of sherry and it whispered to her, Why not let the situation get away from you every once in a while, or even just once? She had no idea what she was expecting behind the gilded door at the far end, but she had not expected smoke and flames and shouting and someone screaming in a corner. The place looked like a foundry on the day they let the clowns in. Come on through. Don't let this disturb you, said Madame. It's always like this at showtime. Nerves, you know. Of course, everyone in this business is lowly strung, and there is always this problem to begin with, with the micromail. It's new, you see. According to dwarf lore, it must be hallmarked on every link, and that would not only be sacrilege, but also bloody difficult to do. Behind the scenes, it appeared that Madame became a little less chocolatey and a little more earthy. Micromail, said Juliet, as if she had been shown the gateway to riches. You know what it is, said Madame. She talks about nothing else, said Glenda. Talks and talks. Well, of course, it's wonderful stuff, said Madame, almost as soft as cloth. Certainly better than leather. And it doesn't chafe, said Juliet, which is always a consideration for the more traditional dwarf who will not wear cloth, said Madame. Old tribal customs, how they hold us back, always pull us back. We haul ourselves out of the mine but somehow we always drag a bit of the mine with us. If I had my way, silk would be reclassified as a metal. What is your name, young lady? Juliet, said Glenda automatically, and then blushed. That was mumming, pure and simple. It was almost as bad as getting someone to spit on their handkerchief and wiping their face for them. The young lady with the drinks had followed them in, and chose this moment to take Glenda's sherry glass and replace it with a full one. Would you mind just walking up and down a moment, Juliet? said Madame. Glenda wanted to ask why, but since her mouth was full of sherry as an anti-embarrassment remedy, she let that one pass. Madame watched Juliet critically, one hand cupping the elbow of the other arm. Yes, yes, but I mean slowly as if you were not in a hurry to get there and didn't care, said Madame. Imagine you're a bird in the air, a fish in the sea. Where the world? All right, said Juliet, and started again. By the time Juliet was halfway across the floor for the second time, Pepe had burst into tears. Where has she been? Where was she trained? He, or conceivably she, squeaked while clapping his or her cheeks with both hands. You must hire her at once. She's already got a good steady job at the university, Glenda said. But the sherry said, Once in a while isn't over yet. Don't spoil it. Dwarfs have a straightforward approach to alcoholic drink. Beer, mead, wine, sherry... One large size fits all. Madame, who clearly had an instinct for this kind of thing, put an arm around her shoulders. The problem with dwarf ladies, you see, is that a lot of us are a little shy about being the centre of attention. I also have to bear in mind that dwarf clothing is proving quite interesting to young humans of a certain turn of mind. Your daughter is human. Madame turned briefly to Juliet. You are human, aren't you, dear? I find it pays to check. Juliet, apparently staring rapturously into her private world, nodded enthusiastically. Oh, good, said Madame. And while she is exquisitely well-built and moves like a dream, she is not too much taller than the average dwarf, and frankly, my dear, some of the ladies would aspire to being a little taller than they are. This may be letting the side up, but that walk, my word. Dwarfs have hips, of course, but they seldom know what to do with them. Ah, I'm sorry. Have I said something wrong? 
the half pint of sherry so recently consumed by Glenda finally gave way under the pressure of her rage. I am not her mother. She is my friend. Madame shot her another of those looks that gave her the feeling that her brain was being taken out and examined minutely. Then would you mind if I paid your friend? There was a pause. Five dollars to model for me this afternoon. All right, said the sherry to Glenda. You wondered where I was going to take you, and here you are. Can you see the view? What are you going to do now? Twenty-five dollars, said Glenda. Pepe clapped her, or possibly his, cheeks again, and screamed, Yes, yes! And a shop discount, said Glenda. Madame gave her a long, drawn-out stare. Excuse me one moment, said the dwarf. She walked over and took Pepe's arm, walking him at some speed to the corner. Glenda could not hear what was being said over some nearby riveting and someone having hysterics. Madame came back smirking artificially, Pepe trailing her. I have a show starting in ten minutes, and my best model has dropped her pickaxe on her foot. We shall negotiate any future engagements. And will you please stop that jumping up and down, Pepe? Glenda blinked. I cannot believe I just did that, she thought. Twenty-five dollars for putting some clothes on? That's more than I earn in a month. That's just not right. And the sherry said, What exactly is wrong here? Would you dress up in chain mail and parade in front of a lot of strangers for twenty-five dollars? Glenda shuddered. Certainly not, she thought. Well, there you are then, said the sherry. But it will all end in tears, thought Glenda. Nope. You're just saying that because part of you thinks it should, said the sherry. You know there are far worse things that a girl could do for twenty-five dollars than put some clothes on. Take them off for a start. But what will the neighbours say, was the last despairing argument from Glenda. They can stick it up their jumper, said the sherry. Anyway, they won't know, will they? Dolly's sister doesn't shop in the mall, it's far too grand. Look, we're looking at twenty-five dollars, twenty-five dollars to do what you couldn't stop her doing now with a length of lead pipe. Just look at her face. She looks as if someone has lit a lamp inside. It was true. I'm all right then, thought Glenda. Good, said the sherry. And incidentally, <laughs> I'm feeling lonely. And as the tray was at Glenda's elbow again, she reached out automatically. Juliet was now surrounded by dwarfs, and by the sound of it, she was having a lightning education in how to wear clothing. But it wouldn't matter, would it? The truth of the matter was that Juliet would look good in a sack. Somehow, everything she wore fitted perfectly. Glenda, on the other hand, never found anything good in her size, and indeed seldom found anything in her size. In theory, something should fit, but all she ever found was facts which are so unbecoming. Well, we have a nice day for it, said the Arch-Chancellor. Looks like you're in, said the lecturer in recent runes, hopefully. I suggest two teams of five on a side, said Red Cully. Only a friendly game, of course, just to get the hang of it. Ponder Stibbons made no comment. Wizards were competitive. It was a part of wizardry. Wizards have no more idea of a friendly game than cats have of a friendly mouse. The college lawns stretched out in front of them. Of course, next time we'll have proper jerseys, said Red Cully. Mrs. Whitlow already has her girls working on that. Mr. Stibbons? Yes, Arch-Chancellor? You shall be the keeper of the rules and adjudicate fairly. I will, of course, be captain of one of the teams, and you, runes, will captain the other. As Arch-Chancellor, I suggest that I pick my team first, and then you will be at liberty to choose yours. It isn't actually supposed to work like that, Arch-Chancellor, said Ponder. You pick a team member, and then he picks a team member, until you have enough team members or have run out of team members who aren't grossly fat or trembling with nerves. At least that's how I remember it. Ponder, in his youth, had spent far too long standing next to the fat kid. Oh, well, if that's how it's done, then I suppose we shall have to do it that way, 
said the Arch-Chancellor with bad grace. Stibbins, it will be your task to penalize the opposing side for any infringements they make. Don't you mean that I should penalize either side for any infringements they make, Arch-Chancellor, he said. It has to be fair. Ridcully looked at him with his mouth open, as if Ponder had mentioned a concept that was totally alien. Oh, yes, I suppose it has to be like that. A variety of wizards had turned out this afternoon from curiosity, a suspicion that being there might turn out to be a good career move, and the prospect of maybe seeing some colleagues travelling across the lawn on their noses. Oh dear, thought Ponder as the choosing began. It was just like school again, but at school nobody wanted the fat boy. Here, of course, it had to be a case of nobody wanted the fattest boy, which, since the departure of the dean, was a matter of fine judgment. Ponder reached into his robes and pulled out a whistle, or perhaps the grandfather of all whistles, eight inches long and as thick as a generous pork sausage. Where did that come from, Mr. Stibbons? said Ridcully. As a matter of fact, Arch-Chancellor, I found it in the study of the late Evans the Striped. It's a fine whistle, said Ridcully. It was an innocent sentence that managed to hint quite silently that such a fine whistle should not be in the hands of Ponder Stibbons when it could be in the ownership of, for example, the Arch-Chancellor of a university. Ponder spotted this because he had been expecting it. I shall need this to alert and control the behaviour of both teams, he said haughtily. You made me the referee, Arch-Chancellor, and I'm afraid that for the duration of the game I am, as it were, he hesitated, in charge. This university is a hierarchy, you understand, Stibbons? Yes, sir, and this is a game of football. I believe that the procedure is to put the football down, and when the whistle is blown, each side will attempt to hit the goal of the opposing side with the ball, while trying to prevent the ball hitting their own goal. Have we all understood that? It seems pretty clear to me, said the chair of indefinite studies. There was a murmur of agreement. Nevertheless, before the game, I demand a blow on the whistle. Of course, Arch-Chancellor, but then you must give it me back. I am the custodian of the game. He handed over the whistle. On Ridcully's first attempt at blowing, he dislodged a spider that had been living a blameless yet frugal life for the last twenty years, and deposited him in the beard of the professor of natural studies who was just passing. The second blow shook free the fossilized pea inside and filled the air with echoes of liquid brass. And then... Ridcully froze. His face flushed from the neck upwards at speed. The sound of his next drawn breath was like the vengeance of the gods. His stomach expanded, his eyes became pinpoints, thunder rolled overhead, and he roared, Why haven't you boys brought your kit? St. Elmo's fire roared along the length of the whistle. The sky darkened and fear gripped every watching soul as time reversed, and there stood the giant, maniacally screaming Evans the Striped, the instigator of badly forged notes from your mother, the enthusiast for long runs in the sleet, the promoter of communal showers as a cure for adolescent shyness, and the one who, if you didn't bring your proper gear, would make you play in your pants. Venerable wizards who had faced down the most cunning of monsters through the decades trembled in damp adolescent fear as the scream went on and on, to be halted as sharply as it started. Ridcully fell forward onto the turf. I do apologize for that, said Dr. Hicks, lowering his staff. A slightly evil deed, of course, but I'm sure you'll agree that it was necessary in the circumstances. The skull ring, remember, university statute? And that was a clear case of possession by artifact, if ever I saw one. The collected wizards, the cold sweat beginning to evaporate, nodded sagely. Oh, yes, it was regrettably necessary, they agreed. For his own good, they agreed. Had to be done, they agreed. And this verdict was echoed by Ridcully himself when he opened his eyes and said, What the hell was that? Uh, the soul of Evans the Striped, I think, Arch-Chancellor, said Ponder. In the whistle, was it? 
Red Collie rubbed his head. Yes, I think so, said Ponder. And who hit me? A general shuffling and murmuring indicated that by democratic agreement, this was a question that could be best answered by Dr. Hicks. It was acceptable treachery on the college statute, sir. Wouldn't mind the whistle for the dark museum if nobody objects. Quite so, quite so, said Red Cully. Saw the problem, sorted it out. Well done, that man. Do you think I could be allowed an evil chuckle, sir? Red Cully brushed himself down. No. We shall forego the whistle, Mr. Stibbins. And now, gentlemen, let the game commence. And thus, after a certain amount of bickering, Unseen University's first football match in decades began. Instantly, from Ponder Stibbins's point of view, various problems arose. The most pressing one was that all the wizards were dressed as wizards, which was to say, alike. Ponder ordered the teams to play hats on and hats off, which caused another row and that particular problem was exacerbated further because there were so many collisions that even the officially hatted kept losing theirs. And then the game was paused because it was declared that the statue, commemorating Arch-Chancellor Scrub's discovery of Blit, was in fact three inches narrower than the venerable statue of Arch-Chancellor Flanker, discovering the third breakfast, thus giving an unfair advantage to the hatless squad. But all these problems, foreseeable and inescapable, paled into insignificance compared with the problem of the ball. It was an official ball, Ponder had made certain of that, but pointy shoes, even if they have a very long point, cannot absorb the impact of the human foot kicking what is, when all is said and screamed, a piece of wood with a thin cloth and leather wrapping. Eventually, as another wizard was helped away with a sprained ankle, even Ridcully was moved to say, this is damn nonsense, Stibbins. There has to be something better than this. Beggar boots, suggested the lecturer in recent runes. The kind of boots you need for kicking this would slow you right down, said Ponder. Besides, the men on the urn had nothing at all on their feet. I suggest we consider this research. What do we need, Stibbins? A better ball, sir, and some attempt at running about and a general consensus that it is not a good idea to stop to relight your pipe in the middle of play. A more sensible type of goal, because running into a stone statue is painful. Some grasp, however small, of the notion of teamwork in a gaming situation. A resolution not to run away if a member of the opposing team is rushing towards you. An understanding of the fact that you do not handle the ball in any circumstances. May I remind you that I gave up stopping play because of this since you gentlemen, when you were excited, persisted in picking it up and, in one case, hiding it behind your back and standing on it. I would like to point out at this juncture that a sense of direction is worth cultivating vis-a-vis -vis the goal that is yours and the goal that is theirs. Inviting as it may be, there is no point in kicking the ball into your own goal, and nor should you congratulate and pat on the back anyone who achieves this feat. Out of the three goals scored in our match, the number scored by players into their own goal was, he paused and looked down at his clipboard, three. This is a commendably high level of scoring compared with football as currently played, though, once again, I must stress that issues of direction and goal ownership are of pivotal importance. A tactic, which I admit looked promising, was for the players to cluster thickly around their own goal so there was no possibility of anything getting past them. I regret, however, that if both teams do this, you do not have a game so much as a tableau. A more promising tactic, which seemed to be adopted by one or two of you, was to lurk near the opponent's goal so that if the ball came in your direction, you would be ideally placed to get it past the custodian of the goal. The fact that in some cases you and the opposing custodian leaned companionably against the goal, sharing a cigarette and watching the play upfield, showed a decent spirit and may possibly be a good starting point for some more advanced tactics, but I do not think this should be encouraged. On this general topic, I have to assume that retiring from the field of play for the call of nature or a breather is acceptable, but doing so for a snack is not. My feeling, Arch-Chancellor, is that our colleagues' general desire to be never more than 20 minutes from some savouries may be satisfactorily catered for by a pause in the middle of the game. Happily, if they changed ends at that point, 
that would satisfy the complaints about one goal being larger than the other. Yes? This was to the Chair of Indefinite Studies. If we change ends, said the Chair, who had put his hand up, will that then mean that the goals that were scored into our own goal will now become goals scored against the opposing team since that goal is now physically theirs? Ponder considered the metaphysics of answering this one and settled for, No, of course not. I have a whole list of other notes, Arch-Chancellor, and regrettably they add up to us not being very good at football. The wizards fell silent. Let's start with the ball, said Ridcully. I've got an idea about the ball. Yes, sir, I thought you would. Then come and see me after dinner. Juliet had been sucked into the manic circus that was the backstage area of Shatter, and no one was paying Glenda any attention whatsoever. Just for now, she was a hindrance, surplus, no use to anyone, an obstruction to be worked around, an onlooker in the game. A little way away, a handsome young dwarf with a double ponytail beard was waiting patiently while a temporary rivet was put into what looked like a silver cuirass. She was surrounded by workers in much the same way as a knight is when his vassals must dress him for combat. Standing a little apart from them were two taller dwarfs, whose weaponry looked slightly more functional than beautiful. They were male. Glenda knew this simply because any female of any sapient species knows the look of a man who has nothing very much to do in an environment that, for this time, is clearly occupied by and totally under the control of females. It looked as though they were on guard. Propelled by the sherry, she wandered over. That must cost a lot of money, she said to the nearest guard. He looked slightly embarrassed by the approach. You're telling me? Moonshilver, they call it. We're even having a walk down the catwalk with her. They say it's the coming thing, but I don't know. It won't take an edge, and it wouldn't stop a decent blade. You need eagles to help you smelt it, too. They say it's worth even more than platinum. Looks good, though. And they say you hardly know you're wearing it. It's not what my granddad would have called a metal. But they say that we have to move with the times, personally. I wouldn't even hang it on the wall, but there you go. Girl's armour, said the other guard. What about this micromail stuff, said Glenda. Ah, different pocket full of rats entirely, miss, said the first guard. I hear they set up and forge it right here in the city, cause the best craftsmen are here. Just the job, eh? Chain mail as fine as cloth and strong as steel. It'll get cheaper too, they say. And most of all, it doesn't. What's it, Glenda? Guess who? Someone tapped Glenda on the shoulder. She turned round and saw a vision of heavily but tastefully armoured beauty. It was Juliet. But Glenda only knew this because of the milky blue eyes. Juliet was wearing a beard. Madam says I'd better wear this, she said. It's not too off if it don't include a beard. What do you think? This time the sherry got in first. It's actually rather attractive, said Glenda, still in mild shock. It's very silvery. It was a female beard, she could tell. It looked styled and stylish and didn't have bits of rat in it. Madam says there's a place safe for you in the front row, said Juliet. Oh, I couldn't sit in the front row. Glenda began on automatic, but the sherry cut in with, Shut up, stop thinking like your mother, will you? Go and sit down in the damn front row. One of the ever-present young ladies chose this exact moment to take Glenda by the hand and lead her slightly unsteady feet through the settling chaos, out through the door and back into fairyland. There was indeed a seat waiting for her. Fortunately, although in the front row, it was off to one side. She would have died of shame had it been right in the middle. She clutched her handbag in both hands and risked a look along the row. It was packed. It wasn't exclusively dwarf either. There were a number of human ladies, smartly dressed, a little on the skinny side, in her opinion, almost offensively at ease and all talking. Another sherry mystically appeared in her hand, and as the noise stopped with rat-trap sharpness, Madame Sharn came out through the curtain and began to address the crowded hall. Glenda thought, I wish I'd worn a better coat. 
at which point the sherry tucked her up and put her to bed. Glenda only started to think properly again some time later, when she was hit on the head by a bunch of flowers. They struck her just over the ear, and as expensive petals rained around her, she looked up at the beaming, radiant face of Juliet at the very edge of the catwalk, halfway through the motions of shouting, Zack! And there were more flowers flying, and people standing, and cheering, and music, and in general, the feeling of being under a waterfall with no water, but inexhaustible torrents of sound and light. Out of it all, Juliet exploded, throwing herself at Glenda and flinging her arms around her neck. She wants me to do it again, she panted. She says I could go to Quirm and Genua even. She says she'll pay me more if I don't work for no one else and the world is an oyster. I never knew that. But you've already got a steady job in the kitchen, said Glenda, only three quarters of her way into consciousness. Later, more often than she liked, she remembered saying those words while the applause thundered all around them. There was a gentle pressure on her shoulder, and here was one of the interchangeable young ladies with a tray. Madam sends her compliments, miss, and would like to invite you and Miss Juliet to join her in her private boudoir. That's nice of her, but I think we should be getting a boudoir, did you say? Oh, yes. And would you like another drink? It's a celebration, after all. Glenda looked around at the chattering, laughing, and, above all, drinking crowd. The place felt like an oven. All right, but not that sherry, thank you all the same. Have you got something very cold and fizzy? Why, yes, miss, lots. The girl produced a large bottle and expertly filled a tall fluted glass with, apparently, bubbles. When Glenda drank it, the bubbles filled her too. Mm, quite nice, she ventured. A bit like lemonade grown up. That's how Madam drinks it, certainly. Uh, this boudoir, Glenda tried, following the girl rather unsteadily. How big is it? Oh, pretty large, I think. There must be about forty people in there already. Really? That's a big boudoir. Well, thank goodness, Glenda thought. That, at least, is sorted out. They really ought to put proper explanations in these novels. She had never been sure, given that she had no idea what sort of thing a boudoir was, what sort of thing you would find in it when you did. She found that it contained people, heat, and flowers. Not flowers in bunches, but in pillars and towering stacks, filling most of the air with clouds of sticky perfume while the people below filled the rest of it with words tightly packed. No one could possibly hear what they were saying, Glenda told herself, but perhaps that wasn't important. Perhaps what was important was being there, to be seen to say it. The crowd parted, and she saw Juliet, still in the glittering outfit, still in the beard, being there. Salamanders were flashing on and off, which meant people with iconographs, didn't it? The trashy papers were full of people glittering for the picture. She had no time for them. What made it worse was that her disapproval mattered not a fig to anyone. The people glittered anyway. And here was Juliet, glittering most of all. I think I could do with a little fresh air, she muttered. Her guide led her gently to an unobtrusive doorway. Restrooms through here, ma'am. And they were, except that the long, carefully lit room was like some kind of fairy tale, all velvet and drapes. Fifteen surprised visions of Glenda stared at her from as many mirrors. It was overpowering enough to make her sit down in a very expensive bendy-legged chair that turned out to be very restful, too. When she jerked awake, she staggered out, got lost in a dark world of smelly passages choked with packing cases, and finally blundered into a very large room indeed. It was more like a cavern. At the far end were a pair of double doors, probably ashamed to let in a grey light which did not so much illuminate as accuse. Another chaos of empty clothes racks and packing cases was scattered around the floor. In one place, water had dripped from the roof and a puddle had formed on the stone, soaking some cardboard. There they are, in there with their glitter and their finery. And it's all muck and rubbish round the back, right, dear? said a voice in the dark. 
Jule Glarke Lady who can spot a metaphor when she stares it in the face. Something like that, muttered Glenda. Who's doing the asking? An orange light glowed and faded in the gloom. Someone was smoking a cigarette in the shadows. It's the same all over, love. If there was an award for the arse end of things, there'd be a real bloody squabble for first place. I've seen a few palaces in my time, and they're all the same. Turrets and banners in the front, maids, bedrooms and water pipes round the back. Fancy a top-up? Can't be walking around here with an empty glass. You'll stand out. The cooler air was making her feel better. She still had a glass in her hand. What is this stuff? Well, if this was any other part, it'd probably be the cheapest fizzing wine you could strain through a sock. But madam won't stint. It's the real stuff. Champagne. What? I thought only nobby people drank that. No, just people with money, love. Sometimes it's the same thing. She looked closer and gasped. What? Are you Pepe? That's me, love. But you're not all... All... She waved her hands frantically. Off duty, love. Don't have to worry about... He waved his hands equally frantically. I've got a bottle here of our very own. Can't you join me? Well, I ought to be getting back in there. Why? To fuss around her like an old hen. Leave her be, love. She's a duck who's just found water. Peppy looked taller in this gloom. Maybe it was the language and the lack of flapping. And of course anyone next to Madame Sean would look small. He was willowy, though, like someone made of sinews. But anything could happen to her. Pepe's grin gleamed. Yes, but probably won't. My word, she sold micromail for us and no mistake. Told Madame I had a good feeling. She's got a great career in front of her. No, she's got a good, steady job in the night kitchen with me, said Glenda. It might not be big money, but it'll turn up every week. On the nail, and she won't lose it if someone prettier comes along. Dolly sisters, right? Sounds like the Botany Street area, said Pepe. I'm sure of it. Not too bad as I recall. I didn't get beaten up much down there, but at the end of the day, they're all crab buckets. Glenda was taken aback. She'd expected anger or condescension, not this sharp little grin. You know a lot about our sissy for a dwarf from Uberwald, I must say. No, love. I know a lot about Uberwald for a boy from Lub and Clout said Pepe smoothly. Old Cheese Alley, to be precise. Local lab, me. Wasn't always a dwarf, you know. I just joined. What? Can you do that? Well, it's not like they advertise, but yeah, if you know the right people. And Madam knew the right people. Ha! <laughs> knew quite a lot about the right people. Wasn't hard. I've got to believe in a few things. There's a few observances, and of course I have to keep off the old bows. He smiled as her glance pinned the glass in his hand and went on. So quick, love. I was going to add when I'm working. And good job, too. It doesn't matter if you are shoring up the mine roof or riveting a bodice. Being a piss artist is bloody stupid. And the moral of all this is, you have to grab life or drop back into the crab bucket. Oh yes, that's all very well to say, Glenda snapped, wondering what crabs had got to do with anything. But in real life, people have responsibilities. We don't have shiny jobs with lots of money, but they are real jobs doing things that people need. I'd be ashamed of myself selling boots at $400 a go, which only rich people can afford. What's the point of that? Well, you must admit that it makes rich people less rich, said the chocolate voice of Madame behind her. Like many large people, she could move as quietly as the balloon she resembled. That's a good start, isn't it? And it goes to wages for the miners and the smiths. It all goes around, they tell me. She sat down heavily on a packing case, glass in hand. Well, we've got most of them out now, she said, fumbling in her capacious breastplate with her spare hand and pulling out a thick wad of paper. The big names want to be in on this, and everyone wants it exclusively and we're going to need another forge. Tomorrow, I'll go and see the bank. 
she paused to dip into her metal bodice again. As a dwarf, I was raised in the faith that gold is the one true currency, she said, counting out some crisp notes. But I have to admit, this stuff is a lot warmer. That's fifty dollars for Juliet, twenty-five from me, and twenty-five from the champagne, which is feeling happy. Juliet said to give it to you to look after. Miss Glenda thinks it will lead her treasure into a lifetime of worthless sin and depravity, said Pepe. Well, that's a thought, said Madame, but I can't remember when I last had some depravity. Tuesday, said Pepe. A whole box of chocolates is not depraved. Besides, you slid out the card between the layers, which confused me. I did not intend to eat the bottom layer. I did not want the bottom layer. It was practically a salt. Pepe coughed. We're scaring the normal lady, love. Madame smiled. Glenda, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking we're a couple of louche, evil clowns who booze away in a world of smoke and mirrors. Well, that's fairly accurate right now, but today was the end of a year's hard work, you see. And you bicker like an old married couple, Glenda thought. Her head was aching. She tried a rat fruit. That was the trouble. She was sure of it. In the morning... I'm going to show these orders to the manager of the Royal Bank and ask him for a lot of money. If he trusts us, can you? We need Juliet. She just sparkles. And you two are holding hands. Tightly. Something soft snapped inside Glenda. All right, look, she said. It's like this. Jules is going to come back home with me tonight to get her head straight. Tomorrow, well, we'll see. We can't ask for more than that, can we? Said Madame, patting Glenda on the knee. You know, Juliet thinks the world of you. She said she'd need you to say yes. She was telling all the society ladies about your pies. She's been talking to society ladies said Glenda in astonishment, laced with trepidation, and tinted with wonder. Certainly. They all wanted a close look at the micromail, and she just chatted away, cheery as you like. I don't think anyone ever said, watch her, to them in their lives before. Oh no, I'm sorry. Why be? They were rather taken by it, and apparently... You can bake pickled onions into a pie so that they stay crunchy. She told them that. Oh, yes. I gather that they all intend to get their cooks to try it out. Ha! They'll never find the way, said Glenda with satisfaction. So Jewel says. We generally call her Juliet, said Glenda. She told us to call her Jules, said Madam. Is there a problem? Well... Uh, not really a problem, Glenda began wretchedly. That's good then, said Madame, who clearly knew when not to notice subtleties. Now let's prize her away from her new friends, and you can see to it that she gets a good night's sleep. There was laughter, and the girls helping with the show streamed out into the clammy place that was the midwife to beauty. Juliet was among them, and with the loudest laugh. She broke away when she saw Glenda and gave her another hug. Oh, Glenda, isn't this great? It's like a fairy story. Yes, well, it might be, said Glenda, but they don't all have happy endings. Just you remember, you have a good job now with prospects and regular leftovers to take home. That's not to be lightly thrown away. No, it should be hurled with great force, said Pepe. I mean, what is this? Emberella? The wand has been waved. The court is cheering. A score of handsome princes are waiting to sign up for just a sniff of her slipper. And you want her to go back to work making pumpkins? He looked at their blank faces. All right. Perhaps that came out a little confused, but surely you can follow the scene. This is a big chance. As big as it gets. A way out of the bucket. I think we'll go home now said Glenda primly. Come along, Jules. See, 
said Pepe, when they had gone. It's a crab bucket. Madame peered into a bottle to see if, against all probability, one glass full yet remained. Did you know she more or less raised the kid? Jules will do what she says. What a waste, said Pepe. Don't take the world by storm. Stay here and make pies. You think that's a lie? Someone has to make pies, Madame said, with an infuriating calm reasonableness. Oh, police, not her, let it not be her, and for leftovers, oh no. Madam picked up another empty bottle. She knew it was empty because it was in the vicinity of Pepe at the end of a long day, but she examined it anywhere because thirst springs eternal. Hmm, it might not come to that, she said. I have a feeling that Miss Glenda is just about to start thinking. There's a powerful mind behind that rather sad cloak and those awful shoes. Today might be its lucky day. Ridcully strode through the corridors of Unseen University with his robes flapping confidently behind him. He had a big stride and Ponder had to run in a semi-crabwise fashion to keep up with him, his clipboard clutched protectively to his chest. You know, we did agree that it wasn't to be used for purposes other than pure research, Arch-Chancellor. You actually signed the edict. Did I? I don't remember that, Stibbons. I remember it most distinctly, sir. It was just after the case of Mr. Floribunda. Which one was he? said Ridcully, still striding purposefully ahead. He was the one who felt a little peckish and asked the cabinet for a bacon sandwich to see what would happen. I thought that anything taken out of the cabinet had to be returned in 14.14 hours recurring. Yes, sir, that is the case, but the cabinet appears to have strange rules that we do not fully understand. In any case, Mr. Floribunda's defence was that he thought the 14-hour rule didn't apply to bacon sandwiches. Nor did he tell anybody, and so the students on his floor were only alerted when they heard the screams some 14 hours later. Trick me if I'm wrong said Ridcully, still covering the flagstones at an impressive rate. But would it not have been digested by that point? Yes, sir, but it still went back to the cabinet of its own accord, you might say. That was quite an interesting discovery. We did not know that could happen. Ridcully stopped and Ponder bumped into him. What exactly did happen to him? You wouldn't want me to draw a picture, sir. However, the good news is that he will soon be out of the wheelchair. In fact, I gather he's already walking quite well with a stick. How we discipline him is, of course, up to you, sir. The file is on your desk, as are indeed a considerable number of other documents. Ridcully strode off again. He did it to see what would happen, did he? He said cheerfully. So he said, sir, said Ponder. And this was against my express orders, was it? Yes, absolutely, definitely, sir, said Ponder who knew his arch-chancellor, and already had an inkling of how this one was going to end. And so therefore, sir, I must insist that he... He walked into Ridcully again because the man had stopped outside a large door on which was a bright red notice saying, No item to be removed from this room without the express permission of the arch-chancellor. Signed, Ponder Stibbins, P.P. Mustrum Ridcully. You signed this one for me? Ridcully said. Yes, sir, you were busy at the time, and we had agreed on this one. Yes, of course, but I don't think that you should pee-pee -pee just like that. Remember what that young lady said about the U-U. Ponder produced a large key and opened the door. May I also remind you, Arch-Chancellor, that we agreed a moratorium on the use of the Cabinet of Curiosity until we had cleaned up some of the residual magic in the building. We still don't seem to have got rid of the squid. Did we agree, Mr. Stibbons? said Ridcully, turning around sharply. Or did you agree with yourself, P.P. me, as it were? Well, uh, I think I understood the spirit of your thinking, sir. Well, this is the spirit of pure research, said Ridcully. It's research into how we can hope to save our cheese board. Many would say there could be no greater goal. As for young Floribunda... Yes, sir, said Ponder wearily. Promote him. Whatever level he is, move him up one. I think that'll send the wrong kind of signal, Ponder tried. On the contrary, Mr. Stibbons, it will send exactly the right message to the student body. 
But he disobeyed an express order, may I point out? That's right. He showed independent thinking and a certain amount of pluck, and in the course of so doing, added valuable data to our understanding of the cabinet. But he might have destroyed the whole university, sir. Right, in which case he would have been vigorously disciplined if we'd been able to find anything left of him. But he didn't, and he was lucky, and we need lucky wizards. Promote him! On the direct order of me, not pee-peed at all. Incidentally, how loud were his screams? As a matter of fact, Arch-Chancellor, the first one was so heartfelt that it kept going long after he'd run out of breath and apparently adopted an independent existence. Residual magic again. We've had to lock it in one of the cellars. Did he actually say what the bacon sandwich was like? Coming or leaving, sir, said Ponder. Only coming, I think, said Ridcully. I do have a vivid imagination, after all. He said it was the most delightful bacon sandwich he'd ever eaten. It was the bacon sandwich that you dream of when you hear the words bacon sandwich and never, ever quite get. With brown sauce, said Ridcully. Of course, apparently it was the bacon sandwich to end all bacon sandwiches. It nearly did for him. But isn't that what you already know about the cabinet? That it always delivers a perfect specimen? Actually, we know very little for certain, said Ponder. What we do know is that it will hold nothing too large to fit inside a cube measuring 14.14 inches recurring on a side, that it will cease working if, we now know, a non-organic object is not replaced in it in 14.14 hours recurring, and that none of its contents are pink, although we do not know why this should be. But bacon is definitely organic, Mr. Stibbons, said Ridcully. Ponder sighed. Yes, sir. We don't know why that is either. The Arch-Chancellor took pity on him. Perhaps it was one of those very crispy ones, he suggested kindly, the kind that you can break between your fingers. I like that in a bacon sandwich. The door swung open, and there it was, small, in the center of a very large room, the Cabinet of Curiosity. Do you think this is wise? said Ponder. Of course not, said Ridcully. Now find me a football. On one wall was a white mask, such as one might wear to a carnival. Ponder turned towards it. Hex, please find me a ball suitable for the game of football. That mask is new, said Ridcully. I thought Hex's voice travelled in blitz space. Yes, sir, it just comes out of the air, sir, but somehow, well, it feels better to have something to talk to. What shaped football do you require? said Hex, his voice as smooth as clarified butter. Oval or spherical? Spherical, said Ponder. Instantly, the cabinet shook. The thing had always worried Ridcully. It looked too smug for a start. It seemed to be saying, You don't know what you are doing. You use me as a kind of lucky dip, and I bet you have never thought of how many dangerous things can fit into a fourteen-inch cube. In fact, Ridcully had thought about that often at three in the morning, and never went into the room without a couple of subcritical spells in his pocket, just in case. And then there was Nut. Well, hope for the best, and prepare for the worst. That was the UU way. A drawer slid out and went on sliding until it reached the wall and presumably continued to slide into some other hospitable set of dimensions, because it never turned up outside the room, no matter how often you looked. Very smooth today, he observed, as another drawer rose up from under the floor and sprouted a further drawer exactly the same size as itself, which began to move purposefully towards the far wall. Yes, the lads at Brazen Neck have come up with a new algorithm for handling wave spaces in higher level blit. It speeds up something like the cabinet by getting on for two thousand drinkies. Ridcully frowned. Did you just make that up? No, sir. Charlie Drinky came up with it at Brazen Neck. It's a shorter way of saying fifteen thousand iterations to the first negative blit, and it's a lot easier to remember. So people you know at Brazen Neck send you stuff? said Ridcully. Oh, yes, said Ponder. For free? Of course, sir, said Ponder, looking surprised. The free sharing of information is central to the pursuit of natural philosophy. And so you tell them things, do you? Ponder sighed. Yes, of course. I don't think I approve of that, 
said Redcully. I'm all for the free sharing of information, provided it's them sharing their information with us. Yes, sir, but I think we're rather hampered by the meaning of the word sharing. Nevertheless, Redcully began and stopped. A sound so quiet that they had barely noticed it had stopped. The cabinet of curiosity had folded itself up and was once again just a piece of wooden furniture in the centre of the room. But as they looked at it, its two front doors opened and a brown ball dropped onto the floor and bounced with a sound like gloing. Ridcully marched over and picked it up, turning it in his hands. Interesting, he said, slamming it towards the floor. It bounced up past his head, but he was quick enough to catch it on the way down. Remarkable, he said. What do you think of this, Stibbons? He flicked the ball into the air and kicked it hard across the room. It came back towards Ponder, who, to his own amazement, caught it. Seems to have a life of its own. Ponder dropped it onto the floor and tried a kick. It flew. Ponder Stibbons was the quintessential all-time holder of the 100-meter note from his auntie, which also asked for him to be excused all sporting activities on account of his athlete's ear erratic stigmatism, a grumbling nose, and a revolving spleen. By his own admission, he would rather run ten miles, leap a five-bar gate, and climb a big hill than engage in any athletic activity. The ball sang to him. It sang, glowing. A few minutes later, he and Ridcully walked back to the Great Hall, occasionally bouncing the ball on the flagstones. There was something about the sound of glowing that made you want to hear it again. You know, Ponda, I think you've been doing it all wrong. There are more things in heaven and disc than are dreamed of in our philosophies. I expect so, sir. I don't have many things in my philosophies. It's all about the ball, said Ridcully, slamming it down hard on the flagstones again and catching it. Tomorrow we'll bring it here and see what happens. You gave the ball a mighty kick, Mr. Stibbons, and yet you are, by your own admission, a wet and a weed. Yes, sir, and a wuss, and I am proud of the appellation. I'd better remind you, Arch-Chancellor, that the thing mustn't spend too long outside the cabinet. Gloing. But we could make a copy, couldn't we? said Ridcully. It's only leather stitched together, probably protecting a bladder of some sort. I bet any decent craftsman could make another one for us. What, now? The lights never go off on the street of cunning artificers. By now, they were back in the great hall, and Ridcully looked around until his gaze lighted on two figures pushing a trolley laden with candles. You lads to me, he shouted. They stopped pushing the trolley and walked over to him. Mr. Stibbons here would like you to run an errand for him. It's of considerable importance. Who are you? Trevor Likely, Gov. Not Arts Chancellor. Ridcully's eyes narrowed. Yes, not, he said, and thought about the spells in his pocket. The candle dribbler, yes. Well, you can make yourselves useful. Over to you, Mr. Stibbons. Ponder Stibbons held out the ball. Have you any idea what this is? Not took it out of his hands and bounced it on the tiles a couple of times. Gloing, gloing. Yes. It appears to be a simple sphere, although technically I believe it to be in actual fact. A truncated icosahedron, made by stitching together a number of pentagons and hexagons of tough leather, and stitching means holes and holes let the air leak. Ah, there is lacing just here, you see. There must be some internal bladder, animal probably, a balloon, as it were, for lightness and elasticity, encapsulated by leather, simple and elegant. He handed the ball back to Ponder, who was open-mouthed. Do you know everything, Mr. Nutt? He said with the sarcasm of a born pedagogue. Nutt's reply was concentrated, and there was a lengthy pause before he said, I'm not sure about a lot of the detail, sir. Ponder heard a snigger behind him and felt himself redden. He'd been cheeked by a dribbler, even if Nutt was the most incontinently erudite one he'd ever encountered. Do you know where a copy of this may be made? said Ridcully loudly. I expect so, said Nut. I believe Dwarf Rubber will be our friend here. There's plenty of dwarfs up at old cobblers who could knock one up, Gov, said Trev. They're good at this sort of thing. 
But they'd want paying. They always want paying. Nothing's on credit when you're dealing with a dwarf. Give these young gentlemen $25, Mr. Stibbins, will you? That's a lot of money, Arts Chancellor. Yes, well, dwarfs, while the salt of the earth, don't have much of a grasp of small numbers, and I want this in a hurry. I'm sure I can trust Mr. Likely and Mr. Nut with the money, can't I? He said it jovially, but there was an edge to his voice. Trev at least got the message very quickly. A wizard could trust you because of the hellish future he could unleash on you if his trust was betrayed. You can certainly trust us, Gov. Yes, I thought I could, said Ridcully. When they had gone, Ponder Stibbins said, You're entrusting them with twenty-five dollars? Yes, indeed, said Ridcully cheerfully. It will be interesting to see the outcome. Nevertheless, sir, I have to say that it was an unwise move. Thank you for your input, Mr. Stibbins, but may I gently remind you, who is the Gov around here? Glenda and Juliet took a trolley bus home. Another huge extravagance, but, of course, Glenda was carrying more money than she had ever seen at one go. She had stuffed the notes into her bodice, a la madame, and it seemed to generate a heat of its own. You were safe on a troll. Anyone wanting to mug a troll would have to use a building on a stick. Juliet was quiet. This puzzled Glenda. She had expected her to bubble like a fountain full of soap flakes. The silence was unnerving. Look, I know it was a lot of fun, Glenda said, but showing off clothes isn't like a real job, is it? No, real jobs pay a lot less, she thought. Where had that come from? Jules hadn't opened her mouth and the troll was still covered in mountain like and not had a single syllable vocabulary. Came from me, she thought. This is about dreams, isn't it? She is a dream. I dare say the micromail is good stuff, but she made it sparkle. And what can I say? You help in the kitchen. You are useful and helpful, at least when you're not daydreaming, but you don't know how to keep accounts or plan a weekly menu. What would you do without me? How would you get on away from here in foreign parts where folks are so odd? I'll have to open a bank account for you, she said aloud. It'll be our little secret, all right? It'll be a nice little nest egg for you. And if Dad don't know I've got the money, he won't get it off me and piss it against the wall, said Juliet, glancing up at the solemn, impassive face of the troll. If Glenda had known how to say, pas devant le troll, she would have done so. But it was true. Mr. Stollop commanded that all family earnings were pooled, with him holding the pool which was then pooled with his friends in the bar of the turkey and vegetables, and ultimately pooled again in the reeking alley behind it. She settled for, I wouldn't put it quite like that. Gloing, gloing. The new ball was magic. That's what it was. It bounced back to Trev's waiting hand as if by its own free will. For two pins he'd risk kicking it, but he and Nut and the ball were already picking up a trail of curious street urchins, such that he would be guaranteed never to see it again. Are you really sure you know how it works? He said to Nut. Oh yes, Mr. Trev, it's a lot simpler than it looks, although the polyhedrons will need some work. But overall... A hand landed on Trev's shoulder. Well now, Trev likely, said Andy. And his little pet. Harder to kill than a cockroach, by all accounts. Something's going on, ain't it, Trev? And you're going to tell me what it is. Here, what's that you're holding? Not today, Andy, said Trev, backing away. You're lucky you didn't end up in the tanty with Mr. One Drop, measuring you up for a hemp collar. Me? said Andy, innocently. I didn't do a thing. Can't blame me for what a thick old stolet does. But something is going on with the football, ain't it? Veterinary wants to muck it about. Just leave it alone where we are, said Trev. There was more than the usual gang behind Andy. The Stollop brothers had sensibly spared the streets their presence lately, but people like Andy could always find followers. Like they said, it was better to be beside Andy than in front of him. And with Andy, you never knew just when he was 
The cutlass was out in one movement. That was Andy. Whatever it was inside that held back the primeval rage could flick off just like that. And here came the blade, with Trev's future written on it in very short words. And it stopped in midair, and Nut's voice said, I believe I could squeeze with enough pressure, Andy, to make your bones grind and flow. There are twenty-seven bones in a human hand. I truly believe I could make every one of them useless with the slightest extra pressure. However, I would like to give you a chance to revise your current intentions. Andy's face was a mix of colours, a white that was almost blue, and a rage that was almost crimson. He was trying to pull away, and Nut stood calmly, and was completely immovable. Game! Andy hissed at the world in general. Could I regretfully remind you, gentlemen, that I have another hand? Said Nut. He must have squeezed, because Andy yelped as his hand ground against the weapon's handle. Trev knew all too well that Andy did not have friends, he had followers. They were looking at their stricken leader, and they were looking at Nut, and they could see very clearly not only that Nut had a spare hand, but what he was capable of doing with it. They did not move. Very well, said Nut. Perhaps this has been nothing more than an unfortunate misunderstanding. I am about to release my grip just enough for you to drop the cutlass, Mr. Andy, please. There was another intake of breath from Andy as the cutlass landed on the stones. Now, if you would excuse us, Mr. Trev and I are going to walk away. Take the bloody cutlass! Don't leave the cutlass on the ground! said Trev. I am sure Mr. Andy would not come after us, said Nut. Are you bloody mad? said Trev. He reached down, snatched up the cutlass and said, Let him go and let's get a move on. Very well, said Nut. He must have squeezed a little harder because now Andy slumped to his knees. Trev pulled Nut away and towed him through the permanent city crowd. That's Andy, he said, hurrying them along. You don't expect logic with Andy. You don't expect him to learn the error of his ways. Don't look for any sense when Andy's after you. Got that? Don't try talking to him as if he's a human being. Now, keep up with me. Dwarf shops were doing well these days, largely because they understood the first rule of merchandising, which is this. I have got goods for sale and the customer has got money. I should have the money, and regrettably that involves the customer having my goods. To this end, therefore, I will not say, the one in the window is the last one we have and we can't sell it to you because if we did, no one would know we have them for sale. Or, we'll probably have some more on Wednesday. Or, we just can't keep them on the shelves. Or, I'm fed up with telling people there's no demand for them. I will make a sale by any means short of physical violence because without one, I am a waste of space. Glang Snorson lived by this rule, but he didn't like people much, an affliction that affects many who have to deal with the general public over a long period, and the two people on the other side of his counter were making him edgy. One was small and looked harmless, but something so deep down in Glang's psyche that it was probably stuffed in his genes was making him nervous. The other intru- <clears throat> customer was not much more than a boy, and therefore likely to commit a crime any moment. Glang dealt with the situation by not understanding anything they said and uttering silly insults in his native tongue. There was hardly a risk. Only the watch learned dwarfish, and it came as a surprise when the worryingly harmless one said, in better Lamedus dwarfish than Glang himself spoke these days, Such incivility to the amiable stranger shames your beard and erases the writings of Tack, ancient merchant. What did you say to him? Trev asked, as Glang spluttered out apologies. Oh, just a traditional greeting, said Nut. Could you pass me the ball, please? He took the football and bounced it on the floor. Gloing! I suspect you might know the trick of making brimstone rubber. That was my... my grandfather's name, Glang stuttered. 
Ah, a good omen, said Trev quickly. He caught the ball and batted it down again. Gloing! I can cut out and stitch the outer cover if you will work on the bladder, said Nut. And we will pay you fifteen dollars and allow you a license to make as many more as you wish. You'll make a fortune, said Trev encouragingly. Gloing, gloing, went the ball, and Trev added, That'd be a university license too. No one would dare mess with it. How come you know about Brimstone's rubber? said Glang. He had the look about him of someone who knows that he is outnumbered but will go down fighting. Because King Reese of the Dwarfs presented a dress of brimstone rubber and leather to Lady Margolotta six months ago, and I am pretty sure I understand the principle. Huh? The Dark Lady? She can kill people with a thought. She is my friend, said Nut calmly. And I will help you. Glenda wasn't quite sure why she tipped the troll tuppence. He was elderly and slow, but his upholstery was well kept and he had twin umbrellas and it was no fun for trolls to come this far because the kid gangs would have graffitied them to the waist by the time they got out of there. She felt hidden eyes on her as she walked up to her door. And it didn't matter. All right, she said to Juliet. Have a night off, okay? I'll go back to work with you, said Juliet to her surprise. We need the money. And I can't tell Dad about the fifty dollars, can I? There was a small collision of expectations in Glenda's head as Juliet went on. You're right. It's a steady job, and I want to keep it, and I'm so thick I'll probably muck up the other one. I mean, it was fun and all that, but then I thought, well, you always gave me good advice, and I remembered that time you kicked Greasy Damien and the Ghoulies so hard when he was messing me around. He walked bent double for a week. Besides, if I go away with them, it means leaving the street and Dad and the lads. That's really scary. And you said be careful about fairy stories. And you're right, half the time it's goblins. And I don't know how I'd get on without you putting me right. You are solid, you are. I can't remember you not being around, and when one of the girls sniggered about your old coat, I told her, you work very hard. Glenda thought, I used to be able to read you like a book, one with big colourful pages and not many words, and now I can't. What's happening? You're agreeing with me, and I ought to feel smug about it, but I don't. I feel bad about it, and I don't know why. And that hurts. Maybe you ought to sleep on it, she suggested. No, I'd mess it up, I know I would. Do you feel all right? Something inside Glenda was shouting at her. I'm okay, said Juliet. Oh, it was fun and that, but it's for knobby girls, not me. It's all glitter, nothing you can hold. But a pie's a pie, right? Solid. Besides, who'd look after Dad and the lads? No, 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 screamed Glenda's voice in her own head. Not that. I didn't want that. Oh, didn't I? Then what did I think I was doing, passing on all that old toot? She looks to me, and I've gone and given her a good example. Why? Because I wanted to protect her. She's so vulnerable. Oh, dear. I've taught her to be me. And I've even made a bad mess of that, sure. All right, then. You can head back with me. Will we see the banquet? Our dad has been fretting about the banquet. He reckons Lord Vetinari is going to have everyone murdered. Does he do that a lot? Yes, but it gets hushed up, our dad says. There's going to be hundreds of people there. That would need a lot of hush. And if I don't like what I hear... There won't be enough hush in all the world, she thought. Trev mooched aimlessly around the shop, while Nut and the dwarf put their heads together over the ball. For some reason, there was a faint scrabbling on the roof. It sounded like claws. Just a bird, he told himself. Even Andy wouldn't come in through the roof. There was another pressing matter. This place would have a privy, wouldn't it? 
There was at least a back door, and that would inevitably lead to a back alley, and, well, what is a back alley for, except for sleeping tramps and the call of nature? Possibly in the same place if you were feeling cruel. Trev unbuckled his belt, faced a noisome wall, and stared upwards nonchalantly, as a man does in these circumstances. However, most men don't look up into the astonished faces of two bird-like women who were standing, no, perching, on the roof. They screeched, ark, ark, and flew up into the darkness. Trev scuttled quickly and damply back into the shop. This city got bloody stranger every day. After that, time flew past for Trev, and every second stank of sulphur. He'd seen not dribbling candles, but that was at snail's pace compared with the speed at which the leather was cut for the ball. But that wasn't creepy, that was just not. What was creepy was that he didn't measure anything. Eventually, Trev couldn't stand it any more, and stopped leaning against the wall, pointed to one of the multi-sided leather strips, and said, How long is that? One and fifteen sixteenths of an inch. How can you tell without measuring? I do measure. With my eyes, it is a skill. It can be learned. And that makes you worthy? Yes. And who judges? I do. Here we are, Mr. Nutt, still warm, said Glang, arriving from the back of the shop, holding something that looked like something taken from an animal that was now, you hoped for its own sake, dead. Of course, I could do a lot better with more time, he continued. But if you blow down this little tube... Trev watched in wonder, and it occurred to him that in all his life he'd made a few candles and a lot of mess. How much was he worth? Gloing, gloing. Two balls in harmony, thought Trev, but clapped as Nut and Glang shook hands. Then, while they were still admiring their handiwork, he reached behind him and slipped a dagger off the bench and into his pocket. He wasn't a thief. Oh, fruit off stalls, but everyone knew that didn't count. And picking a toff's pocket was just a case of social redistribution. Everyone knew that too. And maybe you found something that looked lost. Well, someone would pick it up, so why not you? Weapons got you killed, often because you were holding one. But things were going too far. He had heard Andy's bones creak, and Nut had brought the man to his knees without sweating and there were two reasons for taking precautions right there. One was that if you put Andy down, you'd better put him out, right out, because he would come back, blood around the corner of his mouth. And two, the worst, was that right now, Nut was more worrying than Andy. At least he knew what Andy was. Carrying a ball each, they hurried back to the university, with Trev keeping a watchful eye on high buildings. It's amazing what's turning up in this city, he said. There were a couple of vampire types back there, did you know? Oh, those. They work for ladyship. They are there for protection. Who's? said Trev. Do not worry about them. Ha! And do you know something even stranger has happened this evening? said Trev, as the university hove into sight. You offered that dwarf fifteen dollars, and he didn't even haggle. Like... That's unheard of. Must be the power of glowing. Yes, but I actually gave him twenty dollars, said Nut. Why? He didn't ask for anything more. No, but he did work very hard, and the extra five dollars will more than repay him for the dagger you stole while our backs were turned. I never did, said Trev hotly. Your automatic, unthinking and spring-loaded reply is noted, Mr. Trev as was the sight of the dagger on the bench, shortly followed by the sight of the empty space where the dagger had been. I am not angry, because I saw you most sensibly toss Mr. Shank's wretched cutlass over a wall, and I understand your nervousness, but nevertheless I must point out that this is stealing. And so I ask you, as my friend, to take the dagger back in the morning. But that will leave him up by five dollars and his dagger back, Trev sighed. Well, at least we've got a few dollars each, he said, as they entered the back door of the university.
Yes, and then again, no, Mr. Trev. You will take the remaining five dollars and this rather grubby, although genuine receipt for twenty dollars to Mr. Stibbins, who thinks you are no good, thus making him doubt his original assumption that you are a thief and a scallywag and assisting your progress in this university. I'm not a... Trev began and stopped, honest enough to acknowledge the knife in his coat. Honestly, Nut, you're one of a kind, you are. Yes, said Nut. I am coming to that conclusion. Watcher! The word, in huge type, shouted out from the front page of the Times, next to a big picture of Juliet glittering in micromail and smiling right at the reader. Glenda, frozen for the last fifteen seconds in the act of raising a piece of toast to her mouth, finally bit. Now she blinked and dropped the toast to read. Mystery Model Jules was the toast of an astounding fashion show at Shatty yesterday when she was the very incarnation of Micromail. The remarkable metal cloth about which there has been so much speculation in recent months and which, she confirms, does not chafe. She chatted happily and with fetching straightforward earthiness to dignitaries to whom, this writer is certain, no one has ever heard said washer before. They appeared to find the experience refreshing and entirely without chafe. Glenda stopped reading at this point because the question, how much trouble are we going to get into about this, was attempting to fill her whole head. And there was no trouble, was there? And there would not be. There couldn't be. First, who would think that the beauty in the silver beard, like some goddess of the forge, was a cook's assistant? And second, there was no trouble to be had unless someone tried to make it, in which case they would have to go through Glenda, and Glenda would go through them in very short order. Because Jules was wonderful, she had to admit it. The girl brought radiant sunshine to the page, and suddenly it was plain. It would be a crime to hide all that grace and beauty in a cellar. So what if she had a vocabulary of fewer than seven hundred words? There were more than enough people who were stuffed tight as an egg with words, and who would want to see any of them on the front page? Anyway, she thought, as she pulled her coat on, it would be a nine-minute wonder in any case, and besides, she added to herself, it wasn't as if anyone would spot it was Juliet. After all, she was wearing a beard, and that was amazing, because there was no way that a woman in a beard should look attractive. But it worked. Imagine that catching on. You'd have to spend twice as long at the hairdressers. Someone's going to think about that, she thought. There was no sign from the Stollop's house. She wasn't surprised. Juliet did not have much grasp of the idea of punctuality. Glenda popped next door to see how the widow Crowdy was, and then headed, in the drizzling rain, back to her safe haven of the night kitchen. Halfway there, an all-but-forgotten pressure in her bodice reminded her of her duty, and she dared go into the royal bank of Angmore Pork. Trembling with fear and defiance, she walked up to a clerk at his desk, slapped fifty warm dollars in front of him, and said, I want to start a bank account, all right? She left five minutes later with a shiny account book and the delightful recollection that a posh-looking man at a posh-looking desk in a posh-looking building had called her Madam, and enjoyed the sensation until it ran into the reality that Madam had better roll up her sleeves and get to work. There was a lot to do. She made pies at least a day ahead so that they could mature, and Mr. Nutt's appetite last night had put quite a large dent in her pantry but at least there wouldn't be much demand for pies tomorrow night. Even the wizards didn't call for a pie after a banquet. Ah, yes, the banquet, she thought, as the rain started to soak into her coat. The banquet. She would have to see about the banquet. Sometimes if you wanted to go to the ball, you had to be your own fairy godmother. There were several obstacles requiring the touch of a magic wand. Mrs. Whitlow did indeed operate a certain kind of apartheid between the night and day kitchens, as if one flight of stairs actually changed who you were. The next difficulty was that Glenda did not have, according to the traditions of the university, 
the right kind of figure to serve at table, at least when there were visitors, and, lastly, Glenda did not have the temperament for serving at table. It wasn't that she didn't know how to smile. She was quite capable of smiling, if you gave her enough warning. But she positively hated having to smile at people who actually merited, instead, a flick around the ear hole with a napkin. She hated taking away plates of unfinished food. She always had to suppress a tendency to say things like, Why did you put it on your plate if you didn't intend to finish it? And, Look, you've left more than half of it and it cost a dollar a pound. And, Of course it's cold, but that's because you've been playing footsie with the young lady opposite and haven't been concentrating on your dinner. And when all else failed, There's little children in clutch, you know. It was a phrase of her mother's, but she'd obviously missed some significant part of it. She hated waste, she thought to herself, as she walked along the stone corridor towards the night kitchen. There never needed to be any if you knew your way around a kitchen, and if your diners had the decency to take your food seriously. She was rambling to herself. She knew that. Occasionally, she would pull the front page of the Times out of her bag and take a look at it again. It had all really happened, and there was the proof. But it was a funny thing. Every day something happened that was important enough to be on the front page of the newspaper. She'd never bought it and seen a little sign that said, Not much happened yesterday, sorry about that. And tomorrow, wonderful though that picture was, it would be wrapping up fish and chips and everyone would have forgotten about it. That would be a load off her mind. There was a polite cough. She recognized it as belonging to Nut, who had the politest cough there could possibly be. Yes, Mr. Nut? Mr. Trevor sent me with this letter for Miss Juliet, Miss Glenda, said Nut, who had apparently been waiting by the steps. He held it out as if it were some double-edged sword. She's not come in yet, I'm afraid, said Glenda, as Nut followed her up the steps. But I'll put it on the shelf over here where she'll be bound to see it. She looked at Nut and saw his eyes firmly fixed on the pie racks. Oh, and I do seem to have made one apple pie more than called for. I wonder if you could assist me by removing it from the premises? He gave her a grateful smile, took the pie and hurried away. Alone again, Glenda looked at the envelope. It was the cheapest sort, the kind that looked as if it had been made from recycled lavatory paper. And somehow, it seemed to have got a bit bigger. Inexplicably, she found herself recalling that the gum on those envelopes was so bad that when it came to sealing them, it was probably better to just have a very bad cold. Anyone could simply open it up, see what it said, dig out a bit of earwax, and no one would be any the wiser. But that would have been a very bad thing to do. Glenda thought that same thought fifteen times before Juliet walked into the night kitchen, hung up her coat on the hook, and put on her apron. There was a man on the bus reading the paper, and it had a picture of me on the front, she said excitedly. Glenda nodded and handed over her own paper. Well, I suppose it's me, said Juliet, with her head on one side. What should we do now? Open the damn letter, shouted Glenda. What? said Juliet. Uh, oh, uh, Trev sent you a letter, said Glenda. She snatched it from the shelf and held it out. Why don't you read it right now? He's probably just mucking about. No, why don't you just read it right now? I haven't tried to open it. Juliet took the envelope. It opened more or less to a touch. Glenda's evil side thought, hardly any gum at all. I could have just flicked it open. I can't read with you standing so close, said Juliet. After some time moving her lips, she went on. I don't get it. It's all kind of long words. Lovely curly writing, though. It's a bit here saying that I look like a summer's day. What's that all about, then? She pressed it into Glenda's hand. Can you read it for me, Glendy? You know I'm not good at complicated words. Well, I'm a bit busy, said Glenda. But since you ask. First time I've ever had a letter that's not all in capitals, said Juliet. Glenda sat down and started to read. A lifetime of what even she would call bad romantic novels suddenly bore fruit. It read as though someone had turned on the poetry tap 
and then absent-mindedly gone on holiday. But there were wonderful words, nevertheless. There was the word swain, for example, which was a definite marker, and quite a lot about flowers, and quite a lot of what looked like pleading, wrapped up in fancy letters. And after a while, she took out her handkerchief and fanned the air around her face. So, what's it all about? said Juliet. Glenda sighed. Hard to begin. How did you talk to Juliet about similes and metaphors and poetic license all wrapped up in wonderful curly writing? She did her best. Well, basically, he's saying that he really fancies you, thinks you're really fit. How about a date? No hanky-panky, he promises. And there's three little X's underneath. Juliet started to cry. <laughs> That's lovely. <laughs> Fancy him sitting down and writing all those words just for me. Real poetry, just for me. I'm going to sleep with it under my pillow. Yes, I suspect that he had something like that in mind, said Glenda, and thought, Trev likely a poet. Not likely at all. There was a dreadful load on Pepe's bladder and he was stuck between a rock and a hard place, if that wasn't too offensive a description of lying between madam and a wall. She was still asleep. She snored magnificently, using the traditional multi-part snore, known to those who are fortunate enough to have to listen to it every night as the (coughs) symphony. And she was lying on his leg, and the room was pitch dark. He managed to retrieve his leg, half of which had gone to sleep, and set out on the well-known search for porcelain, which began by him putting his foot down on an empty champagne bottle, which skittered away and left him flat on his back. In the gloom, he groped for it, found it, tested it for true emptiness, because you never knew your luck, and, as it were, filled it again, putting it down on what was probably a table, but in his mind and the darkness, could just as well have been an armadillo. There was another sound syncopating with Madame's virtuoso performance. It must have been that which woke him. By grouping, he located his shorts, and after only three tries, managed to get them the right way up and the right way around. They were a little chilly. That was the problem with micromail. It was, after all, metal. On the other hand, it did not chiff, and you never had to wash it. Five minutes on the fire, and it was as hygienic as anything. Besides, Pepe's version of the shorts held a surprise all of their own. Thus, feeling that he could face the world, or at least the part of it that would need to see only the top of him, he shuffled and stubbed his way to the shop's door, checking every bottle along the way for evidence of liquid content. Remarkably, a bottle of port had survived with 50% remaining capacity. Any port in a storm, he thought, and drank his breakfast. The shop's door was rattling. It had a small sliding aperture by which the staff could determine whether they wanted to let a prospective customer in, because when you're a posh shop like Shatta, you don't sell things to just anyone. Pairs of eyeballs zigzagged back and forth across his vision as people clustered on the other side of the door and fought for attention. Somebody said, We're here to see jewels. She's resting, said Pepe. That was always a good line, and could mean anything. Have you seen the picture in the Times? said a voice. Then, look, as a vision of Juliet was held up in front of the door. Blimey, he said to himself. She's had a very tiring day, he said. The public wants to know all about her, said a sterner voice. And a rather less aggressive female voice said, She seems to be rather amazing. She is, she is, said Pepe, inventing desperately, but a very private person, and a bit artistic too, if you know what I mean. Well, I've got a big order to place, said yet another voice as the owner managed to shuffle for slot space. Oh, well, we don't have to wake her up for that. Just give me a moment and I'll be right with you. He took another swig of the port. When he turned around, Madame, in a nightshirt that could have accommodated a platoon, at least if they were very friendly, 
was bearing down on him with a glass in one hand and the champagne bottle in the other. This stuff's gone horribly flat, she said. I'll go and find some fresh, he replied, snatching it from her quickly. We've got newspaper people and customers out there, and they all want jewels. Can you remember where she lives? I'm sure she told me, said Madame, but it all seems a long time ago. That other one, Glenda, I think, works at some big place in the city as a cook. Anyway, why do they want to see her? There's a wonderful picture in the Times, said Pepe. You know when you said you thought we'd get rich? Well, it looks like you weren't thinking big enough. What do you suggest, dear? Me, said Pepe. Take the order, because that's good business, and tell the others that Jules will see them later. Do you think they'll go for that? They'll have to, because we don't know where the hell she is. There's a million dollars walking around this city on legs. Reese, low king of the dwarfs, paid particular attention to the picture of the wonderful girl. The definition wasn't too bad at all. The technique of translating the clax semaphore signal into a black and white picture was quite well advanced these days. Even so, his people in Ankh-Morpork must have thought this particularly interesting to merit the expense of the bandwidth required. Certainly, it was exercised in a lot of other dwarfs, but in the Low King's experience, it was possible to find someone, somewhere, who objected to anything. He looked at the grags in front of him. So simple for people like Vetinari, he thought. He just has religions to deal with. We don't have religions. Being a dwarf is a religion in itself, and no two priests ever agree. And sometimes it seems that every other dwarf is a priest. I see nothing here to disturb me, he said. We uh, believe the beard to be a false one, said one of the grags. That is perfectly acceptable, said the king. There's absolutely nothing in any precedent that bans false beards. They are a great salvation to those who find beards hard to grow. But she looks, well, alluring, said one of the other grags. They were indistinguishable under their tall, pointed leather cowls. Attractive, certainly, said the king. Gentlemen, is this going to take long? It must be stopped. It's not dwarfish. Oh, but it manifestly is, is it not? said the king. Micro male is one hundred percent male, and you don't get any more dwarfish than that. She is smiling, and while I would agree that dwarves do not appear to smile very much, certainly not when they come to see me, I think we could profit from her example. It's uh, positively an offence against morality. How? Where? Only in your heads, I feel. The tallest Grag said, So you intend to do nothing? The king paused for a moment, staring at the ceiling. No, I intend to do something, he said. First of all, I shall see to it that my staff find out just how many orders there have been from Micromail originating from here in Bonk today. I'm sure Shatter would not object to them seeing their records, especially since I intend to tell Madame Shan that she can come back and establish her premises here. You would do that? said a grag. Yes, of course. We have nearly concluded the Coombe Valley Accord, a peace with the trolls that no one ever thought they would see. And I am fed up, gentlemen with your whining, moaning, and endless, endless attempts to refight battles that you have already lost. As far as I'm concerned, this young lady is showing us a better future, and now, if you are not out of my office in ten seconds, I will charge you rent. There will be trouble over this, gentlemen. There is always trouble. But this time, I will be making it for you. As the door slammed shut behind them, the king sat back in his chair. Well done, sir, 
said his secretary. They'll keep on. I can't imagine what being a dwarf would be like if we didn't argue all the time. He squirmed a little in his chair. You know, they're right when they say it doesn't chafe. And it's not as cold as you would imagine. Do ask our agent to express my thanks to Madame Shan for her generous gift, will you? Even this early in the day, the Great Hall of the University was a general thoroughfare. Most of the tables were pushed back against the walls, or, if someone felt like showing off, levitated to the ceiling, and the huge black and white slabs of the floor, worn smooth by the footfalls of millennia, were polished still further as today's faculty and students took a shortcut to various concerns, destinations, and very occasionally, when no viable excuse presented itself, to lectures. The great chandelier had been swung down and off to one side for its daily replenishing of candles, but there was, fortunately for Mustram Ridcully's purposes, a large expanse of clear floor. He saw the figure he was waiting for hurrying towards him. How did it go, Mr. Stibbins? Extremely well, I have to say, sir, said Ponder. He opened the sack he was carrying. One of these is our original ball, and one of them is the ball that Nut and Trevor Lightly had made last night. Ah, spot the ball, said Red Cully. He picked them up in his enormous hands and dropped them on the flagstones. Glowing, glowing. Perfectly identical, he said. Trevor Lightly said they had it made by a dwarf for twenty dollars, said Ponder. Did he really? Yes, sir, and he gave me the change. And the receipt. You seem puzzled, Mr. Stibbins. Well, yes, sir. I feel I have been rather misjudging him. Possibly even small leopards can change their shorts, said Ridicully, slamming him on the back convivially. Call it score one for human nature. Now, which of these balls is the one that's going back to the cabinet? Amazingly, sir, they did think to mark the new ball. And there's a tiny little dot of white paint on this one here. I mean, this one here. I think it was here. Ah, here it is. It's ours. I'll send one of the students to put the other one back shortly. We still have an hour and a half. No, I'd rather you did it yourself, Mr. Stibbins. I'm sure it would only take a few minutes. Do hurry back. I'd like to try a little experiment. When Ponder returned, he found Ridcully loitering unobtrusively by one of the big doors. You have your notebook ready, Mr. Stibbins, he said quietly. And a fresh pencil, Arch-Chancellor. Very well, then. The experiment begins. Ridcully gently rolled the new football out onto the floor, straightened up, and glanced at his stopwatch. Ah, the ball has been kicked aside by the Professor of Illiberal Studies. Quite possibly by accident. Now one of the Bledlows, Mr. Hippany, I think his name is, has kicked it somewhat uncertainly. One of the students, Pond Life, I believe, has prodded it back. Ah, oh, we have momentum, Mr. Stibbins. Undirected, it is true, but promising. Ah, but we can't have this. No touching that ball with your hands, gentlemen, shouted the Arch-Chancellor, deftly trapping the travelling ball with his boot. That's a rule. We really could do with that whistle, Stibbins. He bounced the ball on the stone floor. Cloing. Don't just mess about like kids kicking a tin. Play football. I am the Arch-Chancellor of this university by Io, and I will rusticate or otherwise expel any man who skives off without a note from his mother. Ha! Cloing. You will arrange yourself into two teams, set up goals, and strive to win. No man will leave the field of play unless injured. The hands are not to be used. Is that clear? Any questions? A hand went up. Ridcully sought the attached face. Ah, Rincewind, he said, and because he was not a determinedly unpleasant man, amended this to... Uh, Professor Rincewind, of course. I... Would like permission to fetch a note from my mother, sir. Ridcully sighed. Rincewind, you once informed me, to my everlasting puzzlement, that you never knew your mother because she ran away before you were born. 
distinctly remember writing it down in my diary. Would you like another try? A permission to go and find my mother? Ridcully hesitated. The professor of cruel and unusual geography had no students and no real duties other than to stay out of trouble. Although Ridcully would never admit it, it was against all reason an emeritus position. Rincewind was a coward and an unwitting clown, but he had several times saved the world in slightly puzzling circumstances. He was a luck sink, the Arch-Chancellor had decided, doomed to being a lightning rod for the fates so that everyone else didn't have to. Such a person was worth all his meals and laundry, including an above-average level of soiled pants, and a bucket of coal every day, even if he was, in Ridcully's opinion, a bit of a whiner. However, he was fast, and therefore useful. Look, said Rincewind, a mysterious urn turns up and suddenly it's all about football. That bodes. It means something bad is going to happen. Come now, it could be something wonderful, Ridcully protested. Rincewind appeared to give this due consideration. Could be wonderful, will be dreadful. Sorry, that's how it goes. This is unseen university, Rincewind. What is there to fear? Ridcully said. Apart from me, of course. Good heavens, this is a sport. He raised his voice. Arrange yourselves into two teams and play football. He stepped back and joined Ponder. The dragooned footballers, having been given clear instructions in a loud voice, went into a huddle to find out by hubbub what they should actually do instead. I can't believe this, said Ridcully. Every boy knows what to do when they've found something to kick, don't they? He cupped his hands. Come on, two captains, step up. I don't care who it is. This took rather more time than might have been expected, since those who had not surreptitiously left the hall could see that the post of football captain was one that offered a wonderful chance for being the target of the Arch-Chancellor's mercurial wrath. Eventually, two sacrifices were pushed forward and found it too difficult to push their way back into the ranks again. Now, I say again, pick the teams alternately. He took off his hat and flung it to the ground. Now, we all understand this. It's a boy thing. It's like little girls and the colour pink. You know how to do this. Pick the teams alternately, so one of you ends up with the weird kid and the other with the fat kid. Some of the fastest mathematics of all time has been achieved by team captains trying not to end up with the weird kid. Stay where you are, Rincewind. Ponder gave an involuntary shudder as his school days came running back, jeering at him. The fat kid in his class had been the unfortunately named Piggy Love, whose father owned a sweet shop, which gave the son some wit in the community, not to mention clout. That had left only the weird kid as the natural target for the other boys, which meant a chronic hell for Ponder, until that wonderful day when sparks came out of Ponder's fingers and Martin Sauger's pants caught fire. He could smell them now. Best days of your life be buggered. The Arch-Chancellor could be a bit crass and difficult at times, but at least he wasn't allowed to give you a wedgie. Are you listening to me, Stibbons? Ponder blinked. Uh, sorry, sir, I was calculating. I said, who's the tall fella with the tan and the dinky beard? That's Professor Bengo Macarona, Arch-Chancellor, from Genua, remember? He swapped with Professor Maidenhair for a year. Oh, right, poor old Maidenhair. Perhaps he won't get laughed at so much in a foreign language. And Mr. Macarona's here to better himself, yes? Put a bit of polish on his career, no doubt? Hardly, sir. He's got doctorates from Anki, QIS, and Chubb, thirteen in all, and a visiting professorship at Buggerup. And he has been cited in 236 papers and, uh, one divorce petition. What? The rule about celibacy isn't taken seriously over there, sir. Very hot-blooded people, I understand, of course. His family owns a huge ranch and the biggest coffee plantation outside Clatch. And I think his grandmother owns the Macarona Shipping Company. So why the hell did he come here? He wants to work with the best, sir, said Ponder. I think he's serious. Really? Well, he, he seems like a sensible chap, then. Uh, 
the divorce thing? Don't know much, sir. It got hushed up, I believe. Angry husband? Angry wife, as I heard it, said Ponder. Oh, he was married, was he? Not to my knowledge, Arch-Chancellor. I don't think I quite understand, said Ritcully. Ponder, who was not at all at home in this area, said very slowly, She was the wife of another man, I, uh, believe, sir. But I... To Ponder's relief, light dawned on Ridcully's huge fierce. Oh, you mean he was like Professor Hayden? <gasps> we used to have a name for him, Ponder braced himself. Snakes! Very keen on them, you know. Could talk for hours about snakes with a side order of lizards. Very keen. I'm glad you feel like that, Arch-Chancellor, because I know that a number of the students... And then there was old Postule, who was in the rowing team. Coxed us through two wonderful years. Ponder's expression did not change, but for a few moments his face went pink and shiny. A lot of that sort of thing about, apparently, said Ridcully. People make such a fuss. Anyway, in my opinion, there's not enough love in the world. Besides... If you didn't like the company of men, you wouldn't come here in the first place. Ah, oh, say, well done, that man! That was because, in the absence of Ridcully's attention, the footballers had at last started their own kickabout, and some quite fancy footwork was emerging. Yes, what? A Bledlow had appeared alongside Ridcully. Gentlemen to see the Arch-Chancellor, sir. He's a wizard, sir. The, uh, the dean, as was... Only he says he's an arch-chancellor, too. Ridcully hesitated. But you'd have had to be an experienced Ridcully watcher, like Ponder, to notice the moment. When the arch-chancellor spoke, it was calmly and carefully, every word hammered on the anvil of self-control. What a pleasant surprise, Mr. Nobbs. Do show the dean in. Oh, and please do not glance at Mr. Stibbins for confirmation, thank you. I am still the Arts Chancellor in these parts. The only one, in fact, is there a problem, Mr. Stibbins? Well, sir, it is a bit public in here. Ponder stopped, because suddenly he had nobody's attention. He hadn't seen the ball bounce towards Bledlow Knobs, no relation, nor the vicious kick the latter gave it just as he would an impertinent intrusion by a street urchin's tin can. Ponder did see the ball curving majestically through the air, heading for the other end of the hall where, behind the organ, rose the stained-glass window dedicated to Arch-Chancellor Abasti, which, on a daily basis, showed one of several thousand scenes of a mystical or spiritual nature. The intuition with which Ponder had successfully calculated the distance and trajectory of the ball told him that the current glowing picture of Bishop Horn realizing that the alligator quiche was an unwise choice had appeared just in time to be extremely unlucky. And then, like some new planet swimming into the can of a watcher of the skies, as they are prone to do, a rusty red ship arose, unfolding as it came, snatched the ball out of the air, and landed on the organ keyboard to the sound of Gloin in B-flat. Well done, that ape, the Arch-Chancellor boomed. A beautiful save, but regrettably against the rules. To Ponder's surprise, there was a murmur of dissent from all the players. I believe that decision may benefit from some consideration, said a small voice behind them. Who said that? said Ridcully, spinning round and looking into the suddenly terrified little eyes of Nut. Nut, sir, the candle dribbler. We met yesterday. I helped you with the ball. Are you telling me I'm wrong? Are you? I would rather you thought of me as suggesting a way in which you could be even more right. Ridcully opened his mouth and then shut it again. I know what he is, he thought. Does he? Or did they spare him that? Very well, Mr. Nutt. Is there a point you wish to make? Yes, sir. What is the purpose of this game? To win, of course. Indeed, regrettably, it is not being played that way. It isn't? No, sir. The players all want to kick the ball. And so they should, surely, said Ridcully. Only if you believe the purpose of the game 
is healthy exercise, sir. Do you play chess? Well, I have done. And would you have thought it proper for all the pawns to swarm up the board in the hope of checkmating the king? For a moment, Ridcully had a mental vision of Lord Vetinari holding aloft a solitary pawn and saying what it might become. Oh, come now, that is quite different, he burst out. Yes, but the skill lies in marshalling resources in the right way. Ridcully saw a face appear behind Nat, like a rising moon of wrath. You don't talk to the gentlemen, Nat. It's not your place to take up their time with your chatter. Ridcully writhed in sympathy with Nut, all the more so because Smeems, as is the habit of such people, kept looking at the Arch-Chancellor as if seeking and, worse, expecting approval of this petty tyranny. But authority must back up authority, in public at least, otherwise there is no authority and therefore the senior authority is forced to back up the junior authority, even if he, the senior authority, believes that the junior authority is a tiresome little tit. Thank you for your concern, Mr. Smeems, he said. But in fact, I asked Mr. Nutt his opinion of our little kickabout, since it is the game of the people, and he is rather more people than I am. I will not keep him long from his duties, Mr. Smeems, nor you from yours, which I know are both vital and pressing. Small, insecure authority can spot, if it is sensible, when a larger authority is giving it a chance to save face. Right you are, sir, said Smeems, after only a second's hesitation, and he scurried off to safety. The thing called Nut appeared to be trembling. He thinks he's done something wrong. Ridcully thought, and I shouldn't think of him as a thing. Some wizard's sense made him look round into the face of... What was the lad's name? Trevor Likely. Do you have anything else to add, Mr. Likely? Only I'm a bit busy at the moment. I gave Mr. Stibbins the change and the receipt, said Trevor. What is it you do around here, young man? I run the candle vats, Gov. Oh, do you? We're getting some very good dribbling from you fellows these days. Trev appeared to let this pass. Mr. Nutt is not in any trouble, is he, Gov? Not to my knowledge. But what do I know? Ridcully asked himself. Mr. Nutt, by definition, is trouble. But the librarian says he potters about repairing things and is generally an amiable milksop, and he talks as though he's giving a lecture. You didn't get anywhere at Unseen University without being able to understand the vast number of meanings that can be carried by the word ook. This little man, who actually, when you look at him, is not as little as he appears, because he wears himself down with humility. This little man was born with a name so fearsome some peasants chained him to an anvil because they were too scared to kill him. Perhaps Vetinari and his friends are right, in their smug way, and a leopard can change his shorts. I hope so, because if they aren't, a leopard will be a picnic. And any minute now, the Dean is coming. Damn his treacherous hide. Only, he's my friend, Gov. Well, that's good. Everyone should have a friend. I'm not going to let anyone touch him, Gov. A brave ambition, young man, if I may say so. Nevertheless, Mr. Nutt, why did you object when I pointed out that the librarian, wonderful though his rising save was, was an infringement of the rules? Nutt didn't look up, but in a small voice said, It was elegant. It was beautiful. The game should be beautiful, like a well-executed war. Oh, I don't think many people would say that war is very jolly, said Ridcully. Beauty can be considered to be neutral, sir. It is not the same as nice or good. I thought it was the same as truth, though, said Ponder, trying to keep up. Which is often horrible, sir. But Mr. Librarian's leap was both beautiful, sir, and good, sir, and therefore must be true, and therefore the rule which should prevent him from doing it again would be proved to be neither beautiful nor true, and would, indeed, be a false law. That's right, Gav, said Trev. 
people will shout for that stuff. Do you mean that they cheer for a goal not achieved? said Ponder. Of course they will, and groan. It's something happening, Ridley snorted. You saw the game the other day. If you were lucky, you got a glimpse of a lot of large grubby men fighting over a ball like a lump of wood. People want to see goals scored. And saved, remember? Trev pointed out. Exactly, young man, agreed Ridcully. It must be a game of speed. This is the year of the pensive hair, after all. People get bored so easily. No wonder there are fights we need, do we not, to make a sport that is more exciting than beating other people over the head with big weapons. That one's always been very popular, said Ponder doubtfully. Well, we are wizards after all. And now I must go and greet the bloody the so-called Arch-Chancellor of Blazes and Neck, so-called College in the correct damn spirit of fraternal goodwill. So-called, murmured Ponder, not quite softly enough. What say? The Arch-Chancellor bellowed. Just wondering what you want me to do, Arch-Chancellor. Do? Keep him playing. See who's good at it. Work out what the most beautiful rules are, Ridcully called out, heading out of the hall at speed. By myself, said Ponder, horrified. I've got a huge workload. Delegate! You know I'm hopeless at delegating, sir. Then delegate the job of delegating to someone who isn't. Now, I must be off before he steals the silverware. It was very rare for Glenda to take time off. Being the head of the night kitchen was a mental state, not a physical one. The only meal she ever ate at home was breakfast, and that was always in a hurry. But now she'd stolen some time to sell the dream. May Hedges was looking after the kitchen, and she was reliable and got on with everyone, and so there were no worries there. The sun had come out, and now she knocked on the rear door of Mr. Strong in the Arms' workshop. The dwarf opened the door with rouge all over his fingers. Oh, hello, Glenda. How's it going? She thumped a wad of orders on the table proudly and opened the suitcase. It was empty. And I need a lot more samples, she said. Oh, that's wonderful, said the dwarf. When did you get these? This morning. It had been easy. Door after door seemed to have opened for her, and every time a little voice in her head said, Are you doing the right thing? A slightly deeper voice, which sounded remarkably like Madame Sharn, said, He wants to make it. You want to sell it. They want to buy it. The dream goes round and round, and so does the money. The lipstick went down very well, she said. Those troll girls put it on with a trowel, and I'm not kidding. So what you ought to do, sir, is sell a trowel. A pretty one in a nice box with sprinkles on it. He gave her an admiring look. This isn't like you, Glenda. Not sure about that, said Glenda, as more samples were dropped into the battered case. Have you thought about getting into shoes? Do you think it would be worth a try? They don't normally wear shoes. They didn't wear lipstick until they moved here, said Glenda. It could be the coming thing. But they've got feet like granite. They don't need shoes. But they'll want them, said Glenda. You could be in on the ground floor, as it were. Strong in the arm looked puzzled, and Glenda remembered that even city dwarfs were used to the topsy-turvy language of home. Oh, sorry, I meant to say the top floor. And then there's dresses, said Glenda. I've been looking around and no one makes proper dresses for trolls. They're just outsized human dresses, and they're cut to make the troll look smaller, but they'd be better if they were cut to make them look bigger. More like a troll and less like a fat human. You know, you want the clothing to shout, I'm a great big troll lady and proud of it. Have you been hit on the head with something? said Strong in the arm. Because if so, I'd like it to drop on me. Well, it's spreading the dream, isn't it? said Glenda, carefully arranging the samples in her suitcase. It's a bit more important than I thought. She made 14 more successful calls before calling it a day. 
posted the orders through Strong in the Arms letterbox, and, with a light case and uncharacteristically light heart, went back to work. Ridgully turned the corner, and there, right in front of him, was... His mind spun as it sought for the correct mode of address. Art's Chancellor was out of the question. Dean? Too obvious an insult. Two chairs, ditto, with knobs on. And ungrateful, backstabbing, slimy bastard took too long to say. What the hell was the bastard's name? Great heavens, they'd been friends since their first day at UU. Henry! He exploded. What a pleasant surprise! What brings you here to our miserable and sadly out-of-date little university? Oh, come now, Mustrum. When I left, the lads were pushing back the boundaries of knowledge. It's been a bit quiet since, I gather. By the way, this is Professor Turnipseed. There appeared from behind the self-styled Arch-Chancellor of Brazen Neck, like a moonlit moving out of the shadow of a gas giant, a sheepish young man who instantly reminded Ridcully of Ponder Stibbins, although for the life of him he couldn't make out why. Perhaps it was the look of someone permanently doing sums in his head, and not just proper sums either, but the sneaky sort with letters in them. Oh, well... You know how it is with boundaries, Ridcully mumbled. You look at what's on the other side, and you realize why there was a boundary in the first place. Good afternoon, Turnip Seed. Your face is familiar. I used to work here, sir, said Turnip Seed sheepishly. Oh, yes, I recall, in the high-energy magic department, yes? A coming man, our Adrian, said the former dean, proprietorially. We have our own high-energy magic building now, you know. We call it the higher energy magic building, but I stress that this is only to avoid confusion. No slight on good old you, you as intended. Adopt, adapt, improve. That's my motto. Well, if you adapted it, then it's now grab, copy, and look innocent, Ridcully thought, but carefully. Senior wizards never rowed in public. The damage was apt to be appalling. No, politeness ruled, but with sharpened edges. I doubt there will be any confusion, Henry. We are the senior college, after all. And, of course, I am the only Arts-Chancellor in these parts. By custom and practice, Mustrum, and times are changing. Or being changed, at least. But I wear the Arts-Chancellor's hat, Henry, as worn by my predecessors down the centuries. The hat, Henry, of supreme authority in the affairs of the wise, the cunning, and the crafty. The hat, in fact, on my head. <laughs> it isn't, you know, said Henry cheerfully. You are wearing the everyday hat that you made yourself. It would be on my head if I wanted it to be. Henry's smile was glassy. Of course, Mustrum, but the authority of the hat has often been challenged. Almost correct, old chap. In fact, it is the ownership of the hat that has in the past been disputed, but the hat itself never... Now, I note that you yourself are wearing a particularly spiffy hat of magnificence that goes beyond the sublime, but it is just a hat, old boy, <laughs> just a hat. No offence meant, of course, and I am sure that in another millennium it will have become weighted with dignity and wisdom. I can see that you have left plenty of room. Turnip Seed decided to make a run for the lavatories right now, and with a muted apology pushed past Ridcully and sped away. Oddly enough, the sudden lack of an audience lowered the tension rather than increased it. Henry pulled a slim packet out of his pocket. Cigarette? I know that you roll your own, but Verdant and Scour make these specially for me, and they are rather fine. Ridcully took one, because a wizard, however haughty, who would not accept a free smoke or a drink, would be in his coffin— but he took care not to notice the words Arch-Chancellor's Choice in garish type on the packet. As he handed the packet back, something small and colourful dropped out onto the floor. Henry, 
With an agility unexpected in a wizard so far up the main sequence as described in the well-known Allspring slash Tips diagram. This diagram was devised to chart the tendency of wizards, who start out small and pale, to progress through the craft getting bigger and cholerically redder until at last they swell up and explode in a cloud of pomposity. Reached down quickly and snatched it up, muttering something about not letting it get dirty. You could eat your dinner off these floors, said Ridcully sharply, and probably would, he added to himself. Only the collectors get so annoyed if there is a speck of dust on them, and I give mine to the butler's little boy. Henry went on blithely. He turned the pasteboard over and frowned. Notable wizards of our time, number nine of fifty. Dr. Abel Baker, B.C., Honours, FTL, K.P., P.D.F., S. Crow, Director of Blitz Studies, Brazen Neck. <laughs> I'm sure he's already got this one. He dropped it into a waistcoat pocket. Never mind. Good for swapsies. Ridcurley could assess things quite fast, especially when fueled by banked fires of rage. The Whistler Tobacco, Snuff and Rolling Paper Company, he said, of Pseudopolis. Hmm. Clever idea. Who's in this from you, you? Ah, well, I have to admit that the Assembly and people of Pseudopolis are rather mm, patriotic in their outlook. I think the word is parochial, don't you? Harsh words, considering that Ankhmore Pork's the smuggest, most self-satisfied city in the world. This was self-evidently true, so Ridcully decided he hadn't heard it. You on one of these cards, then? He grunted. They insisted, I'm afraid, said Henry. I was born there, you see, local boy and all that. And no one from you, you, said Ridcully flatly. Technically, no, but Professor Turnipseed is in there as the inventor of Pex. As Henry said it, guilt and defiance fought for space in the sentence. Pex? said Ridcully slowly. You mean like Hex? Oh, no, not at all like Hex. <laughs> Certainly not. The principle is quite different. Henry cleared his throat. It's run by chickens. They trigger the morphic resonator, or whatever it's called. Your Hex, as I recall, utilizes ants, which are far less efficient. How so? We get eggs we can eat. That doesn't sound all that different, you know. Oh, come now. They are hundreds of times bigger, and Pex is in a purpose-built room, not strung haphazardly all over the place. Professor Turnipseed knows what he is doing, and even you, Mustrum, must acknowledge that the river of progress is fed by a thousand springs. And they didn't all rise in bloody brazen neck, said Red Cully. They glared at one another. Professor Turnipseed poked his head around the corner and pulled it back very quickly. If we were the men our fathers were, we'd be throwing fireballs by now, said Henry. The point is taken, said Ridcully. Although, I must point out, our fathers were not wizards. That's right, of course, said the former dean. Your father was a butcher, as I recall. That's right. And your father owned a lot of cabbage fields, said Ridcully. There was a moment's silence, and then the former dean said... Remember the day we both turned up at UU? We fought like tigers, as I recall, said Ridcully. Good times, when you come to remember them, said the dean. Of course. We've all passed a lot of water over the bridge since then, said Ridcully. There was another pause, and he added, Fancy a drink? I don't mind if I do, said the former dean. So you are trying to play football? said Henry, as they progressed majestically towards the Arch-Chancellor's office. I did see something about it in the paper, but I thought it was a joke. Why, pray? said Ridcully, as they began to walk across the Great Hall. We have a fine sporting tradition, as well you know. Ah, yes, tradition is the scourge of endeavour. Be sensible, Mustrum. The leopard may change his shorts, but I think he'd have a job getting into the ones he wore forty years ago. Oh, I see that you still have Mr. Stibbins here. Uh, began Ponder, looking from one to the other. 
Ponder Stibbins had once got 100% in a prescience exam by getting there the previous day. He could see a little storm cloud when it was beginning to grow. How's the football going, lad? Oh, it seems to be going very well, Arts-Chancellor. Good to see you again, Dean. Arts-Chancellor, purred the former Dean. I wonder how good you would be against my university. Well, we have a pretty nifty team built here, said Ridcully. And while it is our intention to play our first game against a local side, I would take great pleasure in showing Brazen Neck a thing or two on the field. By now they were almost in the middle of the Great Hall, and their presence, not unexpectedly, had stopped play. Arts Chancellor, I really feel that it might be a good idea to... Ponder began, but his voice was drowned out by the roar of approval that rang out from all sides around the Great Hall. And the prize would be... said Henry, smiling at the crowd. What? spluttered the Arts Chancellor. What prize? We picked up a few rowing trophies when we were lads, didn't we? I believe the patrician has got something planned for the league, yes? I think that refreshments will be laid out in the blue refectory shortly, said Ponder with a kind of desperate, sweaty cheerfulness. There will, of course, be cake, but also, I believe, an interesting assortment of curries. On many occasions, this might have worked, but the two senior wizards had locked glares and would not so much as blink, even for a slice of plowman's pie. But we men of craft are not interested in such paltry baubles as cups and medals, are we? said Henry. For us it's huge great big baubles or nothing. Is that not right, Mustrum? You are after the hat, said Redcully flatly. The air between them was humming. Yes, of course. There followed the menacing silence of a clash of wills. But Ponder Stibbins decided that as he was, technically, twelve important people at the university, he formed, all by himself, a committee. And since he was therefore, de facto, very wise, he should intervene. And your stake, de... Uh, sir, would be? Ridcully turned his head slightly and growled. He doesn't have to have one. I have rather walked into this. There was a stirring from the more senior wizards, and Ponder heard a whispered phrase, Dead man's pointy shoes? No, I forbid it, said Ponder. You forbid it, said Henry. You are but a chick, young Stibbins. The accumulated votes of all the posts I hold on the university council mean that I do technically control it, said Ponder, trying to stick out a skinny chest that was never built for sticking, but still buoyed up and awash with righteous rage and a certain amount of terror about what might happen when it ran out of steam. The contenders relaxed a little, more in the presence of this turning worm. Didn't anyone notice that you were getting all this power? said Ridcully. Yes, sir. Me. Only I thought it was responsibility and hard work. None of you ever bother with details, you see. Technically, I have to report to other people, but usually the other people are me. You have no idea, sirs. I'm even the Camolengo, which means that if you drop dead, Arts Chancellor, from any cause other than legitimate succession under the dead man's pointy shoes tradition, I run this place until a successor is elected, which, given the nature of wizardry, will mean a job for life, in which case the librarian, as an identifiable and competent member of the senior staff, will try to discharge his duties. And if he fails, the official procedure is for wizards everywhere to fight amongst themselves for the hat causing fire, destruction, doves, rabbits, and billiard balls to appear from every orifice and much loss of life. After a short pause, he continued, Again, which is why some of us get a little worried when we see powerful wizards squabbling like this. To conclude, gentlemen, I have spoken at some length in order to give you time to consider your intentions. Somebody has to. Ridcully cleared his throat. Thank you for your input, Stibbins. We shall discuss this matter further. Definitely something that needed to be said. These aren't the old days, after all. Your point is taken, said Henry, except that technically these are going to be somebody else's old days. Ponder's chest was still going up and down. Very good point, said Redcully. I believe I heard mention of a curry, said Henry, with equal care. 
It was like listening to two ancient dragons talking to each other with the help of an even older book of etiquette written by nuns. It's a long time until lunch. This may not be true. Wizards tend to think it's a long time to the next meal, right up until they're consuming it. I tell you what, why don't you accept the hospitality of my university? I believe we have left your room exactly as it was, although I understand some quite amazing things have crawled out under the door. Perhaps you might like to stay on for tomorrow's banquet? Oh, are you having a banquet? said Henry. Indeed so, and I would be delighted if you would accept, old boy. We'll be entertaining some of the solid citizenry. Salt of the earth, fellows, you understand? Wonderful people if you don't watch them eat, but quite good conversationalists if you give them enough beer. Funnily enough, I find that works with wizards, too. Well, I must accept, of course. I haven't been to a banquet in ages. You haven't? said Red Cully. I thought you would have a banquet every night. We have a limited budget, you know, said the Arch-Chancellor of Brazen Neck. It's a governmental grant thing, you see. The wizards fell silent. It was as if a man had just told you his mother had died. Red Cully patted him on the hand. Oh, I'm so sorry. He paused at the doors of the hall and turned back to ponder. We will be having some high-level discussions, Stibbins. Keep them on their toes. The lads will help. Find out what football wants to be. The older members of the faculty exhaled as the two heads left. Most of them were old enough to recall at least two pitched battles among factions of wizards, the worst of which had only been brought to a conclusion by Rincewind wielding a half-brick in a sock. Ponder looked across at Rincewind now, and he was hopping awkwardly on one leg, trying to put a sock back on. He thought it better not to comment. It was probably the same sock. The chair of indefinite studies slapped Ponder on the back. Well done, lad. Could have been a nasty incident there. Thank you, sir. I'm sorry we seem to have loaded you down a bit. I'm sure it wasn't deliberate. I'm sure it wasn't too, sir. Very little around here is, Ponder sighed. I'm afraid that unthinking delegation and prevarication and procrastination are standard practice here. He looked expectantly at the remaining members of the council. He wanted to be disappointed, but knew he wouldn't be. Very bad state of affairs indeed, said the lecturer in recent runes. The chair looked grave. Hmm. So go on, thought Ponder. Say it. I know you're going to. You just won't be able to stop yourself. You really won't. I think, Stibbins, that you should sort it out when you have a moment, said the chair. Bingo. I beg your pardon, Stibbins? Oh, nothing, sir. Not really. I was just pondering, as it were, on the unchangeable nature of the universe. I'm glad somebody is. Keep it up. The lecturer in recent runes looked around and added, It all seems to have quietened down. That curry sounds amusing. There was a general movement towards the doors on the part of those wizards who were well endowed with years, gravitation, or both, but the scratch match went on among those less magnetically attracted to knives and forks. Ponder sat down, his clipboard balanced on his lap. I don't have the faintest idea what I'm doing here he declared to the world around him. May I be of some worth, sir? Mr. Nutt. Oh, well, it's very kind of you, but I don't think that your skill with a candle can be of much. In games of this nature, there are three classes of things to be considered. One, the rules of the game in all their detail. Two, the correct skills, actions, and philosophies required for success. And three, an understanding of the real nature of the game. May I continue? Ha, huh, said Ponder, in that slight daze that overcame everyone hearing a nut lecture for the first time. Got a fine jaw on him, ain't he? said Trev. He can say the long words where the likes of you and me would have to stop for a rest halfway through. Me, anyway. 
he trailed off. Uh, do continue, Mr. Nutt. Thank you, sir. As I understand it, the purpose of this game is to score at least one more goal than your opponents. But our two teams just ran around, with everyone trying to kick the ball at once. Oh, goals were scored, but only opportunistically. As in chess, you must secure the king, your goal. Yes, you are going to say that you have the custodian of the goal, but he is only one man, figuratively speaking. Every ball he saves shames the team members who let the opponents get so close. Yet at the same time, they must maximize their chances of getting the ball into the opposing goal. This is the problem I will have to address. I have mentioned chess, but this game, and particularly the ease with which the ball takes flight, means that the activity can go from one end of the play to the other in seconds, just as one dwarf piece can upset the whole board in a game of thud. He smiled up at their expressions and added, You know, this game is surely one of the simplest. Any little boy knows how to play it, and yet playing it optimally requires superhuman talents. He thought for a moment and added, Or possibly subhuman. Certainly the willing sublimation of the ego, which takes us into the realms of the metaphysical. So simple and yet so complex. You know, this is wonderful. I am quite thrilled. The ring of silence around him was not ominous, but the air choked with bafflement. Finally, the wizard Rincewind said, Uh, Mr. Nutt, I thought you told us we just had to get the ball between the pointy hats. Professor Rincewind, you run very well, but you don't do anything with it. Professor Macarona, you attempt to score as soon as you get the ball, irrespective of anything else that is happening. Dr. Hicks, you cheat and foul constantly. Excuse me, skull ring, he intervened. I am required to attempt to break the rules under college statutes. With unacceptable limits, Ponder added quickly. Bledlow knobs no relation. You have a furiously powerful kick, Nut continued. But you don't seem to care where the ball goes so long as it gets there. All of you have strengths and weaknesses, and it might be possible to make use of both of them. That is, if you want to win. But for now, a good exercise would be to get a lot more of these balls and learn how to control them. Running while kicking the ball ahead of you simply means that you will lose it to an opponent. You must learn to keep it at your feet. You were all looking down to check that you had the ball. Gentlemen, if you need to check that you still have the ball, you either do not have it, or you will lose it in the next fraction of a second. Now, if you will excuse me, Mr. Trev and I will get into trouble if we don't get the chandelier back up soon. The spell broke. What? said Ponder. I mean, what? Stay there, Mr. Nutt. Nutt immediately hunched and stared at his feet in their clumsy shoes. I am sorry if I have transgressed in any way. I was only seeking worth. Worth, said Ponder, looking at Trev for some kind of map of this new territory. That's how he talks, that's all, said Trev. He hasn't done anything wrong, so I shout at him like that. They were some bloody good ideas. Should pick on him just because he's small and talks posh. Nut seemed noticeably taller a little while ago, Ponder thought. Is he really just hunched up? I wasn't exactly shouting at him, he said. I just wondered what he's doing dribbling candles. I mean, I know that's what he's doing, but why? Ah, you have to have dribbled candles, sir, said Bledlow Nobbs, no relation. And to my mind, the dribbling has been particularly fine just lately. Often, when I'm walking the corridors of a night, I think to myself, Good heavens, man, he's erudite. He radiates learning. He's a polymath, said Ponder. Are you saying he's too smart to be a candle dribbler? said the Bledlow, a militant look in his eye. You wouldn't want a stupid dribbler, would you? You'd get, like, manky dribbles all over the place. I simply meant that... And blobs, 
said the Bledlow firmly. But you must admit that it is strange that probably everyone wants him dead. Ponder stopped as the chasm of memory opened. That makes no sense. It can't be true. Sir? He realized that all the footballers were staring at him. Ridcully had refused to say any more, and in Ponder's crowded mind, he had settled for believing that Nut was on the run in some way. It was not unknown. Occasionally, a novice wizard working in a small town might find it a good idea to hurry back for a swift refresher course in the safety of the university's hospitable stones until his little mistake had been rectified, forgotten, erased, caught, and bottled. There had always been others given sanctuary for mysterious reasons. The politics of wizardry were either very simple and resolved by someone ceasing to breathe, or as complex as one ball of yarn in a room with three bright-eyed little kittens. But not. What crime could he have done? And then you had to factor in that it was Ridcully who had allowed him to come here and indeed had put Ponder in this position. The sensible thing, therefore, was to just get on with it. I think Mr. Nutt has some very good ideas, he said carefully, and I think he should continue. Do carry on, Mr. Nutt. Watching Nutt look up was like watching the sun rise, but a hesitant sun, afraid that any moment the gods might slap it back down into the night, and hungry for reassurance, that this would not be so. I am worthy? Well, uh... Ponder began and saw Trev nodding frantically. Well, uh, yes, it would seem so, Mr. Nutt. I'm amazed at your insight in so short a time. I have a talent for pattern recognition in developing situations. Really? Oh, good. Carry on, then. Excuse me, I have a question, if you would be so good. Looks like a bag of second-hand clothes, talks like a retired theologian, Ponder thought. Ask away, Mr. Nutt. Can I carry on with the dribbling? What? Do you want to? Yes, thank you. I enjoy it, and it does not take me long. Ponder glanced at Trev, who shrugged, made a face, and nodded. But I have a favor to ask, Nutt went on. I rather expected you would said Ponder. But I'm sorry to say that the budget this term means, oh, no, I don't want any money, said Nut. I don't really spend it anyway. I just want Mr. Trev in the team. He is very modest, but you should know that he is a genius with his feet. I cannot see how you could lose with him in the team. Ah, oh, no, said Trev, waving his hands and backing away. No, not me. I'm not a footballer. I just kick tin cans around. Thought that was at the heart and soul of foot the ball, isn't it? Said Ponder, who'd never been allowed to play in the street. I thought it was when early blokes kicked their dead enemy's head around. Bledlow Nobs, no relation, volunteered. A throat was cleared. Unlikely, in my opinion, said Hicks unless it's in a bag or some sort of metal brace, and then you have the problem of weight, because a human head comes in at around ten pounds, which is a pain in the foot, I should think. Scooping it out would work for a while, of course, but mind you while the jaw, because no one wants to be bitten in the foot. <sighs> I do have some heads on ice, if anyone wants to experiment. It's amazing, but there are still those who leave their bodies to necromancy. <sighs> There's some strange people out there. At this point, the head of the Department of Postmortem Communications realized that he was not taking his audience with him. There's no need to look at me like that, he grumbled. Skull ring, remember. <sighs> I have to know this wretched stuff. Ponder coughed politely. Mr. Uh, Lightly, isn't it? Your colleague speaks very highly of you. Won't you join us? Sorry, Gav, but I promised my old mum that I'd never play football. It's a good way of getting your head caved in. Trev Lightly, roared Bledlow Nobs, no relation. Are you Dave Lightly's lad? He... 
scored four goals, yeah, 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 said Trev, and then died in the street with the rain washing his blood down the gutter and someone's smelly overcoat over him. The Prince of Football? Do we need a little talk, Mr. Trev? Nut said urgently. No, no, I'm okay. Okay? This isn't that kind of football, Trev, said Nut soothingly. Yeah, I I know, uh, but I promised my old mum. Then at least show them your moves, Mr. Trev, Nut pleaded. He turned to the players. You must see this. Trev sighed, but Nut knew just how to wheedle. All right, if it shuts you up he said, and pulled a tin can out of his pocket to much laughter. Say, he complained to Nut, I just think it's a joke. Nut folded his arms. Show them. Trev dropped the can to his foot and with hardly any effort, flicked it onto his shoulder, where it rolled around his neck to his other shoulder and, after a tiny pause, righted itself. He shrugged it onto his other foot, spun it into the air, and let it tumble and spin on the toe of his boot with a faint rattling noise. Trev winked at Ponder Stibbons. Don't move, Gov. The can sprang off the boot and up into the air, then, as it fell, he hit it with a roundhouse kick, driving it at Ponder. The people behind Ponder dived out of the way as it growled past his face and went into orbit, appearing for a moment to give him a silver necklace until it broke away and dropped into Trev's hand like a beached salmon. In the silence, Ponder pulled his thalmometer out of his pocket and glanced at it. Natural background, he said flatly. No magic involved. How did you do that, Mr. Likely? You just have to get the hang of it, Gov. Getting the spins is the thing, but if I have to think too much, it don't work. Can you do it with a ball? Don't know, never tried, but probably no. Can't get the long spin and the short spin, see? But you ought to be able to get something out of a ball. But how would that help us? said Hicks. Mastery of the ball is everything, said Nut. The planned rule will, I think, allow the keeper of the goal to handle the ball. This is vital. There is, however, no explicit ban on nodding the ball, kneeing the ball, or blocking the ball with the chest and letting it drop neatly onto the foot. Remember, gentlemen, this ball flies. It will spend a lot of time in the air. You must learn not to think just about the ground. I feel sure that using the head would be considered illegal, said Ponder. Sir, you presume a rule where there is none. Remember what I said about the real nature of the game. Polder saw Nut's little half-smile and gave in. Mr. Nut, I am delegating the selection and training of our football team to you. You will report to me, of course. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I will need the power to sequester team members from their normal duties when required. Well, I suppose I must agree to that. Very well. I shall leave the team in your hands, said Ponder, thinking, how many bags of old clothes use the word sequester as if they're used to it? Still, Ridcully likes the little goblin, if that's what he is, and I've never seen the point of team games. May I also, sir, request a very small budget? Why? With all due respect to the exigencies of university finances, said Nut, I believe it is very necessary. Why? I wish to take the team to the ballet. That's ridiculous, Ponder snapped. No, sir. It's essential. The next day there was a piece in the Times about the mysterious disappearance of the fabulous jewels, which made Glenda smile. They just haven't read their fairy stories, she thought as she left the house. If you want to find a beauty, you look for her in the ashes. Because Glenda was Glenda, and would always irredeemably be Glenda to the core, she added, although the ovens in the night kitchen are scrupulously maintained at all times, and all ashes are immediately disposed of. To her surprise, Juliet stepped out of her doorway at almost the same time, and looked as if she was almost awake. Do you think they'll let me in on the banquet? she said as they waited for the bus. Theoretically, yes, Glenda thought, but probably no, because she was a night kitchen girl.
even though she was Juliet, she would be tarred by Mrs. Whitlow as a night kitchen girl. Juliet, you shall go to the banquet, she said aloud, and so shall I. But I think Mrs. Whitlow won't like that, said Juliet. Something was still bubbling inside Glenda. It had started in Shatter and lasted all day yesterday, and there was still some left today. I don't care, she said. Juliet giggled and looked around in case Mrs. Whitlow was hiding near the bus stop. And I really don't care, Glenda thought. I don't care. It was like drawing a sword. Ponder's office always puzzled Mustram Ridcully. The man used filing cabinets, for heaven's sake. Ridcully worked on the basis that anything you couldn't remember wasn't important and had developed the floor heap method of document storage to a fine art. Ponder looked up. Ah, good morning, Arts Chancellor. Just had a look in at the hall, said Ridcully. Yes, Arts Chancellor? Our lads were all doing ballet. Yes, Arts Chancellor. And there were some girls from the opera house with those short dresses. Yes, Arts Chancellor, they're helping the team. Ridcully leaned over and put huge knuckles either side of the paper Ponder was working on. Why? Mr. Nutt's idea, Arts Chancellor. Apparently, they must learn balance, poise, and elegance. Have you ever seen Bledlow Knobs try to stand on one leg? Let me tell you, it's an immediate cure for melancholy. I can imagine, said Ponder, not looking up. I thought the idea was to learn how to kick the ball into the goal. Ah, uh, yes, but Mr. Nutt has a philosophy. Does he? Yes, sir. They're running about all over the place, I know that, said Ridcully. Yes, Mr. Nutt and Mr. Likely are preparing a little something extra for the banquet, said Ponder, getting up and opening the top drawer of a filing cabinet. The sight of filing cabinets opening tended to remind Ridcully that he should be elsewhere, but on this occasion the ruse failed to work. Oh, and I believe we have some fresh balls. Mr. Snorrison knows an opportunity when he sees one. So it's all going well then, said Ridcully in a kind of mystified voice. Apparently so, sir. Well, I suppose I'd better leave it alone, <laughs> said Ridcully. He hesitated, feeling at a bit of a loose end, and found another thread to pull. And how are those rules coming along, Mr. Stibbins? Oh, quite well, thank you, Arts Chancellor. I'm keeping in some of the ones from the street game, of course, to keep everybody happy. Some of them are quite strange. Mr. Nutt is quite a decent chap, it appears. Oh, yes, Arts Chancellor. Very good idea of his to redesign the goal, I thought. <laughs> Makes it more fun. Aren't you going to train, sir? said Ponder, pulling another document towards him. I am the captain. I do not need to train. Ridcully turned to leave and stopped with his hand on the doorknob. Had a long chat with the former dean last night. Decent soul at heart, of course, he said. Yes, I understand the atmosphere in the uncommon room was very convivial, Arch-Chancellor, said Ponder. And expensive, he added to himself. You know young Adrian Turnipseed is a professor? Oh, yes, Arch-Chancellor. You want to be one? Uh, not really, Arch-Chancellor. I think there should be one or two posts in this institution that I don't hold. Yes, but they've just called their machine Pex. Hardly a great leap of ingenuity, is it? Oh, there are some significant differences. I believe he's using chickens to generate the Blit diametric, said Ponder. Apparently so, said Ridcully. Something like that, anyway. Hmm, said Ponder, and it was quite a solid hmm. Possibly one you could moor a small boat to. Something wrong, said Ridcully. Oh, uh, not really, Arts Chancellor. Did the former dean mention anything about the need to totally rebuild the morphic resonator to allow for the necessary changes in the Blitzlude interface? Shouldn't think so, said Ridcully. Oh, said Ponder, his face blank. Well, Adrian is bound to get round to that. He is very clever. Yes, but it was all based on your work. You built Hex, and now they're putting out that he's some big clever clogs. He's even on a cigarette card. That's nice, sir. 
It's good when researchers get recognition. Ridcully felt like a mosquito that was trying to sting a steel breastplate. Ha! Wizardry has certainly changed since my day, he said. Yes, sir, said Ponder noncommittally. By the way, Mr. Stibbins, said Ridcully as he opened the door, my day isn't over yet. There was a yell in the distance, and then a crash. Ridcully smiled. The day had suddenly brightened up. When he and Ponder reached the Great Hall, most of the team were gathered around one of their members lying on the floor, with Nut kneeling over him. What's happened here? Ridcully demanded. Badly bruised, sir. I shall put a compress on it. Ah! His gaze fell upon a large brass-bound chest. It looked at first sight like any other chest, until you saw the tiny little toes poking out. Rincewind's luggage, he growled, and where that is, Rincewind can't be far in front. Rincewind! Actually, it wasn't my fault, said Rincewind. He's right, sir, said Nut. I have to apologize for the fact that this was a group misapprehension. I understand it is a remarkably magical chest on hundreds of little legs, and I am afraid that the gentlemen here believed that it would play football like stink, as they put it, in which surmise, I have to say, they were proved wrong. I tried to tell them, said the former dean from the edge of the crowd. Morning, Mustrum. Good team you have here. All its feet to do is get in each other's way, said Bengo Macarona, and if it does not get on top of the ball, it spins out of control, and alas, it clashed into Mr. Sopworthy here. Oh, well, we learn by our mistakes, said Ridcully. And now, do you happen to have something nice to show me? I think I have the very thing, Nuts Chancellor, said a cheerful but reedy voice behind him. Ridcully turned and looked into the face of a man with the shape and urgency of a piccolo. He seemed to be vibrating on the spot. Professor Ritonello, master of the music, Ponder whispered into Ridcully's ear. Ah, Professor, said Ridcully smoothly, and I see you have the choir with you. Uh, yes, indeed, Arts Chancellor, and I must tell you I am thrilled and filled with inner light by what I have witnessed this morning. Without ado, I have penned a chant such as you asked for. Did I? said Red Cully out of the corner of his mouth. You will remember that chanting was mentioned, and so I thought it best to alert the professor, whispered Ponder. Another P.P., eh? <laughs> oh, well. Happily, it is based on the traditional plain chant or stolation form and is a valedictor or hail to the winner. <laughs> May I? said Professor Ritornello. It is a cappella, of course. Go ahead, by all means, said Ridcully. The master of the music pulled a short baton out of his sleeve. I've put the name of Bengo Macarona in there for a marker at the moment, because he has apparently scored two fine goals, as I believe they are called, <laughs> he said, dealing carefully with the word as one might deal with a large spider in a bathtub. Then he caught the eyes of his little flock, nodded, and... Hail the unique qualities of Magister Bengo Macarona, of Macarona, the unique qualities, hail, 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 the singular talent possessed by no other, hail, 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 bountiful gods, who to the, to the singular, 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 after a minute and a half of this, Ridcully coughed loudly, and the master waved the choir into a stuttering silence. Is there something untoward, Arts Chancellor? Um, uh, not as such, Master, but, um, do you not feel that it is a bit too, well, long? Ridcully was aware that the former dean was not trying very hard to suppress a snigger. Uh, not at all. In fact, sir, I intend that when it is finished, it will be scored for forty voices, and though I dare say so, will be my masterwork. But it is something for football fans to sing, you see, 
said Red Cully. Well, then, said the master, holding his baton in a rather threatening manner, is it not the duty of the educated classes to raise the standards of the lower orders? He's got a point there, Mastrum, said the chair of indefinite studies, and Ridgully felt his grandfather kick him in the heredity, and was glad that maid wasn't here. What was her name now? Oh, yes, Glenda, smart woman. But although she was not there, he saw something of her expression in Trev Lightley's face. During the week, possibly, he snapped. But not on Saturdays, I think. But very well done, anyway, and I look forward to hearing more of your efforts. The master of the music flounced out with the choir flouncing out in perfect unison behind him. Ridcully rubbed his hands together. Well, gentlemen, perhaps you could show me your moves. While the players spread out in the hall, Nut said, I must say that Professor Macarona is excelling at the game. He clearly has excellent ball skills. I'm not surprised, said Red Cully brightly. The librarian is, of course, an excellent keeper of the goal, especially since he can stand in the middle and reach either side of it. I believe that it will be very hard for any of our opponents to get past him, and, of course, you will be partaking also, Arts-Chancellor. Oh, you don't become Arts-Chancellor if you don't get the hang of things quickly. I will just watch for now. He watched. After the second occasion, when Macarona, like a silver streak, ran the length of the hall to flick the ball into the opponent's goal, Ridcully turned to Ponder and said, We're going to win, aren't we? If indeed he is still playing for you, put in the former dean. Oh, come now, Henry. Can we at least agree to just play one game at a time here? Well, I think today's session should end pretty soon, sir, said Ponder. It's the banquet tonight, after all, and it will take some time to get the place ready. Excuse me, Gov, that's right, said Trev behind him. And we've got to get the chandelier down and put new candles in. Yes, but we have been practising a little demonstration for tonight. Maybe the Arts Chancellor would like to see it, said Nut. Ridcully looked at his watch. Well, yes, Mr Nut, but time is getting on, so I look forward to seeing it later. A splendid effort all round, though, he boomed. The night market was setting up in Sator Square as Glenda and Juliet arrived for work. Ankmore Pork lived on the street, where it got its food, entertainment, and in a city with a ferocious housing shortage, a place to hang around until there was space on a floor. Stalls had been set up anywhere, and flares filled the early evening air with stink and, almost as a byproduct, a certain amount of light. Glenda could never resist looking, especially now. She was very good at all sorts of cookery. She really was. And it was important to keep that knowledge at the calm centre of her spinning brain. And there was Verity Pushpram, Queen of the Sea. Glenda had a lot of time for Miss Pushpram, who was a self-made woman. Although she could have used some help when it came to her eyes, which were set so far apart that she rather resembled a turbot. But Verity, like the ocean that was making her fortune these days, had hidden depths, because she had made enough to buy a boat, and then another boat, and a whole isle in the fish market. But she still woman-handled her barrow to the square most evenings, where she sold whelks, shrimps, leather crabs, blossom prawns, monkey clams, and her famous hot fish sticks. Glenda often bought from her. There was the kind of respect you give to an equal who is, crucially, no threat to your own position. Going to the big bun fight, girls, said Verity cheerfully, waving a halibut at them. Yes, said Juliet proudly. What, both of you? said Verity with a glance towards Glenda, who said firmly, The night kitchen is expanding. Oh, well, so long as you're having fun said Verity, looking, in theory, from one to the other. Here, have one of these, the lovely, my treat. She reached down and picked a crab out of a bucket. As it came up, it turned out that three more were hanging on to it. A crab necklace, giggled Juliet. Oh, that's crabs for you, said Verity, disentangling the ones who had hitched a ride. 
thick as planks, the lot of them. That's why you can keep them in a bucket without a lid. Any that tries to get out gets pulled back. Yes, as thick as planks. Verity held the crab over an ominously bubbling cauldron. Shall I cook it for you now? No, said Glenda, much louder than she had intended. Are you okay, dear? Verity inquired. You look a bit ill. I'm fine. Fine. Just a touch of a sore throat, that's all. Crab bucket, she thought. I thought Pepe was talking nonsense. Um, can you just truss it up for us? It's going to be a long night. Right you are, said Miss Pushpram, expertly wrapping the unresisting crab in twine. You know what to do, that's certain. Lovely crabs, these. Real good eating, but thick as planks. Crab bucket, thought Glenda, as they hurried towards the night kitchen. That's how it works. People from the sisters disapproving when a girl takes the trolley bus. That's crab bucket. Practically everything my mum ever told me. That's crab bucket. Practically everything I've ever told Juliet. That's crab bucket too. Maybe it's just another word for the shove. It's so nice and warm on the inside that you forget that there's an outside. The worst of it is, the crab that mostly keeps you down is... you. The realisation had her mind on fire. A lot hinges on the fact that, in most circumstances, people are not allowed to hit you with a mallet. They put up all kinds of visible and invisible signs that say, Do not do this, in the hope that it'll work. But if it doesn't, then they shrug because there is, really, no real mallet at all. Look at Juliet, talking to all those knobby ladies. She didn't know that she shouldn't talk to them like that, and it worked. Nobody hit her on the head with a hammer. And custom and practice, as embodied by Mrs. Whitlow, was that the night kitchen staff should not go above stairs, to where the light was comparatively clean and had not already been through a lot of other eyeballs. Well. Glenda had done that, and nothing bad had happened, had it? So now Glenda strode towards the great hall, her serviceable shoes hitting the floor enough to hurt. The dare girls said nothing as she marched in behind them. There was nothing for them to say. The real unwritten rule was that girls on the dumpy side didn't serve at table when guests were present, and Glenda had decided tonight that she couldn't read unwritten rules. Besides. There was a row already going on. The servants, who were laying out the cutlery, were trying to keep an eye on it, which subsequently meant that more than one guest had to eat with two spoons. Glenda was amazed to see the candle knave waving his hands at Trev and Nut, and she headed for them. She did not like Smeems very much. A man could be dogmatic, and that was all right, or... He could be stupid, and no harm done, but stupid and dogmatic at the same time was too much, especially fluxed with body odour. What's this all about? It worked. The right tone from a woman with her arms folded always bounces an answer out of an unprepared man before he has time to think, and even before he has time to think up a lie. They raised the chandelier. They raised it without lighting the candles. We won't have enough time now to get it down and up again before the guests come in. But, Mr. Smeems, Trev began, and all I get is talking back in lies, Smeems complained bitterly. But I can light them from here, Mr. Smeems, not spoke quietly, even his voice huddling. Don't give me that. Even wizards can't do that without getting wax all over the place, you little... That's enough, Mr. Smeems, said a voice that to Glenda's surprise turned out to be hers. Can you light them, Mr. Nut? Yes, miss. At the right time. There you are, then, said Glenda. I suggest you leave it to Mr. Nut. Smeems looked at her, and she could see there was, as it were an invisible mallet in his thinking, a feeling that he might get into some trouble here. I should run along now, she said. 
I can't stand around. I'm a man with responsibilities. Smeems looked wrong-footed and bewildered, but from his point of view, absence was a good idea. Glenda almost saw his brain reach the conclusion. Not being there diluted the blame for whatever it was that was going to go wrong. Can't stand around, he repeated. Ha! You'll all be in the dark if it wasn't for me. With that, he grabbed his greasy bag and scuttled off. Glenda turned to Nut. He can't possibly make himself smaller, she told herself. His clothes would fit him even worse than they do already. I must be imagining it. Can you really light the candles from here? She said aloud. Nut carried on staring at the floor. Glenda turned to Trev. Can he really? But Trev was not there, because Trev was leaning against the wall some distance away, talking to Juliet. She could read it all at a glance. His possessive stance, her modestly downcast eyes. Not hanky-panky as such, but certainly overture and beginners to hanky-panky. Oh, the power of words. As you watch, so are you watched. Glenda looked down into the penetrating eyes of Nut. Was that a frown? What had he seen in her expression? More than she wanted, that was certain. The tempo in the hall was increasing. The football captains would be assembling in one of the anterooms, and she could imagine them there in clean shirts, or at least in shirts less grubby than usual, dragged here from the various versions of Botley Street all over the city, staring up at the wonderful vaulting and wondering if they were going to walk out of their dead. Hmph. She tagged on to that thought. More likely it would be dead drunk. And, just as her brain began to pivot around that new thought, a severe voice behind her said, We do not usually expect to see you in the Great Hall, Glinda. It had to be Mrs. Whitlow. Only the housekeeper would pronounce we with an H and finish a plain statement as if it were a question. Besides, without turning round, Glenda heard the clink of her silver chatelaine, reputed to hold the one key that could open any lock in the university, and the creaking of her fearsome corsetry. It is said that if you want to stand up to someone, you should picture them naked. In the case of Mrs. Whitlow, this would be, as Ponder Stibbons might put it, contraindicated. Glenda turned. There is no mallet. I thought you might need a few extra hands tonight, Mrs. Whitlow, she said sweetly. Nevertheless, custom and practice. Ah, dear Mrs. Whitlow, I think we're ready to let them through now. His lordship's coach will shortly be leaving the palace, said the arch-chancellor behind them. Mrs. Whitlow could loom, but mostly only horizontally. Mustram Ridcully could outloom her by more than two feet. She turned hurriedly and gave the little half curtsy, which he had never dared tell her. He always found mildly annoying. Oh, and Miss Glenda, isn't it? said the Arch Chancellor happily. Good to see you up here. Very useful young lady, Mrs. Whitlow. Got initiative. Fine grasp of things. How kind of you to say so. She is one of my best girls said the housekeeper, spitting teeth and taking care not to meet Glenda's suddenly cherubic gaze. Big chandelier, not lit, I see, said Red Cully. Glenda stepped forward. Mr. Nutt is planning a surprise for us, sir. Mr. Nutt is full of surprises. We've had an amazing day here today, Miss Glenda, said Red Cully. Ah, Mr. Nutt has been teaching the lads to play football his way. Do you know what he did yesterday? You'll never guess. Tell them, Mr. Nutt. I took them along to the Royal Opera House to watch the dancers in training, said Nutt nervously. You see, it is very important that they learn the skills of movement and poise. And then, when they came back, said Ridcully, with the same slightly threatening joviality, he had them playing here in the hall blindfolded. Nutt coughed nervously. It is vital for them to keep track of every other player, he said. It is essential that they are a team. 
and then he took them to see Lord Rust's hunting dogs. Nut coughed again, even more embarrassed. When they hunt, every dog knows the position of every other dog. I wanted them to understand the duality of team and player. The strength of the player is the team, and the strength of the team is the player. Do you hear that? said Red Collie. Great stuff. Oh, he's had them running up and down here all day long, balancing balls on their heads, doing big diagrams on a blackboard. You think it was some kind of battle being planned? It is a battle, said Nut. I mean, not with the opposing team as such, but it is a battle between every man and himself. That sounds very Ubervaldian, said Red Collie. Still, they all seem full of vim and vigor and ready for the evening. I think Mr. Nutt is planning one of those sunny luminaire things. Just a little something to capture people's attention, said Nutt. Anything going to go off bang, said Red Collie. No, sir. Promise? Personally, I like the occasional bit of sturm and drang, but Lord Veterinary is a tad particular about that sort of thing. No thunder and lightning, sir. Possibly a brief haze high up. It seemed to Glenda that the Arch-Chancellor was paying some thoughtful attention to Nut. How many languages do you speak, you uh, Nut? Three dead and twelve living, sir, said Nut. Really? Really? said Red Cully, as though filing this away and trying not to think. How many of them were alive before you murdered them? Well done! Thank you, Mr. Nutt, and you too, ladies. We will bring them in shortly. Glenda took this opportunity to get out of Mrs. Whitlow's way. She was not pleased to see that Trev and Juliet had already taken a slightly earlier opportunity to get out of hers. Do not worry about Juliet, said Nutt, who had followed her. Who said I was worried? Glenda snapped. You did. Your expression, your stance... The set of your body, your reactions, your tone of voice, everything. You have no business to be looking at my everything. Uh, I mean the set of my body. It is simply the way you stand, Miss Glenda. And you can read my mind? It may appear that way. I am so sorry. And Juliet, what was she thinking? I am not sure, but she likes Mr. Trev. She thinks he is funny. So have you read Trev's everything? Bet that was a dirty book. Uh, no, miss. He is worried and confused. I would say he is trying to see what kind of man he is going to be. Really? He's always been a scallywag. He is thinking of his future. Across the hall, the big doors opened just as the last scurrying servants reached their stations. This made no impression on Glenda, lost in thought as she wrestled with the prospect that a leopard might change his shorts. He has been a bit quiet lately, I must admit. And he did write her that lovely poem. That should mean a lot, a poem. Who would have thought it? It's not like him at all. With atomic speed, Nut was suddenly missing, and the doors stood wide, and here came the captains with their retinues, and all of them were nervous, and some of them were wearing unaccustomed suits, and some of them were walking a little unsteadily even now, because the wizard's idea of an aperitif had bite. And in the kitchen, plates would be being filled, and the chefs would be cursing, and the ovens clanging as they as they... What was the menu anyway? Life, as an unseen part of Unseen University, was a matter of alliances, feuds, obligations and friendships, all stirred and twisted and woven together. Glenda was good at it. The night kitchen had always been generous to other toilers, and right now the Great Hall owed her favours, even if all she had done was keep her mouth shut. Now she bore down on shiny Robert, one of the head waiters, who gave her the cautious nod due to someone who knew things about you that you wouldn't want your mother to know. Got a menu? she asked. One was produced from under a napkin. She read it in horror. That's not the stuff they like. Oh dear, Glenda, Robert smirked. Are you saying it's too good for them? 
You're giving them a vec. Nearly every dish has got a vec in it. But stuff with a vec in the name is an acquired taste. I mean, do these look to you like people who habitually eat in a foreign language? Oh, dear. And you're giving them beer. Beer with a vec? A、uh, choice of wines is available. They are choosing beer, said Robert coldly. Glenda stared at the captains. They seemed to be enjoying themselves now. Here was free food and drink, and if the food tasted strange, there was plenty of it, and the beer tasted welcomely familiar. And there was lots of that, too. She didn't like this. Heavens knew that football had got pretty disgusting these days, but, well, she couldn't quite work out what she was uneasy about. But, excuse me, miss. She looked down. A young footballer had decided to confide in the only uniformed woman he could see who was not carrying at least two plates at once. Can I help? He lowered his voice. This chutney tastes of fish, miss. She looked at the other grinning faces around the table. It's called caviar, sir. It'll put lead in your pencil. The table, as one well oiled drinker, guffawed, but the youth only looked puzzled. I haven't got a pencil, miss. More amusement. There's not a lot of them around, said Glenda, and left them laughing.